Honourable Senators, His Excellency the Governor General approaches the chamber. Honourable Senators, please be seated. I inform the Senate that Senator Seawitt resigned her place as Senator for Western Australia on the 6th of September 2021, and Senator the Honourable Scott Ryan resigned his place as a Senator for Victoria on the 13th of October 2021. Pursuant to the provisions of Section 21 of the Constitution, the Governors of South Australia, Western Australia and Victoria have each been advised of the vacancies in the representation of those states. Given the resignation of Senator Ryan as President of the Senate, I am here today to swear in new Senators chosen to fill vacancies in the representation of Western Australia and South Australia, and I table correspondence relating to the vacancies. Your Excellency, Senator Cox representing Western Australia. Admit the Senator. Senator, please come to the table to make and subscribe the affirmation of allegiance. Senator, please recite the affirmation on the card handed to you. I, Dorinda, I, I, Dorinda Cox, do solemnly and sincerely affirm and declare that I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, her heirs, successors according to the law. Senator, please sign the test roll and the senator's roll. Senator Grogan representing South Australia. Admit the Senator. Senator, please come to the table and make and subscribe the affirmation of allegiance. Senator Grogan, please recite the affirmation on the card handed to you. I, Karen Grogan, do solemnly and sincerely affirm and declare that I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, her heirs and successors according to law. Senator, please sign the test roll and the senator's roll.
Senators, His Excellency will now depart. Thank you, Senators. Please be seated. Clerk, I remind the Senate that it should now choose one of its members to be president. I move that Senator Slade Brockman, a senator from the great state of Western Australia, take the chair of the Senate as its president. Are there any further nominations? Senator Waters. I propose to the Senate for its president, Senator Furuki, and I move that Senator Furuki take the chair as president. Are there any further nominations? There being two nominations, I invite the candidates to address the Senate. Senator Brockman. Thank you. Firstly, can I acknowledge my colleagues for the, from the government who have nominated me for this role? It is humbling simply to be nominated. As the previous president said at his nomination, this is not a circumstance that I thought would ever present itself. The position and the role of the Senate in our democracy is something that has always been the focus of my political interest and much of my career. The Senate plays a unique role in our democracy, first as the state's house, but also as the guardian of our fine and effective committee system. It gives voice to diverse, diverse groups across our various constituencies and to interests that might not otherwise be heard. If elected, I will always strive to maintain and champion the place of the Senate in our democracy and to work with all of you with fairness and impartiality. I would seek to continue the tradition of the two presidents I have served under in this place, Senator Parry and Senator Ryan, both fine people and fine defenders of this institution. I submit myself to the will of the Senate. <laughs> Senator Faruqi. Um, thank you. Colleagues, can I start by saying what a huge privilege it is to represent my wonderful state of New South Wales in the Senate. And thank you so much to my colleagues for nominating me, and especially today, it is wonderful to be joined by two incredible black senators, Senator Cox and Senator Thorpe, and be standing here with our team, which actually respects and celebrates the First Nations culture and diversity in Australia. You know, the Senate is a place where a huge diversity of political views are heard. And it is important that the Senate is facilitated by people who can also represent that plurality. But what we see again and again is a stitch up between the two major parties, the Liberals and the Labour Party, and we see it again today. And this is not the first time it has happened. We talk about democracy here. This is a chamber of review. But again and again, democracy is shut down. How many times have we seen, just in the last couple of years, debate being shut down by guillotine motions? We stopped the notices of motion as formal business. And that shuts, shuts out the plurality of views that are represented in this parliament. And to my colleagues in the Labour Party, if you really want to be an opposition, then act like one. In the history of the Senate, there has only been one woman in that chair. And that was decades ago. So if you, if you, you, we've been talking about gender e equity all this year, if you really care about gender equity, then things need to change. You know, I would be very honored to facilitate this chamber as the second woman ever in history and the first woman of color. It is time to shake things up. It's time for change. Unless any other senator wishes to address the nominations, a ballot will now be held before proceeding to ballot the, the 
bells will be rung for four minutes. Senators, the Senate will now proceed to a ballot. If you could resume your seats, please. Ballot papers will be distributed. Please write on the ballot paper the name of the candidate you wish to vote for. The candidates are Senator Brockman and Senator Faruqi.
have uh, senators, have all senators vote? Oh, look, there you go. I just have to do that. Thanks, Senators. The ballot will now be counted. I invite Senator Dean Smith and Senator McKim to act as scrutineers.
Order. Senators, the result of the ballot is as follows. Senator Brockman, 45 votes. Senator Faruqi, 7 votes. Senator Gavin Marshall, 1 vote. <laughs> 1 vote returned blank. Senator Brockman is therefore elected President of the Senate in accordance with the standing orders. happened to the chair? I sincerely thank the Senate for its support and I thank you for the great honour you have given me today. I also welcome our two new senators, Senator Grogan and Senator Cox. I have not met you yet but I look forward to meeting you and working with you in the future. As I have said, I did not expect to be in this role, certainly not at this time. Senator Scott Ryan was, uh, I should never say this, but younger than me, and I expected him to be round as president for a very long time. And I wish for a moment to honour former President Ryan. President Ryan displayed, particularly in the difficult two years that we have just been through, a calmness, an intellect, a, le a level of pragmatism that helped us all navigate this pandemic. He upheld the finest traditions of this institution whilst recognising the need to adapt to circumstances. I personally wish to honour his service to the nation and to the Senate. If you will indulge me at this once, uh, I would also like to acknowledge my family. Uh, we cannot do this job without the support of those back at home. I could not do what I do without Rebecca and Jonathan, Eleanor and Felicity. You have my thanks and you have my love. My goals are quite straightforward. For as long as I hold this position, I will act to, to defend the interests of senators and the Senate itself. Whilst a diverse range of perspectives are represented in this chamber, I will tre treat each of you as duly elected and equal representatives of your states. I will take your arguments on their merits and seek to act impartially at all times. I thank you once again for the distinguished honour that you have granted me. Senator Birmingham. Mr President, I inform honourable senators that the Governor General will be pleased to receive the President and party leaders or their representatives in the President's suite immediately. Senator, Senator Birmingham. Should add, having thought that I needed to stick to the book, <laughs> and I was just sticking to the script in the book, but I should indeed add my very sincere congratulations to you. My acknowledgement and thanks of the words you have given, uh, firstly to this chamber, your commitment uh, to the chamber in terms of upholding the traditions and conventions of the Senate, the respect and place of each individual senator, no matter their diverse views, in terms of the way in which uh, they approach their business and the need for uh, their rights to be respected as well. I was pleased to nominate you on behalf of the government, knowing, Mr President, that you will perform these duties diligently, competently uh, and indeed uh, with a deep history in this place as a senator uh, but also in your work prior to that and your understanding of the important roles of government, opposition and minor parties across the chamber in terms of their work. I thank you for your kind words in relation uh, to Senator Ryan or former Senator Ryan. Uh, Scott is a dear friend, uh, was a very valued colleague throughout uh, his time and indeed was a president I think admired and respected across this chamber. You fill big shoes in relation to taking on the presidency uh, following Scott Ryan. I know we will wish Scott, Helen uh, and uh, their children every success and happiness in the future, uh, that we thank Scott uh, for the way in which he fulfilled the role uh, with humility and with dignity, always with the interests of this chamber at heart as a senator uh, for the way in which he engaged in a principled manner, true always, to his uh, values, to his interpretation of liberal values and traditions and customs and principles, 
uh, the way in which he engaged strongly on behalf of his state and fulfilled a number of roles through this place, including his service as a minister. He will be missed. You are now welcomed in the chair, and we look forward to the leadership that you provide uh, to this place. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. On behalf of the opposition, I join with the Leader of the Government and the Senate in extending our congratulations to you on your election to the Office of President. And we do note that your election is in keeping with the long-standing convention of the Senate, that the government of the day has the right to nominate the president, because this is essential to our democracy, because it goes to the functioning, effective functioning of this chamber. So I thank Senator Birmingham and I thank Senator Cash for their commitment to the permanence of this convention. In a chamber where no one party of government holds a majority, conventions such as these Order. that government and opposition senators hold the role of president and deputy president, respectively, matter. This is the chamber in which executive government is held to account Senator in a way that Order. rarely occurs in the House of Representatives. And, Mr President, impartiality and objectivity are essential qualities for any president. And as the opposition, we obviously look forward to you maintaining that even-handed approach. We also look forward to you being a defender of the place of the Senate in our constitutional system of government, of its mandate conferred by the people to review, reject or amend legislation, and of its privileges. I note, Senator Brockman, that you come to office with just over four years' experience as a senator. That is significantly less than the average of 11 years for most senators presuming this position. This does mean you will bring a different perspective to the position from most presidents who have preceded you, and I hope and trust this will be a positive for the Senate. I would also like to make some remarks about former Senator Ryan, who has served, had served as our president since 2017. As I've said publicly, Scott Ryan deserves to be remembered as one of the great presidents of the Australian Senate a strong believer in liberalism and in democracy, and someone who sought to defend and enhance the role of the Senate and the privileges of the parliament. He discharged the responsibilities of his office fairly and with distinction and worked hard to be a consultative president, another essential quality of a holder of the position. Scott Ryan had a deep understanding of and a personal commitment to the role and importance of the Senate in our democracy. And I hope and I have listened to you today, Mr. President, uh, as to seeking to emulate Scott Ryan in the discharge of your work as president. So once again, on behalf of the opposition and personally, Mr President, I congratulate you on your election and we look forward to working with you. Senator McKenzie. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, I rise today on behalf of National Party Senators to congratulate you on your appointment to the highest office of President of the Senate. The last Western Australian Senate President was Michael Behan in the years 94 to 96, and here we are 25 years later with a president and also a deputy president from the great state of Western Australia. The office of president is an important one, and Mr President, I know you'll take seriously the duty of fairness and impartiality that are, in my view, fundamental requirements for the role in this chamber. Whilst debate can occasionally become heated in this place, I know your calm manner and respect for the standing orders will be valuable in maintaining productive and respectful debate that we're known for. The Nationals would also like to note your background as a proud advocate for rural and regional Australia, having grown up on a family farm, running it and working in the Pastoralists and Graziers Associations and Australian Grains Champion. It's nice to have uh, someone that understands the regions and uh, what we need from Parliament uh, in a role such as yours. We look forward to continuing to work with you in your new role, and we wish you all the very best and know you'll do a great job. Mr President, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank your predecessor, uh, a lovely Victorian senator, former President Scott Ryan. Upon announcing his retirement, Senator Wong said that former President Ryan deserves to be remembered as one of the great presidents of the Australian Senate, and I agree. Speaker Smith and former President Ryan steered this parliament through a very difficult time during the course of the pandemic. It is a remarkable achievement that this parliament was able to continue to operate during these very difficult times, which has been vital to ensuring that the legislative arm of government was able to continue holding and those in the opposition were able to hold government to account, inquiries and committees that are such, so fundamental to our work as senators uh, on behalf of the people who sent us here. 
So on behalf of the Nationals, I'd like to thank uh, former Senator Scott Ryan for his services in this place, not just as a senator, but as a president who always put this chamber and its place in our democracy uh, first. Senator Waters. I rise on behalf of the Australian Greens to offer my congratulations to you as our new president, Senator Brockman. Uh, whilst there is a convention that the big parties agree upon who will fill the role of president and deputy president, the Greens don't think that that stitch-up serves democracy, and hence we nominated a strong and fabulous woman of colour uh, who would have been a brilliant president. It was not to be this time around. Um, however, I think that, uh, President, you have a very good temperament to be fulfilling the role of president, and we wish you well in those endeavours. I note that in your speech to Senator Seawitz valedictory, you spoke of your experience working with her uh, as policy director for the Pastoralists and Graziers Association, where you learnt about the possibility of bridges being built across the partisan divides of this chamber. I look forward to working with you in continuation of that spirit and ensuring that this chamber continues to fulfil its role uh, as a house of review and a place where we hold the government of the day to account. I'd like to say a few brief words about former Senator and former President uh, Scott Ryan. Uh, during the time of his presidency, uh, he was an impartial and fair chair. We had a positive uh, working relationship, and obviously, whilst we have fundamental uh, differences of opinion on many matters, he always had an open door. And I particularly would like to acknowledge and commend the work that he did on a remote parliament in a global pandemic. Uh, he has steered us and this chamber um, in a good direction over that time. Uh, the work of, of Senator Ryan in enabling the Senate to continue its role during those challenging times, along with all of the work that went in by so many other people in this place to make that happen, uh, deserves commendation. And of course, we wish him and his family well in his uh, coming endeavours. Senator Patrick. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I just uh, rise. Uh, I, I know I speak on behalf of the crossbench in saying that uh, Scott Ryan was a fantastic president. Uh, he served the uh, the uh, Senate very well. I wish to congratulate you on your uh, election uh, to the role of president. I've s uh, served with you on the select Senate Select Committee on the multi-jurisdictional um, management of the, uh, the Murray-Darling and indeed on the Economics Committee, and you've always been fair. Uh, I haven't seen you raise your voice in the Senate, so I'm looking forward to question time today. <laughs> Senator Lyons. Thank you, Mr President. I rise as Deputy President to congratulate you on your election this morning. I look forward to working with you. I note you'll be the third president um, I've worked with, and I'm not sure if that says something about the government or something about us as, as uh, the opposition, but I do look forward to working with you, as I discussed um, with you when we met in Western Australia a couple of weeks ago, that I've seen you, you work as chair of committees and you've always been very fair. And, I look forward to that uh, fairness. And I also pay my respects to um, Scott Ryan as the previous president. Um, he had a very calm way of working, and I know that you do too, and I, I look forward to that uh, continued calmness. So congratulations on your appointment today. There being no further contributions, the sitting of the Senate is suspended until the ringing of the bells.
Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Nangri, 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 Nangri people who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respects to the elders past and present of all Australia's Indigenous people. I report that, accompanied by honourable senators early today, I presented myself to the Governor-General as the choice of the Senate as President. The Governor-General gave me a commission to administer to senators the oath or affirmation of allegiance. I table the commission. Clerk. Mr President, I table documents pursuant to statute and returns to order as listed on the dynamic red. And Mr President, I indicate that committees have lodged proposals as shown at item 9 of today's order of business to hold meetings. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. I seek leave to move a motion to provide for the remote participation of senators. There being no objection, leave is granted. Uh, I move that the rules for remote participation in Senate proceedings recommended by the Procedure Committee in its first report of 2021 have effect during the sittings of the Senate from 18 to 21 October 2021. The question is that that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Minister. I seek leave to move a motion relating to the hours of meeting. There being no objection, leave is granted. I move that 1. The hours of meeting for Monday 18 October 2021 be 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. A. Divisions may take place between 6.30 p.m. and 7.20 p.m. And B. The question for the adjournment be proposed at 7.20 p.m. 2. The hours of meeting for Tuesday 19 October 2021 be midday to 8 p.m. And the question for the adjournment be proposed at 7.20 p.m. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, President. I inform the Chamber that I will represent the Australian Greens as whip from today. Thank you, Senator McKim. Oh, sorry, Senator Roberts. I wish to inform the Senate that I'll be acting uh, One Nation whip from, for this week. Thank you very much, Senator Roberts. Senator Sazelja. Uh, thank you. I move that the following bills be considered today at the time for private senators' bills. Public Governance, Performance and Accountability Amendment, Improved Grants Reporting Bill 2021 and Commonwealth Electoral Amendment, Integrity of Elections Bill 2021. The question is that that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Clark. Private Senators' Bills, Order of the Day number 82, Public Governance Performance and Accountability Amendment, Improved Grants Reporting Bill 2021, Resumption of Second Reading Debate. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Can I take this opportunity to uh, congratulate you on your um, position and your election to the, the role of President this morning? The very existence of this bill, the fact that I am up here needing to debate an anti rorting bill from opposition, highlights the urgency of the situation that we find ourselves in today. Day after day, month after month, over the past eight long years, the Liberals and Nationals have been in government. Australians have opened the newspapers or turned on the TV news only to learn about a new spending scandal ensnaring this government. Sports rorts, building better regions rort, the pork and ride commuter car park scheme, and they're only the most recent and most, uh, some of the most egregious examples. Two weeks ago, on the 2nd of October, I opened the Daily Telegraph to find one of the most galling examples of just how shameless this government has come, become with its rorts. In an article about the continuing saga of the National Party 
uh, considering whether they'll agree to net zero climate policy. An unnamed government MP told the Daily Telegraph that policy packages are going to be less important than the compensation package being offered to regional Australia. The MP quoted and joked, there's going to be a giant National Party green rainbow across regional Australia with crocs full of pork at the bottom. So that's where we're at after eight long years of this government, a government MP joking with a journalist about the flagrant misuse of taxpayer dollars to buy off members of this government, senior members in fact, like the Deputy Prime Minister, Mr Joyce. And what this quote says to me and the rest of Australia, and the Australian public for that matter, is that the rorts have reached a crisis point. This government is at the point where they don't even care about being caught anymore, and they're actually joking in broad daylight about what is to come in the lead up to the next election. And to be honest, this sort of behaviour is so blatant, it's so brazen, you'd be forgiven for thinking that this sort of spending, this bankrolling anyone or any seat that's a bit politically difficult, is a natural part of any government's activity. They do it so casually in the hope that Australians will think that this approach to budgeting is a perfectly legitimate strategy. Well, Australians work hard for their money, and they should be able to have faith that those who find themselves in positions of power making decisions about how Australian taxpayer dollars are spent are doing so with the utmost honesty and integrity, which is exactly why in Labor we've left, been left with no choice but to introduce this bill for debate. It's clear that the current Commonwealth grant rules and guidelines are part of the problem when it comes to a lack of transparency around government spending. At the moment, a minister who approves grants against the recommendation of their department or within their own electorate can have up to 16 months free pass before their decisions are made public. In some cases, and indeed in the case of the, of the pork barrelling that has been foreshadowed by go government MPs in a newspaper, that will be well after the next federal election. That's what the Prime Minister and his ministers hope will remain the case. In a government that is already marred by a don't ask, don't tell culture, this sort of lag time has undoubtedly helped the Prime Minister and others avoid accountability on dodgy spending decisions. Labor believes that taxpayers deserve to know how their money is being spent in as close as possible to real time, not 16 months down the track. That's why this bill will force ministers who award grants in their own electorate or against departmental recommendation to report the decision to the finance minister within just 30 days of the approval, and then the finance minister has to table that report in the parliament within five sitting days. This will dramatically reduce the time ministers are able to hide their dodgy decisions from the Australian community, and there is no reasonable argument for any senator in this place particularly those on the government benches, to oppose this bill. The fact that we are even introducing this bill, though, is a sad indictment of the current state of affairs under Scott Morrison and the coalition. But rorting and pork barrelling is just business as usual for this lot, as it has been for some time. Since 2014, this government has created more than 150 funds or grants programs in the budget, totalling almost $70 billion in public money. Now, let's be clear, some of these funds are legitimate and we accept that. But what we don't accept is the pattern of behaviour that has become standard practice for the Morrison government. That behaviour is to hide money away in these funds for a rainy day and only open them up to coalition held or target seats, sometimes on the eve of an election, and most importantly, to do so in a way that keeps it secret for as long as possible. And let's make no mistake, this pattern started when Mr Morrison, our current Prime Minister, was Treasurer. He learnt very early that it's a pretty neat way to campaign without ever having to touch your own Liberal Party campaign funds. In the lead-up to the last election, we saw 91 per cent of the $30 million in round three of the Safer Community Funds go to government-held, independent or marginal Labor seats with the government rejecting projects picked by experts and instead choosing to funnel it into their own hand-picked projects. We saw a $150 million fund dedicated to building female change rooms appropriated for swimming pools in 11 Liberal and National Party held seats. 
And we even saw a Liberal seat holder announce $400,000 worth of community environment program funding before the program was even opened. Fancy that. And these aren't even the most egregious of examples. Who could forget sports rorts? $100 million in funding flung out the door, not based on the advice of Sports Australia, but based on a colour-coded spreadsheet that passed between the Prime Minister's office and Senator McKenzie's office on the eve of the election, indeed with final decisions being made after caretaker commenced. Or the latest one, the pork and ride commuter car park rort, which puts sports rorts to shame, really. A $660 million fund for commuter car parks with a view to reduce congestion in urban areas and ensure that the commuters get home sooner. And who could forget the Treasurer of Australia on budget night announcing this fund to the Australian people in his budget speech. We're going to have a commuter car park uh, fund to tackle congestion, to beat congestion. What he didn't say in that speech is we're only going to canvass government members to be able to apply for this fund. So public, we'll, take all, we'll, we'll use your money and announce this fund and make it look like it's going to be open to everybody, but then we're going to have a secret process where only coalition members can be invited and canvassed, I think was the word, canvassed for what they'd like and where they'd like. And lo and behold, the Treasurer of Australia gets four in his electorate. So announces the fund on budget night, pretends that it's open to anywhere with urban congestion issues, and then on the eve of the election again, before any transparency, or accountability, sign off for in your own electorate. That's what happened here. The Treasurer of Australia under the apprentice of the Prime Minister when it comes to how to rort funds, because it starts at the top. And this Prime Minister rewards ministers who take public funds, put in a dodgy process around it, and then allocate the Australian people's money into seats they either want to hold or want to win, or for a political fix with the National Party. That's the other option. And that's how this, this government works. And there will be no lecturing about fiscal responsibility from this government. The, the government that has wasted more money than any other government since Federation. There will be no lectures on fiscal responsibility because this is the behaviour they have engaged in year after year for eight long years, and the Australian people are paying the price for it. Because this bill does have to get paid. Once the pork barrelling and the rorts are over and the government's kicked out, the bill is still there. And this is why we are introducing uh, this bill today. And when government members are questioned about the appropriateness or otherwise of their spending, they fob it off. Oh well, we, we hold seats in those areas. That's why we're funnelling 90 per cent of the funding into those areas. Sorry that you've, uh, there's only 10 per cent for the rest of you. But that's just because that's, that's where we hold a seat and that's where we want to maintain uh, our seat. They, can't, they don't even pretend. I think the, uh, the Deputy Prime Minister was quoted as saying, oh, well, I don't care. I don't care when asked about pork barrelling in the regions. That's where we're up to. And let's look at the building better regions rort, because I think that has been a really special one for this government. They learnt, it was one of the earlier uh, performers in terms of how to funnel money into coalition seats. So it started as a relatively modest program in the uh, rorting schemes that we've seen uh, established. Started out as a $300 million fund in 2016. Well, because it's been so successful at being able to funnel money into particular electorates without any, um, without any accountability, it's been topped up several times, and the fund has now grown to a whopping $1.38 billion. And the Deputy Prime Minister announced a couple of weeks ago that $100 million would be going into round five of the program, bringing the total round five funding to $300 million. And then, in the same breath, isn't it 
What a coincidence! Nearly 90 per cent of this funding, 270 million out of 300 million, went to coalition-held or target seats. So this shows that even after sports rorts, even after the female uh, change rooms rorts, even after the commuter car park rorts, even after the Auditor General has handed down scathing report after scathing report and still has reports into the urban, urban congestion fund going, that this government doesn't care because they haven't changed anything about the way they allocate money through these schemes. We know that of the 112 out of 330 projects in round three of the Building Better Regions Fund and 49 of the 163 projects in round four were approved against departmental recommendations. And when the government is forced, under a Senate order, to table the information about those decisions, and it is inadequate, it does take months, but when by Senate order they are required to table it, and we had this at estimates, all of the detail, all of the attachments are blacked out under some confidentiality principle. So we have this situation where you have all of the details, but nobody's allowed to see them, just a straight black sheet of paper released in terms of trying to, to um, bring this government to some transparency. That's the approach. So this is an issue that we take really seriously. And I would, I, I would note that um, the, the usual defence, which is, well, you all do it too. And the finance minister used the, um, I think the argument on national TV that, uh, well, we took it to the people and the people vote us in, therefore we can do what we like. Well, the problem with that argument is when you announce the Building Better Regions Fund and the sports um, community grants programs and the sporting infrastructure programs and the swimming facility improvement programs and the Building Better Regions Fund, when they're all announced, you don't say that we're going to have a dodgy process around it and funnel all this money into uh, our seats that we want to hold. When that money is appropriated through the appropriation bills, the Australian people are, you know, it's right to believe that that money is there for all of them, <laughs> you know, because that's how this money is made available. It's made available through an appropriation bill based on the government saying we are establishing this program. But then there's this fine line, this little, this small print, you know, better get down in the detail, which is never published when these funds are appropriated, which is, oh, by the way, 90 per cent of this, these billions of dollars are going to be allocated to our election priorities, which are going to favour the seats we want to win. That is not said to people before the election. And I think if, if the government was honest and took that approach, that we're going to establish funds and then we're only going to allow our people to apply for them, there may very well be a different election result. So it's dishonest to use that as a defence for the way these programs are managed. This government wastes, has wasted more money than any government through, since Federation through the JobKeeper, $20 billion provided to companies whose profit, didn't meet, whose profit increased and who didn't meet uh, the turnover threshold tests. That's the legacy of this government. So no more lectures on fiscal responsibility as you're pork barrelling your way around the country. And people Senator should support Gallagher, this bill. Your time has expired. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. And I rise today to make a contribution on the Public Governance Performance and Accountability Amendment, Improved Grants Reporting Bill 2021. And look, Madam Deputy President, this bill does have some reasonable intentions um, around uh, ensuring government transparency, uh, uh, sorry, transparency rather of government expenditure, um, but it does seem to not take into account uh, some of the uh, processes, rules, procedures, policies that this government has already uh, put in place to ensure that um, that we have transparency over those decisions. And 
Um, in making my contribution here today, I, will, um, I intend to provide some background as to what those existing, um, existing frameworks look like and also uh, highlight some of the issues with this bill, particularly regarding how it um, duplicates existing processes, um, uh, confuses information and has the potential to create inconsistency when it comes to the manner in which government reports its grants. The government is committed to transparency on government grant and government expenditure, and Senator Gallagher's bill would significantly increase the duplication in existing reporting arrangements, creating, in effect, um, a fifth set of reporting rules that duplicate reporting that already operates under four other sets of rules. And I'll go into some background regarding that now. Um, currently, grants that are awarded by a minister, either contrary to official advice that it be rejected or in the minister's own electorate are already disclosed to the finance minister. Um, for corporate Commonwealth entities, this is required under, public, under the public governance performance and accountability rules, and for non-corporate Commonwealth entities, this is required under the Commonwealth grant rules and guidelines. Currently, grant information is also disclosable in Parliament under Senate Orders of Continuing Effect, numbers 16 and 23E. Order 23E covers most grants reported to the Finance Minister, and Order 16 covers all grants. Transparency is not only achieved uh, through periodic reporting to the Parliament, but it's also achieved directly and faster through online reporting to the wider public. Indeed, this has already been happening at a federal government level for a number of years. In 2017, the government mandated the requirement to report all grants on the Grant Connect website, which is located at www.grants.gov.au. This site provides whole-of-government consolidated data on grant opportunities and grants awarded. Grants are uploaded regularly throughout the year to this site after grant agreements are signed. And that's an important point that I'll come to later. Um, the Grant Connect website captures information on grant recipients and their location and the value of grant decisions. The website includes the guidelines for each program, um, allowing people to look up who is a decision maker for the program and therefore identify which grants are decided by which minister. This website not only shows grants previously awarded but also grant rounds, grant rounds currently open and grant, grant rounds that will be opening in the near future, uh, which enables community organisations to plan future ideas for grant applications. People can uh, search by key terms for any grants that they might be interested in and can also export large data sets to find programs or decisions of greatest interest. Grant Connect can also notify registered users on grant opportunities as they become available. So this website really is um, the, the public interface through which Australians can access whatever information they need uh, about the awarding of government grants and about any potential grants that might soon be um, up for consideration. The bill that we're debating here today deals with one subset of grants, specifically those that are awarded on the basis of ministerial decision. And I know Senator Gallagher said that she'd heard these comments before, but I am going to repeat them here today, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. Governments of all colours have considered it appropriate to use ministers as decision makers for some grant programs. Ministers often have greater opportunities than officials to consult extensively with their local communities, non-government organisations, industries and with other stakeholders. They travel extensively around the country and hear frequently from constituents, including from people who are referred by parliamentary colleagues from around the country. Therefore, ministers are often uniquely positioned as grant decision makers because they have a very broad understanding of community needs. This is a fundamental tenet of our democracy, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, um, because fundamentally what would be the point of having ministers in the first place if the bureaucracy always decided these things? And certainly um, we on this side of the chamber um, would, would never attest that the bureaucracy always 100 per cent of the time knows best. Um, the Commonwealth grant rules and guidelines state that where ministers decide grants, then they must consider official advice. But they are not rubber stamps, and they are obliged to use their own judgment so they may take a different view to officials. But ministers are always required in the first instance to receive and consider the official advice. And I guess that's, that's where the control point is um, in this process. 
Mr Acting Deputy, Pre Deputy President, that ministers first and foremost must consider the advice from the bureaucracy and then determine whether or not they are going to uh, overrule that advice. So that's the background, generally speaking, on the administration of grants and the awarding of grants um, at a federal level. And um, I will now outline um, for the chamber the five key issues that we see um, with this bill. And the first is that the bill has an inconsistent manner of treating different agencies as it relates to their grants. The bill proposes to introduce a new term of a reportable grant which covers most grants that are currently reported to the finance minister by ministers in respect of 98 non-corporate Commonwealth entities. However, Senator Gallagher's bill does not cover any of the grants that are administered by the 71 corporate Commonwealth entities. This seems a slightly odd oversight. The bill is oblivious to the fact that there are separate requirements in the PGPA regulations that cover those 71 entities, several of which also administer grants. This bill would therefore um, create a, a divergence in the current approach, which is aligned between the treatment of grants administered by corporate and non-corporate government agencies. That alignment was cemented in regulations on 17 July last year, regulations that Senator Gallagher might have missed uh, in drafting this um, private senator's bill that we are discussing here today, because this bill would take these requirements to a position of inconsistency. This bill also places detail in the PGPA Act covering practices that have until now been in delegated legislation. It would require agency officials to depart from following a consolidated set of rules and guidelines that provide a single point of reference today in the Commonwealth Rules and Guidelines to expecting them to follow scattering rules that are separated between primary and delegated law. This will inevitably increase the risk of inadvertent rule breaches by officials and make for a confused structure of laws governing our grants processes. Procedural information more appropriately belongs in regulation and key principles belong in primary law. This bill cuts against long-standing practice for procedural requirements around grants that have allowed officials to follow a unified rulebook. The second issue with the bill, as I say it, Mr Acting Deputy President, is um, duplication. This bill would require ministers who approve grants to provide reports to the finance minister within 30 days of their approval related to three types of grants. Those the department recommended against, those within their own electorate, that is the minister's own electorate, and those that did not meet any of the relevant selection criteria. However, that third category, um, at least to my mind, is overlapped completely by the first. It will mean that everything reported in category three will also have to be reported under category one. Um, if a grant doesn't meet any of the relevant selection criteria, it therefore follows that the department would be recommending against awarding that grant. Um, that grant would therefore be reportable under Category 1, just as it's reportable now, under both the Commonwealth Grant Rules and Guidelines and under existing Senate orders. This bill that we're debating here today will make that same grant reportable yet another time for no obvious purpose. The bill's also unclear about the time point at which an application is reportable if it didn't meet the criteria for the particular grant program. Um, and again, it's been acceptable under governments of all colours for opportunities to be afforded for applicants to improve their grant proposals in some circumstances, um, for instance, where there are few applicants in a given region or a sector of the community. And, and this bill, unfortunately, deals with those situations quite poorly. If an application is initially found not to meet a criteria and then later the proponent agrees to changes that would bring them within the relevant program criteria before the minister approves, this bill suggests it would have to be reported as if it were outside guidelines, which seems to be a somewhat misleading outcome when all that has effectively happened is a negotiation between department and proponent to ensure that uh, the, the grant in question operates within the criteria or guidelines. Um, the bill looks only at what is in a grantee's initial application, not what is in a final grant agreement after that negotiation between proponents and officials. The bill, therefore, may lead to reputational harm for proponents who have ultimately come into accord with program requirements. 
The third issue we see in this bill, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, is the duplication of existing reporting requirements of the Commonwealth Grant Rules and Guidelines 2017 relevant to Senate standing orders. Um, it duplicates Senate Order 16, which I previously mentioned um, requires ministers to table grants approved between estimates periods three times a year, at least seven days before each estimates round. Grant details are tabled to facilitate Senate scrutiny. Um, and this reporting covers many more grants that would be reported under the bill that we're discussing today. Um, and this bill also duplicates the requirements of Senate Order of Continuing Effect 23E. This order requires tabling of reports from other ministers to the Finance Minister um, about grants awarded contrary to official advice, including those grants that I previously mentioned awarded in a minister's own electorate contrary to official advice. The fourth issue. Um, I'll briefly go into Mr Acting Deputy President is um, inaccurate reporting. In the pursuit of rapid reporting, uh, this bill would result in inaccurate reporting. Ministers would have to report to the Finance Minister within 30 days, um, and then the Finance Minister would be required to table the reports in the Parliament within five sitting days of receiving them. And I think this bill um, confuses a decision by a minister with the award of a grant. A grant isn't payable until a grant agreement is struck, which occurs after a minister's decision. Variations can occur during the negotiation of an agreement between an agency and an applicant, as I previously mentioned. And this is why uh, the existing regular reporting on that Grant Connect website that I mentioned earlier is based on grant agreements, based on actual legal undertakings, as opposed to ministerial decisions on allocations which are closer in nature to policy decisions. In some cases, grant applicants drop out, for instance, uh, because the minister doesn't award as much funding as they were originally seeking or because the applicant might be unwilling to meet all of the conditions of funding that the Commonwealth requires. This bill would create several harms to the public interest by requiring public reporting of intended grants at a point prior to the finalisation of a grant agreement. First, this may hinder agreement negotiations with applicants and reduce value for money where officials are seeking better outcomes for taxpayer expenditure. And second, in the event that an agreement is not signed, this would result in the publishing of misleading data that will contradict other, more accurate public information reported on Grant Connect and reportable to the Senate. For instance, amounts reported under this bill may be different from what is actually and ultimately paid. Indeed, the bill may require publishing amounts that, in fact, may never be paid. Um, and fifthly and finally, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, I want to address the issue of the lowering of standards um, that may inadvertently result from this bill. The Commonwealth grant rules and guidelines currently require ministers to report to the Finance Minister about grants that occur in their own electorates as soon as practicable. This bill, by contrast, would seek to contradict this in primary law by requiring that this occur within 30 days. And this creates real issues um, of interpretation and a tension in how we interpret um, these guidelines. The current obligation is focused on drawing forward the obligation to the earliest possible point. That's why it says, as soon as practicable. Because this bill would redefine what is a reportable grant in primary law, it could override and therefore push that reporting timeline back to the 30 days. All these reporting cycles inevitably depend on our public servants tracking decisions on behalf of their ministers and gathering up documents for each reporting cycle. If a new conflicting standard is introduced around how soon they have to report, well, it's easy to see that officials trying, uh, might try to fold processes together. Um, which means that reporting will ultimately happen later than it currently does. As I said in my introductory remarks, Mr Acting Deputy President, this bill evidently has some reasonable intentions around transparency, but it is not taking into account the processes this government has already put in place to ensure transparent you, reporting Senator of government Senator grants. Waters. Thanks very much, Acting Deputy President. In the few minutes that I've got uh, allocated to speak on this, I want to list all of the rorts that have happened. We've got sports rorts one and two. We've got safer communities. We've got pork and ride, the urban congestion fund. We've got building better regions. I'm actually going to run out of time to list all of those rorts. Are there any buckets of public money that this government won't use for its own electoral gain? 
There are so many examples of grants being awarded contrary to selection criteria or merit, and as you head into the election, I have no doubt that we will see more from this government. This is a government that feels entirely comfortable using public money to feather its own electoral nests. Now, we've got some Commonwealth grant guidelines, and they require disclosures to be made to the finance minister, but that's where it stopped. So that's why last year in May, the Greens moved for an order of continuing effect, which we passed, that made that information become public. They tried to reveal that these rorts are happening and not just let the government keep it all under wraps. Now, this bill builds on that and we support it. Um, but it's not enough just to stop the rorts. We need a strong federal corruption watchdog. We've been waiting a thousand days for this government to get on with the job. My bill, which passed the Senate two years ago, has been languishing in the House for all of that time. And I'll be moving again this week to force the government to bring that on in the House. The Australian public are fed up with the rotting, they're fed up with the corruption, and they deserve better. Thank, thank you. Senator Ciccone. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. I move that the debate on this bill be adjourned. Okay, the motion is that debate on the bill uh, to be adjourned. Of those opinions say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clark. General Business Order of the Day No. 89, Commonwealth Electoral Amendment, Integrity of Elections Bill 2021, resumption of second reading debate. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I present the Commonwealth Electoral Amendment, Integrity of Elections Bill 2021, which amends the Commonwealth Electoral Act of 1918. This bill provides for the routine auditing of the electronic component of Australian federal elections and for the provision of voter identification. It should be noted that this bill does not look backward to previous elections, but rather forward to ensure confidence in the next election and future elections thereafter. During COVID, the actions of unelected bureaucrats and incompetent politicians has wiped out small businesses and jobs, disrupted lives and reduced many people to desperation. The next election will be a powder keg. It's essential for that reason to ensure that Australians can accept the result and move on. Suspicion of the outcome can be easily fuelled, especially on social media, and turned into violence by those who seek to manipulate the result for their own ends. The level of trust in the result must be commensurate with the current heightened level of risk. When I started researching election integrity, it was to show that our elections are secure. That's not what I found. The Australian National Audit Office NAO, conducted three audits into the 2013 federal election. Their report came out in 2016. This is what NAO said about the Australian Electoral Commission, the AEC. Quote, in 2014, the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters wrote to the Auditor-General seeking a performance audit focusing on the adequacy of the Australian Electoral Commission implementation of recommendations arising from the Australian National Audit Office audits of the Australian Electoral Commission. The, Australian the Auditor General decided to conduct three related performance audits. All three reports found that the Australian Electoral Commission had not adequately and effectively implemented the earlier Australian National Audit Office recommendations. The reports concluded that in order to protect the integrity of the Australian electoral system and rebuild confidence in the Australian Electoral Commission, these recommendations should be implemented. The report went on to say, quote, the Australian National Audit Office plans to undertake a follow-up audit following the next federal election in 2016 to examine the adequacy and effectiveness of the Australian Electoral Commission's implementation of the 10 recommendations made by the Australian National Audit Office across three reports. Those recommendations included, quote, the Australian Electoral Commission must develop a strategy for deeper reform to ensure and demonstrate integrity in all aspects of the election, including a fundamental overhaul of the Australian Electoral Commission's policies and procedures to restore confidence in the electoral process. To restore confidence in the, in the electoral process. So let me say that again. A fundamental overhaul to ensure election integrity. The follow-up audit to test how well the Australian Electoral Commission implemented this fundamental review into election integrity never occurred. Perhaps someone should do a bill to bring on that audit. Oh, hang on. I did. Were the Australian National Audit Office happy for this direction? Apparently not. 
In their submission to this bill, the Australian National Audit Office said my bill was not necessary as they had the power to audit the Australian Electoral Commission at any time. If that's the case, then they should just get on with it. New South Wales and, and Western Australia have provisions in their electoral acts to audit state elections. New South Wales conducts an audit before each election to ensure systems are fit for purpose, and then audits again after each election to ensure integrity and to see what can be improved for the next time. Western Australia audits after every election. There is no audit function currently specified in the Commonwealth Electoral Act 1918. None. This bill creates a function for the Auditor General to audit the operation, that is my bill, to audit the operation of the Australian Electoral Commission twice in each election cycle. One in the lead up to the election and then immediately after, from polling day, after the election from polling day to the declaration of the poll. The audit provided for in this bill covers electronic measures and tests if, quote, the use of authorised technology produces the same result as would be obtained without the use of authorised technology. Put simply, this is asking the Auditor General to ensure that the use of computerised voter rolls, tallying, preference allocations and related matters produced a result that accurately reflects the will of the people including the tallying of the preferences electronically, reflects the will of the people. The Australian National Audit Office felt that that was too high a bar to meet. Can you believe that? I would consider ensuring the will of the people was ref accurately ref reflected in the result was the bare minimum for any election audit. This bill does not specify what will be audited. The decision regarding the operation of the audit is best left to the agencies conducting the audit. Secondly, this bill authorises the Australian Signals Directorate, Directorate to audit and monitor computer systems for unauthorised access internally and externally. This is targeting both unauthorised access from within the system and unauthorised external access by malicious entities. The Australian Signals Directorate is currently conducting a cyber uplift program at the Australian Electoral Commission. While the program is most welcome, there is no basis in the Commonwealth Electoral Act 1918 or the Intelligence Services Act 2001 for that program. This bill, my bill, brings legislation into line with current practice. In May Senate estimates, I asked the Australian Electoral Commission simple questions, simple questions regarding their auditing. I was assured that audits are occurring. On no occasion then or since have the following questions fundamental questions been answered. Who conducted the audit? When was the audit conducted? What was audited? What was the result? Have any changes been made as a result of the audit? It's disturbing that such an audit could happen behind closed doors without direction or structure. It's more disturbing that this program has no legal basis in the Commonwealth Electoral Act. We should not have to rely on the admirable conscientiousness of the Australian Signals Directorate, who I applaud. We should be able to rely on the completeness of our legislation. I looked at other issues around election integrity. First up was a simple question. At the Senate Scanning Centre, is the electronic data file containing each vote ever compared back to the paper ballot after the vote has been adjudicated? Simple question. The answer is no, never. At no time in the, is the electronic record of a vote checked back against the paper ballot once the ballot is electronically adjudicated. Some disputed votes are held back and adjudicated later in the counting process, then filed away. There's no routine sampling beyond that point. That's not acceptable. The third part of my bill is for voter ID. Most of the recommendations in the Australian National Audit Office report that was never followed up went to failures in the integrity of voter rolls. Now it's too late to go back now and audit those rolls before the next election by way of recommencing, recommencing residency checks as the Australian National Audit Office recommended. It's not too late for a quick fix. 
which is voter ID. Asking for simple identification will act as an audit on the rolls in real time and ensure every vote cast was legitimate. Now, this is not my idea. Recommendation 21 of the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters inquiry into the 2019 federal election called for voter identification to be introduced. The House of Representatives and the Senate call for the identification to be introduced. This same finding was made in 2016 and 2013 three times. Schedule 2 of this bill is drafted of my bill is drafted to give effect to the committee recommendation as literally as possible. Voters must present a form of acceptable identification to be issued with an ordinary pre-poll or election day vote. Authorised identification must be suitably broad so as to not actively prevent electors from casting an ordinary ballot. This bill allows a wide range of acceptable voter ID. The Australian Electoral Commission is empowered in this bill to make further regulations to ensure voters are not disenfranchised. We want fair elections. The Australian Electoral Commission noted in their submission to the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters inquiry that multiple, quote, multiple voting is frequently the subject of media commentary and social media speculation. Such a degree of focus is entirely understandable. There can hardly be a more emblematic component of trust in electoral results than ensuring eligible voters only exercise the franchise appropriately. Multiple voting is a red herring in this debate. My bill is not, con not concerned with multiple voting. It is concerned with ensuring every vote cast was made according to the law. The Commonwealth Electoral Act Integrity of Elections Bill 2020 is about protecting confidence in our elections. The cyber integrity of our elections and the use of voter identification is essential to that confidence. I want, Madam Deputy President, to thank the Finance and Public Administration Committee of in for their inquiry and, their, and the Secretariat for its work in compiling the submissions. We have learned quite a few good points for that and we'll be amending this legislation. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Senator Farrell. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy uh, President. Uh, and I rise to speak uh, <clears throat> on this bill, the Commonwealth Electoral Amendment Integrity of Elections Bill 2021. Um, I'll indicate at the outset that Labor will not be supporting this bill. The bill seeks to do two things. Uh, firstly, introduce a system of routine auditing of software used by the Australian Electoral Commission and uh, requires uh, voters to present identification when they go to vote. Uh, I'll address the auditing provisions first. The bill requires the Auditor General to conduct an audit of technology uh, twice during an electoral cycle, once at least seven days before the voting commences in a federal election, and <clears throat> again within 60 days after the return of the writs for a federal election. The bill also requires the Australian Signals Directorate to prevent and disrupt any interference with the cyber integrity of federal um, elections. This bill leaves uh, one uh, with the impression that our electoral system is dangerously exposed. Uh, but, uh, Deputy President, nothing could be further from the truth. The parliament should not give credence to baseless fears. For this parliament to do so, we create a false impression that there is a problem when there simply isn't. Irresponsible uh, politicians in the United States have undermined their own institutions by promoting bizarre conspiracy theories about the conduct of elections. Australia's independent electoral system is the envy of Western democracies around the world. And that will surprise no one in this place to know that it was a Labor government, led by uh, Prime Minister Bob Hawke, that established the Independent Australian Electoral Commission. The Labor government did this in 1984, at the same time as it introduced transparent political donation systems requiring political donations above the figure of $1,000 to be disclosed. Madam Deputy President, as you would know, that's blown out to 
$14,500 under successive Liberal governments and its Labor policy to bring the threshold back to that $1,000 because we are the party of transparency. Labor will never allow the weakening of the AEC or the undermining of this process. Ensuring the integrity of elections is at the AEC's core. That is why the Commission already has robust systems in place. The bill requires the involvement of the Australian Signals Directorate, but the AEC already works with the ASD and other cyber security agencies to ensure the integrity of our systems and its compliance with the Commonwealth Cyber Security Guidelines. The Electoral Integrity Task Force has also been established to protect our democracy from foreign interference, disinformation and electoral fraud. There have been multiple independent audits and testing of the AEC's counting and its distribution of preference software, which have found no issues with the integrity of the vote count. We uh, should, uh, also shouldn't forget the important safeguards to the system that ordinary scrutineers provide. Scrutineers can view and challenge the count, and indeed very frequently do, including the scanning of ballot papers and the processing of all digital ballot paper images. In a further uh, effort for transparency, the seat-by-seat -seat result of our elections are published uh, on the AEC's virtual tally room. This allows anyone to view the results in every seat and verify those results. This bill was referred to the Senate's Finance and Public Administration Committee for inquiry and report. The bipartisan recommendation of that committee was the bill not be passed. This was based on submissions received by the committee, which identified several issues with the bill. The Australian National Audit Office, which had been tasked with conducting audits required by this bill, argued that the auditing function is best left to the AEC in support of its mandate. The ANOA submission noted that the ANOA already has the powers to audit the AEC uh, systems and processes. The ANOA also noted that, as an independent statutory authority, the AEC is oversighted by the Parliament Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters. The JSCM has the power to inquire into all aspects of the AEC's operations and, um, conduct, uh, and conduct of electoral events. Lastly, the High Court, sitting as the Court of Disputed Repe um, Returns, can hear petitions disputing the valid, uh, validity of election results. We de deliberately have an independent and robust electoral system in Australia. We should not pass legislation based on unsubstantiated fear, but rather based on fact. Senator Roberts is always talking about the facts, as I recall. Uh, and so <clears throat> let's not base our judgments here on unsubstantiated fear, but on the facts. And let's go through the facts, uh, Madam uh, Deputy President. There's no issue with the integrity of the AEC, and we should support it to do its important job rather than seek to publicly undermine it. The second major amendment to the bill seeks to make it uh, is to introduce voter ID laws. Voter ID laws have been consistently opposed by the uh, Australian Labor Party. We will never support them for the simple fact that they undermine our compulsory voting system uh, and uh, discourage some people from exercising their democratic rights. It's a simple thing for us uh, here to produce identification. We have it readily available. That's not the case for some more um, uh, vulnerable members of our community. People who are living in remote Indigenous communities do not always have identification, and it's always problematic for homeless people and those escaping domestic violence. Voting is a fundamental right that comes with Australian citizenship. We cannot allow the erosion of that right by allowing people to be turned away from the polling places because they can't produce ID on that day. Wouldn't you agree, <coughs> Senator uh, McGrath? Oh, okay. Why am I surprised? Uh, in an attempt to address the situation in which people don't have ordinary forms of ID, the bill allows a voter 
to produce a community identity document. The bill empowers the Australian Electoral Commission to, pre to prescribe the form of such a document. In her submission to the committee's inquiry, um, constitutional uh, law expert, very good professor, Professor Anne Toomey, says that even with this allowance, the additional procedural burden, the effort required, the confusion that it can create and the message that it sends of being suspect or unwanted may be enough to suppress the vote. Professor Toomey points to the evidence in the United States which shows that voter ID laws suppress the vote among ethnic minorities, producing a clear partisan dis uh, distortion favouring conservative candidates. <coughs> and Madam Deputy President, we don't want that in Australia. Um, the Australian Human Rights Commission noted the low Indigenous enrolment rate of approximately 78 per cent. The AHRC says it's vital to avoid steps that would impede the progress made to increase rates of Indigenous participation in our elections. Voter ID laws would place an unreasonable burden on the AEC. It would require more staff at polling booths and place them in the invidious position of policing ID and assessing its authenticity. This would significantly slow down in-person voting, which could also have an impact of disenfranchising voters. But all of that aside, multiple voting in Australia is simply not an issue. Madam Deputy President, it barely happens, and certainly not in an organised, deliberate way. Most instances of multiple voting that do happen are of older or infirm people who have simply forgotten that they've already voted. In this submission to the uh, committee's inquiry, uh, in his submission to the um, committee's inquiry, Professor Graham Orr said that voter ID in Australia is a solution in search of a problem. The Electoral Commission has described the number of multiple voters as vanishingly small. The few instances of multiple voting that we have had never affected the outcome of an election. Given this, it is simply not worth the risk of disenfranchising thousands and thousands of Australians. The bill's explanatory memorandum claims that it is acting on a recommendation of the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters following its inquiry into the 2019 federal election. Coalition members of JSCAMS have consistently recommended voter ID laws, which Labor members have consistently opposed. Labor members on the JSCAM uh, wrote dissenting reports for the inquiries into the 2013, 2016 and 2019 elections, voicing their opposition to ID, voter ID laws. So while it is a recommendation of JSCAM, it's important to note that it was not a bipartisan recommendation, which, generally speaking, um, is the way in which uh, that particular committee uh, works, and, and for good reason. Um, <clears throat> Madam Acting Deputy President, the government recently had the opportunity to legislate to implement voter ID laws, but knowing that those laws would never have the support of Labor, instead chose to create a designated elector register. Voters um, who the Electoral Commission has a reasonable suspicion of voting more than once in an election will be placed on the designated elector register. Designated electors are only able to vote by declaration vote, ensuring that only one vote is counted. This will address any instances of multiple voting, and as such, the introduction of a voter ID law is entirely unnecessary. In addition, the AEC is rolling out more and more uh, electronic certified lists against which voters' names are marked when they attend the polling place. At Senate estimates in March this year, the Electoral Commissioner talked about the impact of that electronic certified list are having on the very few instances of multiple voting. And, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, he said this. <clears throat> To use the, the, the use of electronic certified lists will certainly aid in eliminating the incidence of multiple marks and mistakes at the point of voting. That is certainly the case as we deploy more and more ECLs, uh, as we call them. That will have a significant impact on that issue. 
So, <clears throat> Madam Acting Deputy President, Labor will not be supporting this bill. And in closing, I'd like to thank the Finance and Public Administration Committee for their work on the inquiry into this bill, especially Senators, uh, Senators uh, Kitching and Watt, and in particular uh, Deputy uh, Chair uh, Tim Ayres. Your thoughtful consideration of these issues is appreciated. Thank you, Senator Farrell. Senator McGrath. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President and uh, Senator Roberts. I strongly agree with, with you, in particular in relation to the requirement for voter ID. A, a recommendation that the J scheme has made after the 2013, 16 and 19 elections, and indeed as chair of the committee after the 16 and 19 elections, I personally made sure that that recommendation was in there. We do need voter ID in Australia, and indeed most Australians find it slightly bizarre that to get into a surf club or a bowls club that they are required to show ID, but in order to, to exercise that most important civic duty, that of, of voting, that no ID is required. And indeed, I, like many people in this chamber, do spend a lot of time at polling booths. And the number of people who come up and say, look, I don't have my ID on me, and I'll go back home and get it, and you go, well, yes, you don't need ID. And they're surprised, they're shocked that they don't need ID to vote. And we do need to make sure that, that our voting system, that our democracy is not only transparent, but it is seen to be transparent. And that is the importance of, of voter ID. Voter ID allows all participants, all voters, all those who are members of political parties to, to be guaranteed to know that each vote that is exercised is treated the, exactly the same as every other vote that is exercised. And that we do not see situations similar to what happened in the federal seat of, of Herbert and the 2016 election, Damn. where there are over 200 cases of multiple voting, Damn. yet the seat was decided by less than 40 votes. Damn. So Senator Farrell's incorrect in that regard. So, the question must always be put uh, to, to those in this chamber is why are you so concerned about extra transparency for our electoral system? What, what, is, what, what, what are you trying to hide? Surely there is no issue with, with people having ID. And the committee has been very, very, um, how do I put it, almost lenient in terms of the ID that is required. We're not talking about necessarily photo ID. We've gone as far to say that a Medicare card would be sufficient. But also, if you don't have ID on you because you're homeless or, or some, because of some other situation, that you can be issued with a declaration vote. So no one has actually ever stopped from voting because of the requirement of voter ID. Indeed, we do need to make sure that all those who, who vote in Australia or are eligible to vote in Australia do show ID. But if they don't have it on them, well, we're not going to stop people from voting. They'll be issued with a declaration vote, a, a vote that will ensure that their say in the future of Australia is, is ensured. And that is so important. So, Senator Roberts, I do commend you for bringing forward uh, the, the, this, this bill. I do commend you in particular for the provisions of, of voter ID. And I'd also believe that the, you know, the J scheme report that came down uh, some months ago had many provisions in it in relation to ensuring the protection of, of Australia's democracy. And, and that is something we need to ensure happens after every election. But I also personally would like to see the, the introduction of optional preferential voting in Australia to make sure that, that voters have the ultimate power to decide where their, their votes go. Yeah, and if yeah. they just wish to vote one, uh, for the, the Liberal National Party in Queensland, they can just vote one. Or if they just wish to vote one for the Greens, they can just vote one or, or one or just vote one for one nation. It allows it gives choice and power to the voter. It does not compel the voter to, to, to vote for parties that they do not wish to support. So I hope that we do see optional preferential voting come into Australia. And Senator Waters, I will give way to you. I do wish you wish to say in the, the moment you have left. So Senator Roberts, commend you. Well done. Thank you. Uh, Senator Waters. 
President, and I rise to speak ever so briefly uh, on this bill. The Greens won't be uh, supporting this bill, but in the uh, 20 seconds that I have available, uh, thank you to the other senators for allowing me that, I want to note some things that really do need attention if we were to uh, achieve improvement in the integrity of election campaigns, banning political donations from dirty industries seeking influence and capping all other donations to $1,000, capping election spending to avoid elections being won by parties with the deepest pockets, strengthening the rules about government advertising so the government can't Thank use you, public Senator funds Waters. in the lead. The time for this debate has expired. The Senate will now proceed to the consideration of government business, and I call the clerk. Government business order of the day number one. Export Finance and Insurance Corporation Amendment, Equity Investments and Other Measures Bill 2021, second reading debate. Senator Wong. Thank you, Deputy President. I rise to, today to speak in support of the Export Finance and Insurance Corporation Amendment, Equity Investments and Other Measures Bill. This bill seeks to broaden the range of transactions Export Finance Australia can finance by enabling EFA to make equity investments. As an open trading nation, Australia has been a beneficiary of the multilateral rules-based trading system that has operated for decades. Australian businesses and Australian jobs have benefited from these rules, supporting export growth. On average, Australian businesses that export hire 23 per cent more staff and pay 11 per cent higher wages than non-exporters. Uh, and people might refer to or recall my many contributions in support of various trading arrangements which refer to the impact on employment and wages to the benefit of working Australians. The current lack of an equity investment power restricts Export Finance Australia to a narrow range of transactions. An equity investment power will complement EFA's existing suite of financing powers comprised of loans, guarantees, bonds and insurance, and it will align EFA with export credit agencies in other countries, including the US, China, Japan, Canada and South Korea, and with other Australian government financing agencies like the Northern Australia Infrastructure Facility and the CE Clean Energy Finance Corporation. The increased financing power will be used to support important inv in infrastructure investments in, Indo in the Indo-Pacific or export-linked projects in Australia. The bill will also give legislative effect to the decision to provide export finance with the ability to offer guarantees for overseas infrastructure transactions without needing to provide a loan to the same transaction. And this will obviously improve flexibility and efficiency both of EFA and the Australian Infrastructure Financing Facility for the Pacific AIFFP overseas infrastructure financing activities, particularly in the Pacific where transactions may be most appropriately financed in local currency. Export finance providing a guarantee for another lender's loan in local currency is an effective way of facilitating local currency borrowing. And this will enable the injection of finance directly into emerging economies in our region. This equity investment power will also be available to the AIFFP, which relies on Export Finance Australia's governing legislation for the delivery of its loans. We note that the bill has appropriate safeguards which constrain government spending. Any equity investment will be on Export Finance's national interest account, which requires government approval. There is obviously the, uh, another account, the commercial account, which will remain unable to be utilised for equity investments. There is no legislated limit or cap on equity stakes, but every transaction would require ministerial approval. I want to address uh, some uh, of the government's claims in relation to the Pacific and the Indo-Pacific. The government claims that this bill will support Australia's economic engagement in the Pacific and in the Indo-Pacific. In 2019, Export Finance Australia was granted wide powers to support financing infrastructure in the Pacific in line with the so-called Pacific Step Up. Since then, we have had many flashy announcements from this government about investing in the Pacific. But Mr Morrison's failure of diplomacy has called his so-called Pacific Step Up step up into a series of Pacific stuff-ups. The Prime Minister announced the $2 billion Australian Infrastructure Financing Facility for the Pacific back in 2018. Two and a half years later, that has provided less than $90 million of the promised $2 billion in Pacific infrastructure financing. And Mr Morrison's failure to take serious action on climate change, including the government's continued and very public commitment 
a failure to commit to legislating net zero emissions by 2050 continues to undermine its own Pacific step up and damage Australian interests. Australia should be a renewable energy superpower, and we should be helping our neighbours address climate change and secure their energy supplies through our own renewable energy expertise. This is the unique role that EFA is equipped to play for our region. But it's a role that will be filled by others, because the Morrison Joyce's gov Joyce government is dithering on climate change policy. Instead of making announcements, Mr Morrison needs to do the legwork and ensure Australia is a real partner of choice in the region. And let us also not forget that Mr Morrison's plan for an agricultural visa will directly undermine our Pacific Labor Mobility programs, including the Seasonal Workers Program and the Pacific Labor Scheme. And I note Senator Payne is in the chamber, and I would say to her that this is another example where Mr Morrison is selling out our Pacific family to satisfy the National Party colleagues. And it is a matter of great regret that this foreign minister, unlike Ms Bishop before her, has gone along with it. All at the same time that this government has failed to diversify what we export as a country and where we export. Despite the talk about a Pacific step up and despite the talk of engagement in our region, under this government we are in fact more dependent than ever on China for our exports and our jobs, more than any other country in the world. At the same time, our economic and trade relationships with some of our most important other neighbours, including India and Indonesia, have gone backwards. Australia wants a region that is stable, prosperous and respectful of sovereignty, a region that is resilient to threats such as the pandemic, and other pandemics and climate change. All of this requires deeper partnerships in the region, comprehensive support for pandemic recoveries and a genuine plan to boost Australia's trade and investment, especially as some of our neighbours now face a lost decade of development gains. So, In conclusion, Labor will support this bill because we need to invest in all of the levers, levers of our national ability to boost our engagement to support and build the region we want. Central to achieving our objectives is ensuring Australian businesses and investors can contribute to and benefit from our region's recovery and future growth. But the Morrison-Joyce government needs to do much more. It needs to boost Australia's support for the region's pandemic recovery. It needs to have a real plan for trade diversification. And it needs to fully and properly commit to net zero emissions by 2050 and work with our partners to address the existential challenge of climate change. You see, as long as the Morrison-Joyce government insists on being part of the problem rather than part of the solution, Australia will simply fall short of being a credible partner of choice in the Indo-Pacific region. Thank you, Senator Wong. Senator Cox. Acting Deputy President, this is not my first speech, and I rise today to speak on the Export Finance Insurance Corporation Amendment. Uh, the Equity Investments and Other Measures Bill of 2021. I would like to note that the, this bill um, makes changes that affect e Export Finance Australia, also known as EFA. EFA is the government's export credit agency and it provides finance to support Australian exporting businesses and overseas infrastructure projects. This bill expands a range of transactions that EFA can finance. The bill allows EFA to make equity investments and offer standalone financial guarantees for overseas infrastructure transactions. Under these changes, EFA will be able to help exporting companies by providing a guarantee to private banks that if the company fails to meet its borrowing obligations, then EFA will take responsibility for the repayment of the loan. The Greens have significant concern about the expansion of EFA's powers. EFA has a track record for investing billions in propping up the fossil fuel industry. This includes providing guarantees for financially risky projects like the Wiggins Island Coal Export Terminal and the Gladstone LNG project, along the, uh, which is along the Great Barrier, Barrier Reef. In contrast, EFA has only provided uh, $20 million in refinancing the renewable, renewables since 2009. As it currently stands, this bill imposes no restrictions on EFA, making more investment into fossil fuels. This means even more public money could be used to prop up coal, oil and gas projects and accelerate the climate crisis. As the global transition to net zero emissions gains pace, fossil fuel companies, bank and insurance institutions are finding it more difficult to access finance. 
Even if finance is secured, fossil fuel projects still face high risks of becoming stranded assets as global markets move to sustainable energy options. Jubilee Research Australia has found that export credit agencies providing guarantees or early stage loans can give unwarranted confidence to private lenders by de-risking large fossil fuel projects, which they might have otherwise avoided. This bill, like recent amendments in the Northern Australia Infrastructure Facility Act, will allow more public money to be used to prop up coal, oil and gas projects that the private sector deem, deems to be too risky. As Jubilee noted, this could leave the government holding a stake in stranded fossil fuel assets long after the market has lost interest in investing in them. DFAT and EFA advised that the equity power in this bill would only be used sparingly and that the majority equity position would only be taken in exceptional circumstances. The ministerial statement of expectations will also be updated to prevent EFA from taking majority equity stakes unless there are compelling reasons otherwise. However, no detail has been provided as to what exceptional circumstances or compelling reasons would justify significant investment. Given this government's stubborn, negligent attachment to coal and gas, we need to explicitly prohibit EFA financing fossil fuel projects. This is why the Greens will be moving an amendment in Senator Waters' name to stop EFA from investing in fossil fuels and fossil fuel-based infrastructure. I'd like to come to the second reading amendment that has been circulated by the Greens in relation to this bill. EFA has been a critical player in the development of Australia's LNG export industry. A $254.7 million loan from EFA to Santos was part of setting up their Gladstone LNG project in 2011-2012. Last year, EFA contributed $164.12 million in refinancing the Itchy's uh, LNG project in the Northern Territory. And let's make no mistake, gas is as dirty as coal. Direct emissions of methane, a gas more than 80 times more potent than CO2, is responsible for 20%, over 20 per cent of Australia's emissions and is growing at a rapid rate due to the boom in Australia's LNG projects. The world is beginning to act, with the European Union and the United States now leading a global methane pledge, which would require member countries to reduce their methane emissions by at least 30 per cent on 2020 levels by 2030. Over 30 states have signed up, including nine of the world's 20 largest methane emitters. If we hope to keep global warming in check and limit global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius, then we must ensure that all parts of government, including our finance agencies like EFA and NAIF, are doing their part in reducing methane emissions. That's why we'll be moving a second reading amendment that calls for all investors by EFA to be in line with Australia also doing its fair share to reduce methane emissions according to the Global Methane Pledge. When introducing this bill, the minister said this reform would align Australia with other countries like the USA, China, Japan, Canada and South Korea, which are making equity investments to support development and commercial objectives. What the minister failed to note in his second reading speech is that many of these countries have taken steps to prohibit export finance agencies investing in fossil fuel. Earlier this year, President Biden directed the US Export Credit Agency to identify steps through which the United States can pr promote ending international financing of carbon-intensive fossil fuel-based energy. The UK government has banned its export credit agency from funding any new coal and go gas projects overseas. And this was followed by the UK export finance committing to net zero by 2050. South Korea has also committed to ending its public financing for overseas coal-fired power plants. While other countries do the heavy lifting on climate action, Australia continues to bury its head in the sand. If this government is seriously about aligning Australia with other major economies, it would wake up and stop EFA from financing fossil fuel projects. Alongside those climate risks, we also have concern around EFA's transparency and accountability. At the moment, EFA has a partial exemption from the freedom of information laws in relation to commercial and national interest account transactions. This makes it virtually impossible for taxpayers to find out what EFA directly uh, directs its where it directly directs its funds, 
Limited access to this information undermines the efforts to evaluate the effectiveness of the projects that have been funded or assess the return on investment of public money. The government has ultimate, ultimate fiscal responsibility for the operation of EFA and EFA's financial guarantor a share, a sole shareholder. Given this, taxpayers should be able to access this information about the purpose of projects being funded instead of being kept in the dark. The Productivity Commission has previously recommended that the FOI exemption be removed and noted that the FOI Act already includes protections from national, for national security and commercially sensitive data. Other jurisdictions, including the UK and US, do not provide a blanket exemption from disclosure for their export credit agencies, and there's no justification for Australia to maintain this exemption. It's clear that EFA's current practice falls short of the transparency expected for the investment of public funds. This is why the Greens are moving an amendment today to repeal EFA's exemption from the Freedom of Information Act. Finally, I would like to highlight the concerns raised by stakeholders around EFA's processes for, for ass assessing the environmental and social impacts of its projects. There are a number of weaknesses, including the fact that EFA's environmental and social review policy and procedure rely on relatively weak international standards and do not refer to climate change or require an assessment of the carbon emissions of proposed projects. It is also unclear how gender analysis is embedded across EFA's, EFA's work. I understand that EFA's environmental social review policy is being independently reviewed. It is critical that this review ensures EFA's policies align with international best practice regarding social and environmental issues. As I have articulated, the Greens have significant concerns with this bill. Our support for this bill hinges on the government explicitly prohibiting EFA's investment in fossil fuel projects, as outlined in our amendment circulated in the chamber. The IPCC's latest warning on climate was our starkest warning yet, a code read for humanity. The world is heating fast and we don't have any time to waste. In order to avoid ca catastrophic change, we must commit to no new coal, oil or gas. Yeah. Australia can, cannot continue to ignore these stark warnings and we must get out of fossil fuel projects at home and abroad. Thank you. Yeah. Senator uh, Cox, are you moving that second reading amendment? Yes, I am. So if you just formally move it. Oh. Just indicate that you're moving the second reading amendment. Oh, sorry, I'm moving the second reading amendment. Thank Thanks, you. Senator Cox. <coughs> Senator Scar. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. And uh, at the outset, I'd just like to make two preliminary points. Uh, first, uh, I note that I'm following Senator Cox's first contribution in the chamber, so I'd like to congratulate Senator Cox on her election, and I listened carefully to a, a thoughtful, articulate speech, which was uh, certainly in keeping with um, the philosophy and the traditions of your fellow Greens members. Um, and accordingly, I disagree with most of it, but I respect it. <laughs> um, I'd also, I'd also like to, uh, I'd also like to, on a preliminary basis, uh, also note, um, if I could come to the, leap, leap is the word, not come, leap to the defence of my good friend Senator Payne, who, uh, who, who was referred to uh, uh, by Senator Wong in her contribution. Can I just say in defence, as I leap to Senator Payne's defence, say I think she's done an absolutely outstanding job in terms of engaging with our Pacific family, an absolutely ex outstanding job. And I'll highlight two matters in particular, first in terms of their response to the COVID-19 pandemic and secondly uh, with respect to the status of women. Uh, in our Pacific Island family of nations. So I really do commend Senator Payne on her efforts in that regard. She's been a tireless foreign affairs minister and an outstanding one at that. In relation to the bill before the chamber, the Export Finance and Insurance Corporation Amendment Equity Investments and Other Measures Bill 2021, from my perspective, Madam Deputy President, this is about opportunities. It's about opportunities. It's about opportunities for Australian businesses and Australian workers. It's about opportunities for the communities which will be positively impacted by projects which are provided finance by Export Finance Australia. And some of those communities are poor communities, communities which up to today haven't had the opportunities that we've had in Australia. 
and the finance provided by Export Finance Australia will help them tap into those opportunities for their communities and for their people. And thirdly, it's about an op opportunity for Australia to promote its strategic interests in the Indo-Pacific region. So this bill is about opportunity. There are five key points I'd like to address in terms of my contribution on the bill. The first is, and I say this, I say this as someone who has a, a reasonably long background in the mining industry, so I have been involved in terms of arranging finance or finance negotiations for projects in many offshore jurisdictions, uh, including jurisdictions in Southeast Asia and our Pacific region. The impact of Export Finance Australia and of the Australian Infrastructure Financing Facility for the Pacific of being involved in a project is profound. The impact is profound because it sends a message, it sends its message to many different stakeholders. It sends a message to other potential financiers because of Australia's involvement through those agencies that this is an opportunity which they should look at in terms of contributing finance to. It sends a message to equity investors that these are perhaps projects that should be invested in. And it sends a message to all of our uh, geopolitical uh, stakeholders and those with which we engage that we're interested in this region this out, and we will assert our interests in the Pacific region, the Indo-Pacific region. So it sends an important message, and that message can actually, can actually translate into greater finance for a project, greater equity investment and, again, greater opportunity to actually make the project a reality. The second point is in relation to the type of finance. It is incredibly important that the Export Finance Australia has the ability has the ability to be flexible with respect to the sort of finance which is contributed. That might be through direct advances of loan funds, but it needs to also be potentially through the provision of guarantees. To address that point which Senator Wong referred to, that in some countries the best approach is for a guarantee to be provided by an agency such as Export Finance Australia so that the lending is done by local finance providers in local currency. And that's a real issue. That's a real issue in, term, in, in some of our Pacific neighbours in terms of currency. And so I think that's a great benefit in terms of this legislation. Third, this legislation does provide flexibility in terms of equity investment. And that, as well, is an important additional uh, bow to add um, quiver, arrow to add to the quiver. I eventually I only had three options. There's a bow, there's an arrow and a quiver. And eventually I got there. And it's, it, is important, it is important that that uh, flexibility is added. But can I just say it is important that that is rarely done. It is important that that, that is rarely done. I don't philosophically believe that the government should be a major investor in projects of this type. However, there will be a category of projects which are in the national interest. For example, in the critical mineral space, which do warrant, on a very uh, rare basis, on a very rare basis, an equity contribution from an agency such as the Equity Finance um, Export Finance Australia. Fourth point I want to raise is in relation to the Pacific Step Up, and I'm a passionate believer in the government's Pacific Step Up policy. As someone who lived and worked in Papua New Guinea uh, for about two and a half years. I know how important our Pacific family is, and I know, I know that the Export Finance Australia, given this additional flexibility, will be able to do more good. Will be able to do more good in our Pacific region and help bring projects to fruition. The fifth point, the last point I wanted to make uh, in relation to the legislation, is it's extraordinarily important that this legislation is passed in order to bring parity with between Australia and some of our major trading partners, the USA, the United Kingdom, South Korea and Japan, their export finance agencies have this flexibility. They have this flexibility. We need to also have this flexibility. We need parity in this respect. So that's an another important reason to support this legislation. So in conclusion, Madam Deputy President, this bill, from my perspective, is about opportunity. It is about opportunity. Opportunity for more jobs for Australians, greater opportunity for Australian businesses, and also allowing communities in our Indo-Pacific region 
have the ability to translate opportunities into reality and for projects to be built which provide them with the employment opportunities, the infrastructure they need to progress. Thank you, Senator Scar. Senator Steele John. Thank you, uh, Deputy President. I, uh, as, I, as I rise both uh, digitally and, and metaphorically to speak to the Insurance uh, Corporation Amendment uh, Equity Investment and Other Men Measures Bill 2021, um, I want to begin by uh, congratulating my uh, now uh, affirmed and sweared in uh, colleague, Senator Dorinda Cox, um, on her first uh, not first speech uh, in, the, in the chamber. Um, it's a great shame that I wasn't there to be uh, with you when you were sworn in earlier, matey, and I can't wait to uh, be working alongside you in this space for the truth, for justice, uh, for healing and for treaty, um, and not to be stuck on the other side of a computer in doing so. Um, the, the, uh, the coming of this bill at the beginning of this parliamentary sitting is, is in many ways uh, really, um, really prescient. Uh, it comes at a moment when the community is alive with a desire to see two primary outcomes um, from uh, their parliament this week. They want to see a strong uh, response, a strong plan, and an action, an urgent action plan in relation to climate change formulated uh, and taken uh, to Glasgow. They want to see a plan uh, which has a strong target in relation to 2030 and doesn't continue to uh, engage in the myth that if we leave the action to 2050, we can actually address it. Um, and they want to see the uh, drought of action now 1,000 days long. Uh, in relation to the implementation of a National uh, Integrity Commission. Uh, the Australian community are sick and tired of people that were elected uh, to do their work, uh, to do the work of the community in decision-making spaces, instead going into those spaces and doing the work of vested interests, often fossil fuel corporations, um, on that behalf. Uh, and yet the first piece of legislation we're dealing with today is arguably a bill designed uh, to facilitate the transfer of public wealth um, into private hands, um, or rather to use public finances to facilitate uh, the support um, of <laughs> private corporations, fossil fuel corporations, potentially, um, in building those projects, not only in Australia, uh, but also throughout the region. And, and it really does speak to that fundamental disconnect um, that at a time when the community wants to see this action on climate change, uh, they want to see politics cleaned up because they believe there is a, a too much closeness and a revolving door between the big end of town, the fossil fuel uh, powers in this country. But the first thing we are dealing with is a mechanism by which public money may be given uh, to private uh, entities to develop fossil fuel projects. Now, why do we have this concern in relation to these amendments? Um, we have these concerns as the Greens primarily because uh, if you look at what this agency does, um, and as, as Senator Cox pointed out, it provides finance support to Australian exporting businesses seeking to uh, uh, invest in, in overseas infrastructure projects. Um, it expands the range of transactions that the EFC can finance. Um, it allows the EFC to make equity investments and offer uh, standalone financial guarantees uh, for overseas infrastructure transactions. And under these changes, the EFC will be able to help exporting com companies uh, by providing a guarantee to private banks that if the company fails to meet borrowing obligations, then the EFC will take responsibility uh, for the repayment of the loan. Now, this comes in a context where it is very clear um, that global uh, finance institutions do not want to touch fossil fuels. They have seen the writing on the wall um, that there needs to be uh, urgent action and that investing in fossil fuels 
is a bad investment for them. And so in sales, these amend amendments to potentially uh, offer support to projects that would not be able to get support uh, through other mechanisms. As uh, Senator Cox uh, articulated, the Greens have significant concerns about the expansion of the, e the EFA's powers, um, given particularly that this is an agency with a track record of funneling billions of dollars into fossil fuel projects. Um, it, has invent it has invested, as Senator Cox so rightly pointed out, nearly $2 billion in fossil fuel projects. Um, and Senator Cox made reference to the uh, Wiggins Island uh, coal export terminal and the Glaston uh, LNG plant um, uh, adjoining the Great Barrier Reef. And this is in the context of a measly uh, $20 million uh, in financing for, renewal, for renewables uh, since 2009. So it is very clear where the priorities of the EFA uh, currently stand. We know that as the globe transitions to uh, net renewable emissions, uh, fossil fuel companies, banking and insurance uh, particularly, are finding it more difficult to get finance. This is a global financial reality. Um, it, is, uh, it is the market responding to the risk of, uh, of climate change. Now, as I say that, um, I want to be really clear here. Um, I am a, a member member of the Greens, uh, and as a, a member of the Greens for uh, for Western Australia, uh, you, I'm the last person you will find ever to advocate uh, the uh, free unleashing of the invisible hand of the market, or to particularly put uh, huge amounts of uh, credence uh, in the views, the global views of international finance organisations. Um, if the uh, renewable energy transition is saving the uh, climate, uh, if climate justice was left solely uh, to global corporations and the machinations of the international, uh, international global uh, finance markets, we would have a transition to renewable energy and to uh, net zero. We would have climate action uh, that would comprehensively come too late and leave out those most impacted. Uh, by the climate crisis. This is not an area that we can leave solely to the whims of the market or to read um, uh, their indications as law. In this case, we see, I would argue far too late uh, to the party, uh, that global financial uh, institutions have uh, done the bare minimum, which is wake up to the reality that a room filling with smoke will eventually suffocate them, right? That's what they've done. They had an opportunity in the 90s, uh, in fact, in the 80s, when they first found out that fossil fuels were causing climate change, um, to make a transition and to advocate for a transition back then. And they decided instead uh, to advocate for decades more of public subsidies uh, for their projects. So having said all that, though, it is important uh, that we factor uh, the international financial reality into policy making. That is most certainly not a sole gospel upon which to make decisions. Um, the other thing that's really important to take account of when we consider this legislation, because we are ultimately considering a bill that is about uh, the, the financing of, of uh, you know, projects beyond our shores as well, um, that Australia is a member of the uh, Asia-Pacific region um, as, a, as a key actor within the uh, immediate region in relation to uh, island nations specifically. Um, there is a great focus among our regional neighbours um, in the Asia-Pacific on the need for climate action. Um, and there is a cruel reality that Australia for the last 10 years or more, has played the role of wrecker in international forum after international forum, blocking climate change again and again and again and again, blocking climate action and are undermining our position within the Asia Pacific and our relationships with our island neighbours. Now, this has resulted in a historically uh, 
poor and broken relationship between Australia and these countries because our political articulations here within Australia has been diametrically at odds with the needs of Pacific Island nations. We have, uh, quite frankly, uh, looked nations such as Vanuatu and Tuvalu um, in the eye and said, well, you know, to be honest with you folks, the profits of BHP and Woodside and uh, Andrew Forrest and Gina Reinhardt and their willingness to continue to uh, donate to us as major political parties is more important uh, than whether you have a place to call home and whether your traditional island nations continue to exist. This has been the message that has been continually repeated to Pacific Island nations in international fora after international fora by virtue of not only our failure to act, but our opposition to action, our opposition to action. And this piece of uh, legislation before us today is yet another demonstration of a lost opportunity and also an active uh, failure to act. We could, and we will propose in these amendments, make it very clear that not a single additional cent spent by this agency uh, be spent on a fossil fuel project. We could do that. And yet the government is refusing to do so in the legislation before us today. That is an absolute shame. And quite frankly, uh, in the context of the upcoming international uh, meetings in Glasgow uh, reveals the coalition's uh, credibility in the climate space once again to be absolutely zero. Uh, the final thing I'll say here is the uh, absence of transparency uh, in relation to this uh, this kind of um, facility of government. As Senator Cox pointed out, the EFA is exempt from the uh, from the uh, FOI process acts, making it very difficult uh, for us to get a, a clear picture of what is actually going on, what is actually being done uh, in uh, using public funds by this vital agency and authority. That is not okay. That wouldn't be accepted in many other contexts. Again, we have an example of the material disconnect between uh, what major party MPs, particularly the coalition, believe is acceptable in relation to the crafting of legislation and what the community expects. The community expects that we uh, come to this decision-making space to which we have been elected and make decisions uh, that move forward the community's collective agenda. And it has been clear for more than a decade, in fact, for decades in some cases, that the Australian community want action on climate change. They do not want to see their money, public money, spent propping up uh, poisonous, polluting, stranded assets, wasted because uh, doing so ensures that the continual cycle uh, of corporate money coming in and out and in and out of the major parties uh, continues. They want to see action. This bill could have been, uh, this bill could have been an absolute opportunity uh, for the government to demonstrate its willingness uh, to listen to the calls um, of the student strikers that gathered together uh, in Western Australia uh, over the weekend to demand urgent action. It could have been the opportunity to uh, echo calls from every part of the nation, uh, whether it be uh, Mandurah in my uh, local state where uh, members of the community are fighting against the impacts of uh, dirty developers and their uh, connections with uh, government in relation to the Stirling First project uh, through to the desires of uh, people across the state to see that nexus between the gas industry uh, and the Labour government broken to take a step in the right direction and at least ensure that this agency uh, is subject uh, properly and fully uh, to freedom of information uh, requirements and that not a single cent of the money invested by this agency, public money uh, from the Australian public purse, is spent on any new coal, oil or gas 
facility, particularly in the context where some of the most unscrupulous organizations that have ever existed in the world, that being global international banking organizations, won't touch it with a 10-foot arch pole. I thank the Chamber for its time. Thank you, Senator Steelejohn. Senator Fiavanti Wells. Deputy President, the bill grants Export Finance Australia the power to make equity investments. The intention is to enhance EFA and the government's ability to support important overseas infrastructure investments and export-linked projects in Australia. The equity power will also be made available to the Australian Infrastructure Financing Facility for the Pacific, supposedly to further supporting Australia's Pacific step-up. The bill will also grant EFA the ability to provide standalone guarantees to oversee infrastructure transactions, improving EFA's and uh, the facility's overseas infrastructure financing capabilities. I think, though, it is important to put this bill into its proper historical context. It is important that there be investment in the Pacific countries to provide sustainable growth and to respond most importantly to the core priorities of Pacific Island peoples. But equally as important is that they not be saddled with heavy debt burdens. Development partners need to take into account the economic vulnerabilities of the region, as many countries have small formal economies. Countries like Australia and Japan are committed to high standards of transparency in our overseas development assistance, and we encourage the same of all donors, including China. Our primary concern is to encourage effective ODA delivery that supports sustainable growth but does not impose heavy debt burdens. And whilst debt sustainability has made it onto the regional agenda, regrettably the debt to GDP ratios of Pacific Island countries have deteriorated. When I became Minister for International Development and the Pacific in January 2016, it was very evident that Australia's soft power in the Pacific had steadily deteriorated. The Pacific should have been front and centre of our foreign policy. It is our neighbourhood, and our allies had expected us to focus uh, that our focus should have been firmly in the Pacific. Regrettably, we dropped the ball. For example, under the coalition, vital shortwave radio services were cut. While some islanders had access to internet and FM, electricity is the first thing to go down in a cyclone, a tsunami or an earthquake, resulting in communication gaps. Now, the stability, security and prosperity should remain uh, the primary objective uh, of Australia and the stability and security of our region second only to the defence of Australia. Now, I pushed very strongly for the Pacific to be one of the five priorities in the Foreign Policy White Paper. Having travelled extensively in the Pacific, I did about 35 trips. I came to understand firsthand the Talanoa and the importance of respecting the established regional framework of the Pacific Island Forum and other bodies in the Pacific. Most especially, it became important that any unilateral action not cut across regional initiatives and hence jeopardise support for what we may want to do. Above all, I was careful that Australia was not seen as patronising. I took my guide from the great work Australia had achieved through Ramsey. I also strongly advocated for Australia to shift its overseas development assistance footprint to the Pacific. Indeed, as Minister, we had a record spend of $1.3 billion of aid in the Pacific. I advocated for us to spend a higher portion of our ODA in the region, including extending our diplomatic posts in each Pacific Island country, given the vast distances and travel challenges that exist in the Pacific. My activities and observations on my many trips and during my many conversations were well documented, including the necessary debriefings upon my return. I saw firsthand what the communist regime was doing in the Pacific. 
my honest and forthright public comments in January 2018 about debt trap diplomacy and the CCP's activities not only started an international debate, but it highlighted that the Pacific is where the difficult and complex issues are and where the focus of our diplomacy should have been. Rather than heeding my prescient warnings, those driving our foreign, trade and defence policy chose to ignore Beijing's skullduggery in favour of a policy of appeasement of the communist regime. My comments about debt distress in the Pacific reflected concerns raised by IMF, academics and commentators. At all times, the external debt to GDP ratios of these vulnerable economies ranged from 25 to 90 per cent. At the time I was minister, the debt level in the Pacific was about $5.5 billion, of which about $2 billion was owed to international banks and about $1.5 billion to China and Chinese banks. Now, at the time, the Lowy Institute released its Pacific map, which showed that Australia remained the highest grants donor in the Pacific. About 70 per cent of China's aid was in the form of loans, and little was known about the arrangements of these opaque debts, including uh, how many, like the port of Hambatota in Sri Lanka, were debt for equity. And whilst every country has the sovereign right to borrow, invest and run their own economies, when debts become due, they need to be repaid. This means scarce government resources have to be deviated to debt repayment and away from critical spending such as health and education. Clearly, when a vulnerable country with limited resources owes such vast sums to one country, it places the country in a vulnerable position. And we have seen that Beijing has not been forthcoming in forgiving debts. We have seen countries in the Pacific with large debts due. Uh, some have had interest concessions from Beijing, but they have been forced to sign up to the Belt and Road Initiative. Now, after leaving the role in August 2018, we started to see the rollout of some of the extensive work that I had started as a minister. However, the downgrading of the role by Scott Morrison to an assistant minister and the subsequent revolving door of El Plater's since has seen us lose the momentum that I had generated over my constant engagement and interaction. Indeed, I was very surprised when the announcement was made of a $3 billion step-up, of which $2 billion was to be the Australian Infrastructure Financing Facility for the Pacific. Now, it had three components, this facility, the export financing component and grants. It was supposed to be for the Pacific. I note, however, that the goalposts have now shifted and the government is now focusing on the Indo-Pacific rather than just for the Pacific, which is what it was intended to be for. Now, in all the work I did as a minister, this facility was never raised with me. Now, given my public comments about debt levels in the Pacific, I certainly have grave concerns about increasing those debt levels through more lending. It seems that this was another thought bubble emanating from the Prime Marketing Office with little regard to its application and how such unilateral decision-making would be received by our Pacific neighbours. I labelled it the DFAT bank. One thing DFAT should never do is run a bank. Now, I said I would put this in a historical context. So I go back to the Pacific Island Forum in 2016 when we committed to a framework uh, for regional disaster preparedness and development and its key component, the Resilience Development Fund. I advocated that this would be an independent fund which Australia and other key development partners should contribute to capitalising. In short, a fund where Pacific Island countries can draw on without owing one country. The fund would enable Pacific Island countries to borrow small amounts at very concessional levels to do basic climate proofing of vital community infrastructure, such as schools, community halls and hospitals. 
This is the critical infrastructure, so vital to the life of small island communities. Hence, it makes much better sense to weatherproof them before they are damaged or destroyed. Now, the Pacific is one of the most disaster-prone areas in the world. Seven of the ten most disaster-prone countries are in our region. Adverse climatic events exacerbate existing development challenges. They constrain economic growth. They affect oceans, fisheries, marine and coastal ecosystems and have the potential to affect the stability and security of the region. There will always be another cyclone or tsunami. This is the reality of the Pacific and the climate cycle. Hence, surely we can assist our neighbours to weatherproof the region as best we can so that critical infrastructure can be preserved rather than having to expend funds post cyclone or tsunami to rebuild. Now, the Pacific Resilience Fund remains a key regional priority driven by the Pacific Island Forum. And it is clear from my many discussions with key Pacific stakeholders that this was what the Pacific needed and we should have been responding accordingly. Capitalisation of the fund would require about $1.5 billion. The fund would be independent, transparent and ensure that Pacific Island countries who borrow from the fund would not be, be beholden to one country. I think it is eminently more preferable for us to be contributing to this fund rather than international climate funds or Beijing's Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, to which we also contributed $1 billion, and its associated Belt and Road initiatives. Now, as a key partner, I have argued that Australia should lead the way not only to commit a substantial capitalisation, initial capitalisation of the fund, but lead the way and encourage other development partners in our region to do likewise. A better option would have been to use a sizeable portion of the $3 billion step-up to contribute towards capitalisation of the fund, rather than saddling the Pacific with more debt through the more dubious $2 billion um, so-called Australian infrastructure financing facility for the Pacific. It is all very well to support the development of large infrastructure, but before you do so, you need to secure basic infrastructure like schools, hospitals and community halls so that they remain intact during storms and cyclones. This critical infrastructure is vital to resilience building in villages on those small islands in those communities right across the Pacific. Neighbours need our help in practical and meaningful ways. The Pacific Resilience Fund is a far more sensible and practical way of helping the people of the Pacific as they face the day-to-day -day challenges of storms and cyclones. Now, the other key component of the $3 billion uh, uh, step-up was the allocation of $1 billion in callable capital to the Export Financing Agency. Now, one of the challenges in the Pacific is private sector investment. So opening up markets and greater business expansion is good for Australia and Pacific Island countries. And I supported this component of the step up because it will enable Australia to support investments effectively as a guarantor to private enterprise and afford more in innovative financing options rather than impose greater debt. The establishment of the trilateral partnership between the US, Japan and Australia for infrastructure investment with the objective of mobilising private capital has also been important, especially in the energy, natural resources and connectivity sectors where there is private sector interest. The partnership can assist Pacific Island countries with logistics of getting projects up, running, uh, including cost-benefit analysis and all those other things that are important to put deals together. But my concerns remain about this um, Australian infrastructure financing facility for the Pacific. Thus far, our ODA to the Pacific has been in the form of grants. It still remains unclear how much dialogue, if any, was undertaken with Pacific Island countries or the Pacific Island Forum before the announcement of this loan facility. 
And given my past comments, I am conscious that we do not increase debt levels in the Pacific. Loans need to be repaid with interest. Loans are made using Australian taxpayers' money. In view of these existing debt levels, I expect that very few countries can meet the requirements for repayment. So if you know the debt is not going to be repaid, why are you lending it in the first place? Is it not better uh, to give assistance to our neighbours in the form of ODA and focus on those things which is going to be on, on those things which are going to be of greater benefit to a greater number of people across the Pacific and therefore support this fund? We all know there will be more adverse weather conditions. And so let's help our neighbours in the spirit of Talanoa and prepare for those events and help communities. Let's help the Pacific to help itself. Thank you, Senator Fairvanti Well. Senator Patrick. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak uh, on the uh, Export Finance Insurance Corporation uh, Amendment uh, Bill 2021. And uh, look, I, um, <clears throat> you know, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a big fan of EFIC, but I <clears throat> sat here listening to Senator uh, Ferravanti Wells, and, and she makes some very, very good points uh, that uh, will, will play on my mind as I uh, enter the chamber when the bells ring. Um, the main, the main reason I came into the chamber actually was to, to talk uh, to the Greens Amendment, uh, which is uh, basically seeking to prevent investments in areas of coal, oil, uh, natural gas. I actually think it's a good amendment, and I'm going to spell out why that is the case. And I don't do it from, uh, in this instance, some uh, uh, far left green perspective, but simply from my knowledge uh, working in the commercial world. Um, right now, what we're seeing uh, in relation to oil products, uh, gas products, coal products is a collapse in the market. I, I think that's probably not true for coal, um, but certainly uh, for the other two. We're, we know that here in Australia, perhaps to the help of the gas cartel, uh, that we are, we are seeing less consumption in gas. Uh, as uh, as uh, the states switch across in their programs to renewable energies, uh, that we are now seeing uh, negative, gas, negative electricity prices appearing on the market in South Australia. If you go to AEMO's quarterly report for the first quarter of this year, you'll see that uh, the likelihood of the spot price for electricity in South Australia uh, during the hours of eight to um, uh, eight o'clock until 1700 or five o'clock in the afternoon, the manufacturing times, there's a good chance that the price, the spot price, will be negative. So, uh, whilst I accept that uh, electricity prices are in fact quite complex. Uh, with uh, AEMO intervening in the market uh, to get uh, inertia into the system, it is a telltale sign and one that interests me when I saw it. So I'm not trying to pretend it was something that it wasn't, but it is an indicator. We're seeing uh, the gas market dry up. W we will be forced over time to reduce our oil consumption simply by the arrival of electric vehicles, not necessarily helped by uh, this government in terms of its national strategy for electric vehicles, which has not emerged, but simply the reality is car manufacturers have announced they are moving away from internal combustion en engine cars. That's all going, uh, which means that eventually we will be dragged kicking and screaming into the electric vehicle market, which will reduce our dependency on oils. And that's happening overseas as well. That is happening overseas as well. So uh, the Greens Amendment makes sense in terms of the, um, in terms of, uh, the economics, the way in which markets work. And I note Senator Steelejohn stood up and talked about the banks no longer be w being willing to invest in these sorts of areas. And uh, uh, that ought to alarm people. If the banks aren't willing to invest in these areas, then we shouldn't be putting government money into these areas. Okay? We shouldn't have uh, underwriting of 
uh, oil and gas investments in circumstances where the, where the banks understand uh, exactly where this is all going, much, much better than anyone in this place. Uh, I did see a tweet this morning by, uh, by Senator Canavan where he said, my rule of thumb, this is in, in, in his counter to the banks, he says, my rule of thumb is that something that is good for the banks is probably bad for me. Now I was forced to uh, quote tweet back to say, my rule of thumb is that if something is good for the nationals, it's almost certainly bad for South Australia and indeed the Murray-Darling. Now, now um, well, I'm glad that, uh, I'm glad that uh, uh, Senator McKenzie is in here trying to interject because, uh, of, course, of course, she has, the, um, uh, has that national streak through her. I mean, did, did anyone see, did anyone not see the dumbest idea for 2021 coming from the nationals over the break where they suggest that we invest $250 billion of money, of taxpayers' money, into investments that the banks won't touch? That is the dumbest idea for 2021, coming straight from the National Party. I'm looking forward to all those, all those national ministers that have to resign when the Cabinet uh, uh, makes decisions on reducing emissions, because they have to, because they have to, because that's the will of the Australian people, and they know it. So I'll be, I'll be um, interested to see when Mr Pitt um, resigns or Senator McKenzie resigns or Senator Joyce resigns because their position uh, is somewhat different to that of the Cabinet. Although we do know that, of course, uh, Senator McKenzie had wandered in here uh, and voted uh, against the, uh, or tried to remove the 450 from the Murray-Darling Basin Plan, big and bold when she did that, when she became a Cabinet Minister, she's, she sat quietly because she knows the Cabinet's position is that the plan will be delivered in full. So, uh, whilst the Nationals. Order, Senator Patrick. Yes, Senator McKenzie. Uh, Senator Patrick knows there was no opportunity to discuss the 450. Um, that can only be delivered if it, there is no socio economic detriment to the people that live in uh, the Murray Darling Basin. Um, that is actually the test of whether that that 450 will be Senator delivered. McKenzie. And he knows that there was no opportunity, order. no opportunity Senator to McKenzie, have that conversation in this chamber. Order. Senator Patrick, I don't think Senator McKenzie was. Just, I'll just make the point, Chair, that if you let people interject and run a five-minute speech without a point of order, this place will become rather disorderly. So I just ask Senator, that, Senator Patrick, that you might Senator close McKenzie, in on this uh, Patrick, uh, a lot more quickly. Senator Patrick, Senator McKenzie wasn't speaking for five minutes, but I will take your point and allow you to continue with your contribution. Thank you very thank much. You. Um, I just, just, just a tightening there would be good. Thank you, uh, um, um, Acting Deputy President. So. So uh, yes, yeah, Senator McKenzie, I know she's a bit touchy about this because um, she um, uh, she order Senator Patrick, Senator McKenzie. Point of order. My name does not appear in the uh, bill before the Senate at all, and so I am struggling to understand why the senator feels the need to continually insert my name into a bill before the Senate that he should actually be talking about the Export Finance and Insurance Corporation Amendment. Please stick to the bill before the Senate. Thank you, Senator McKenzie. You've reminded Senator Patrick of the bill that we are discussing here today. Senator Patrick, please continue your very contribution clear. and be relevant to the bill. Thank, Thank you. you. And I make it very clear I am being relevant to the bill. I'm talking about investment in fossil, fuel, uh, in fossil fuels, in, in oils, in gas, uh, and I'm talking about investments in coal. And I, the link between the, the amendment, of course, is that the nationals over the break, suggested dumbest idea of 2021 that the taxpayer set aside $250 billion uh, to contribute to these investments. It's actually entirely relevant to the bill. And then I was just making the point that uh, uh, that uh, I'll be interested uh, again in relation to these investments when decisions are made by the Liberal side of your coalition, because they have to be made to go uh, down an emissions responsible path. How we, you know, I'm going to be interested to see how these nationals uh, uh, you know, stand, whether, whether or not they'll put their ministry ahead of their, their big coal and oil and gas and in, investor donators. But um, anyway, I'll come back uh, to where I, was, uh, where I was going, and that is that um, uh, we need to understand that as the market dries up for these, uh, for these commodities, 
the investments will go bad. The investments that are being proposed under this bill will go bad. And I'll put it to you that they'll go bad more quickly than anyone imagines. They'll go bad more quickly than the analysts think, because that's what happens. You end up seeing a collapse. And that is the danger of the sorts of investments that could come into play under this bill. And that's why the, the, the Greens amendment is important. I say that looking at, looking at it from a, an economic perspective. And I, uh, and I know that Senator Steelejohn approached it in that manner as well. I uh, found it very difficult to disagree with um, what he said, even though you know, from time to time I do disagree uh, with what he says. So we need to rethink what we do. Investing in, in these sort of exports of uh, these, these sorts of commodities or even assisting our uh, Pacific friends do, do such things is a bad idea. Rather than exporting uh, these, these, these products, look, the writing's on the wall. The writing is on the wall. And unfortunately, the Liberal Coalition is not reading the writing. If I, if I look at UAE, the history of UAE is really, really interesting in that, um, uh, unlike other Middle East countries that have squandered and, uh, you know, through corrupt processes, distributed the wealth associated with the oil that had flowed from the Middle East, what we find uh, in, the, in the UAE was, is they, they took a very um, uh, um, country-interested approach and invested in things uh, that were going to be around when the oil dried up, okay? Th where they invested in tourism, where, where they invested in an international airline, where they invested, invested in, a, in a, uh, an international transport hub and in manufacturing and other sorts of uh, capabilities that they know won't be there forever. And we need to be thinking about the same thing. These commodities that we are exporting uh, we need to understand that that is going to turn off at some stage, not, not because um, the nationals are standing behind trying to pump the, uh, you know, pump the gas as it leaves the country, but because there won't be a market for it. And this goes back to the sort of thing that I've been uh, pushing for some time. We've got to start thinking in our um, consideration of where this country is going. We've got to stop thinking uh, in terms of exporting rocks. We've got to stop just exporting rocks. You know, in Wyala, we're struggling with, uh, with the, the steelworks there, and there is an intention to, 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 to turn that, that to sort of green steel, and there's some good hydrogen projects that are, that are spinning up there. But we've got, to, uh, we've got to make sure that instead of just exporting iron ore, we invest in exporting steel. Instead of just exporting lithium, we export batteries, where we develop capabilities. We develop IP. We develop products that are exportable. We, we create jobs. That's the future. And I just, uh, in, in looking at this bill and looking at what it may uh, uh, allow or permit to have happen, the reason we need to clamp down on the very thing that the, the Greens are putting up today, which is investment in, uh, in these false future markets, is because that will end in tears. We have to start rethinking the way we do business. The change is coming. Uh, unfortunately, we've lagged for too long. We've lagged for too long uh, in our thinking, uh, and we've got to move forward. And I think their amendment does a little bit to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Patrick. From the minister. Senator McKenzie. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. I thank the honourable senators for their contribution to this debate on the Export Finance and Insurance Corporation Amendment, Equity Investments and Other Measures Bill. These amendments will support infrastructure develop in the in development in the Indo-Pacific and export-linked projects in Australia, as well as provide enhanced financing capabilities to the Australian Infrastructure Financing Facility for the Pacific, further supporting the, uh, Australia's Pacific step up. I welcome the Senate Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade Legislation Committee's endorsement of the bill and its purpose and its recommendation that the bill be passed. 
The government notes that the Australian Greens' dissenting recommendations in the committee report, but respectfully disagrees. The government sees no need to delay the bill or to remove Export Finance Australia's existing exemptions under the Freedom of Information Act. As noted by the committee, the bill maintains uh, Export Finance Australia's robust processes for assessing commerciality, risk and environmental and social impacts. Furthermore, Export Finance Australia's partial exemptions under the Freedom of Information Act provide certainty to its customers and other financial institutions that their sensitive commercial financial and other information will remain confidential. The government wants to ensure Export Finance Australia has the tools it needs to continue supporting Australian export trade and overseas infrastructure development. The amendments will bolster Export Finance Australia's ability to support Australia's national interests and priorities. They will enhance Export Finance Australia's capabilities and will complement its existing suite of financing powers comprised of loans, guarantees, bonds and insurance. However, the equity investment power will be used sparingly where there is a national interest case. Debt solutions like loans, guarantees and bonds will continue to be the mainstay of Export Finance Australia's support to Australian exporters and for infrastructure development in the Indo-Pacific region. In conclusion, Order, the bill Senator Mackenzie, you'll be in continuation. I move to two-minute statements. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Madam uh, Acting Deputy Chair or President. Uh, on Friday, 15 October, Australia observed International Pregnancy and Infant Loss Remembrance Day, a day to honour and remember all babies lost to miscarriage, stillbirth and perinatal death. In February, this parliament passed a motion I move to eternally recognise this day. I thank Senators McCarthy, Polly, Rice, Molan, Billick, Waters and Hughes for their support for the motion. In Australia, hundreds of thousands of parents marked this day. In Australia, one in four pregnancies ends in miscarriage. Six babies are stillborn every day. Perinatal death, that is the death of a baby in the weeks just before, during or after birth, numbers around 3,000 a year in Australia, and of those deaths, 2,200 are stillborn. Today, I also want to honour John and Kate Delaney. Kate and John have been instrumental in ensuring that the 15th of October is recognised in Australia, including a campaign to light up public buildings from coast to coast, pink and blue. John and Kate have been incredibly generous in sharing their story of loss, and in doing so, they have given so many parents the opportunity, the courage and the support to share theirs. My husband Ben and I also marked the 15th of October as our daughter Caroline was stillborn in 1999. I acknowledge that many other senators and MPs also know the loss of their babies. Ben and I join all parents in Australia who know the loss of a loved and cherished baby, either through miscarriage, stillbirth or perinatal death. We remember you tinged with sadness, but in recognition for the love that you have for your children. Thank you, Senator Keneally. Senator Molan. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. Uh, on Wednesday last week, my stillborn gr uh, granddaughter, Emily Charlotte Sutton, would have turned 14, but instead we commemorated the 14th anniversary of her shattering death. On Friday last week, uh, her mother, my daughter Sarah, turned 40. Uh, a milestone birth birthday not celebrated with family and friends, but only because of COVID health orders in all states. Today I stand in this place as a former soldier not unfamiliar with death and violence, as a senator for New South Wales who has devoted much of my time to national security, and as an ordinary Australian returning to his workplace after a period of five months medical treatment in which the magnificent health care professionals and health services of this nation essentially saved my life. For the good wishes I received from you, my colleagues, I thank you most sincerely. However, I am absolutely incapable of thinking of any other sentiment more important to me today or any commemoration more significant than to mourn the loss of the cherished children suffered each year, each year by thousands of Australian families through miscarriage, stillbirth and infant death. I was honoured to be a member of the Senate Select Committee on Stillbirth Research and Education, 
which examined in great detail in 2018 the significant and far-reaching impacts of stillbirth in Australia. I welcome the National Stillbirth Action and Implementation Plan published in December last year and developed under the oversight of the National Stillbirth Project Reference Group, established again by the Australian Health Minister's Advisory Council. This plan has ambitious goals, but with commitment and support of the many Australians invested in the recognition of stillbirth and pregnancy loss as a public health issue in need of a strategic approach, I'm hopeful that these goals will be met and that when we meet again, we will see rates reduced, Order. equity Senator gaps Mullen. abolished and respectful Senator support Hansen extended Young. to uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise today to give voice to young Australians. As part of the, voice, the Youth Voice to Parliament Week run by Raise Our Voice Australia, I'm going to read a speech by Chloe Ames, a 14-year-old constituent from South Australia. Chloe wrote this speech to tell policymakers here in Canberra what her vision for Australia is in 20 years' time. She writes, In 20 years' time, I would like to see a clean environment around me. When I walk on the street, I want it to be clean of rubbish, no gum, nothing. When I order takeaway, I don't want to be eating out of plastic. I want to be able to travel around and see many different animals. I want to see the oceans clean and all the coral come back in colours. I want to see the colourful wildlife. Climate change is a massive problem right now, and our world is slowly dying because of it. Humans are the only reason this is all happening. We are burning fossil fuels. Deforestation is taking away the wildlife's habitat. We are farming livestock. We use single-use plastic for pretty much everything. The world has lo lost half its wildlife in the past 40 years. We are the problem, and we need to fix our mistakes before it's too late. Climate change can be stopped if everyone spoke up about what is happening to the world by powering our homes with renewable energy, by reducing water, by reducing water waste, stopping food waste and donating cans you are going to consume uh, to people in need. Getting rid of plastic straws is not enough. We need to eliminate plastic cups, plastic bags and all single-use plastics. We need to consider going vegetarian or even vegan, living sustainably and grow our own food in our own backyards. Thank you, Chloe, for sharing your vision for a safer, cleaner and kinder world. Thank you, Senator Hanson Young. Senator McCarthy, remotely. Friday, the 15th of October, was International Pregnancy and Infant Loss Remembrance Day, when we remember the babies lost from miscarriage, stillbirth and infant death and acknowledge the ongoing loss experienced by their families. It was back in February that the Australian Parliament officially recognised the day and determined it would be observed on October 15th alongside the international community. The work of the Senate Select Committee into Stillbirth Research and Education has helped shine a light on what can still tend to be a hidden tragedy. And I am certainly proud still of having been a chair of that committee and worked with my Senate colleagues on it. We've seen so many things done on many fronts in terms of stillbirth prevention as a result of the solid efforts of senators and those individuals and organisations that gave evidence and made submissions. But we must continue to drive this change. There is still an enormous amount of work to do to tackle the fiscal, social and emotional toll of stillbirth in this country. In Australia, six babies are lost to stillbirth every day, or approximately 2,200 babies every year. And the rate of stillbirth, or the rate of death from stillbirth, is higher than the national road toll, and stillbirth is the number one cause of death for infants. There are still too many babies lying unclaimed in hospital wards in Australia. I am proud of the work of the Senate Select Committee and that it's gone some way to breaking the culture of silence around stillbirth. Pregnancy and Infant Loss Awareness Month is all about providing a space for those hundreds of thousands of Australians who suffer in silence every year when they are experiencing often what is the worst moment of their life. I acknowledge Order, those Senator lost McCarthy, babies. Senator McCarthy, Senator Hanson remotely. Thank you very much. I rise to speak on the National Disability Insurance Scheme and the increasing risk to its sustainability. One Nation strongly supports the principle of the NDIS and ensuring Australians with a disability have the support they need that is reasonable. 
The NDIS was a necessary response to a situation in which many disabled Australians, mostly young people, were falling through the cracks. It was intended to help people who could not otherwise get the help they needed. But as it is often said, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. The hell facing the NDIS is one of sustainability. It was reported in August, the average payment per NDIS participant had increased by 11.8% per annum over the past three years. Total participation um, costs were $6.6 billion in the quarter to 30th of June this year, a 33% increase over the same period last year. The total cost of the scheme is $25 billion per year, and it's expected this figure will rise to $40 billion over by 2025, only four years away. In fact, the NDIS supports approximately 460,000 people and growing and will cost more in 18 months than the cost of Medicare for all Australians. This is unsustainable and needs to be brought under control or the people who really need NDIS support will be the losers. <clears throat> Unlike every other taxpayer funded scheme, the NDIS is not means tested, meaning very wealthy people can access it. One Nation supports a review of the NDIS with a focus on ensuring the scheme is meeting its original intention of helping people with a disability which requires assistance and helping only those who need it, and ensuring NDIS funding is not supporting those for whom sufficient support is already available through mainstream health education. Order, and Senator Hanson. Senator Davey. Thank you very much. I join Senator Keneally and others today in recognising last Friday's Infant Loss Awareness Day. As we've heard today, the numbers in Australia of families who suffer stillbirth, miscarriage or loss of an infant's life within the first month is significant. I'm very proud that our government, on the back of the Select Committee's work earlier, has extended the Red Nose Hospital to Home program to provide intensive support to these grieving families, because the grief is unique. I know these experiences are very hard to talk about. I know the awkward silence from people who don't know how to respond. I know the feelings of awkwardness that extend into the family with members, mothers, fathers and siblings who also don't know how to respond. To those who have been through it, we all have unique experiences. We all grieve differently, and that's okay. We all have different reactions and different ways of dealing with it. I want you to know it's okay if you want to grieve in silence. It's okay if you want to keep this experience personal. I also want you to know that it's okay to grieve publicly if you want to talk about it, if you want to share your pain, if you want acknowledgement of the life just lost. That's okay too and should be welcome. We must all as a society recognise that grief is a personal experience, particularly with such uh, an early loss in your lives. So please know to those families who've been through this that how you deal with your loss is up to you and it's okay, but you are not alone. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Davey. Senator Griff remotely. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I would like to speak briefly about our outgoing president, Senator Ryan. Senator Ryan is well known for his deep political convictions. And initially there was a question of how these might affect his conduct as president. Any misgivings proved to be totally unfounded. As president, he has been fair. He has been reasonable, sensible and impartial. In doing so, he set the standard for us all. He rose to the stature of his new office and put the dignity and responsibility of the office ahead of himself. We all know how easy it is to play the maverick, to grandstand, to win the attention and praise from social media. But we also know how empty and meaningless that is. How it strokes the ego without doing anything to help the Australians we are here to serve. It is much harder to put that aside and do the work of Parliament. But Senator Ryan did just that. In doing so, he set a standard to which we all should aspire. I thank him for his service 
and wish him very well in his future endeavours. Before concluding, I would like to congratulate Senator Brockman. I don't know our new president particularly well, but know he is well regarded by his colleagues and has been a presence in this place for longer than most. I'm sure that experience will serve him well and that we will all come to share his colleagues' regard for him. I wish him well and very much look forward to working together with him. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Griff. Senator Billick remotely. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I too wish to recognise International Pregnancy and Infant Loss Remembrance Day, commemorated on Friday, the 15th of October. And I thank all the other senators for their contributions on this issue. Today is a bittersweet day. It is the time we have commemorated. It is the first time we have commemorated Pregnancy and Infant Loss Remembrance Day since both houses of parliament resolved to recognise it. And I welcome the efforts we are making to commemorate this day, including by our national parliament. But at the same time, I deeply regret that a campaign like this still needs to exist. On this day, we pay respects to the more than 100,000 babies lost to miscarriage, over 2,000 lost to stillbirth and over 600 lost to neonatal death each year and to their families. The report of the Senate Select Committee on Stillbirth pressed the need to break through what it called the culture of silence around stillbirth. It's this culture of silence, this taboo, that has led to policy inertia in addressing Australia's unacceptably high rate of stillbirth and which has compounded the grief of families suffering, suffering pregnancy and infant loss by silencing and isolating them. And I say to anyone who has suffered loss from miscarriage, stillbirth or neonatal death, you are not alone. The culture around discussing pregnancy and infant loss has to change, and it will. I'm confident of that, because those of us who have experienced this loss will not be silent. I've always talked to Timothy since 1983 when he was born, even if it made others feel uncomfortable. We need to be able to share our stories and our grief if we choose to do so. We need to acknowledge our babies and how they died. We need to talk about our love for them. We Order, will say that. Senator Billick. Senator Lambie remotely. Name, and his name is Timothy Robert Billick. Or, Senator Lambie remotely. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. The federal government's promise to all Australians is that we'll get free, high quality health care whenever we need it. By God, we pay enough taxes. But that's not how things work in Tasmania. Here, elderly people die before they can see a doctor in an emergency ward. Here, we travel for hours, pay through the nose, and wait for weeks before we can see our closest GP. Here, thousands of Tasmanians who show up at Launceston General Hospital needing urgent medical care don't get seen on time. That's why Tasmanians rate our health system lower than Australians in any other state or territory on the mainland. We have massive problems down here and it can no longer be swept under the rug any longer. No more. But I'll tell you what, what won't help. The Tassie Liberals plan to give GPs extra money to charge more patients out-of-pocket costs. That's not going to get us anywhere. Haven't we been trying this for years anyway? It is not fair to our local GPs and our local specialists that stay here with their children. You're ripping them off. What we should be doing is helping the nurses and doctors who work in our emergency departments. We've got to lower the pressure they're under. We have to give people somewhere else to get medical help, somewhere that isn't in their accident and emergency. This is what I'm proposing, that Launceston, the northwest coast and Hobart should have urgent care centres that provide free medical care and fast. You'd visit the centres for everything from cuts to burns to broken bones to wound dressings and a fever. They'd be run by professional registered nurses and will provide immediate high quality care seven days a week, including after hours. You wouldn't pay a cent for it either. And while you get looked after, people who need, need emergency help will get it. Instead of waiting hours in an ambulance on the hospital driveway, they can see the hospital staff who might otherwise have been treating you. Tasmanians should get the quality health care that's promised to every Australian. Urgent care centres are the answers. For those Tasmanian politicians Order, that haven't seen Senator it, Lambie, your time has expired. Well. Senator Abetz. Drug addiction is a scourge, as is homelessness. 
The plight of homeless drug-addicted young men is stark, it's ugly and demands empathy and willing hands to assist them to find a pathway out of their tragedy. This is where Pathways enters the morass of human wreckage in my home state of Tasmania. Pathways is a charity which delivers, as its name suggests, a pathway out for drug-addicted men. Pathways relies heavily on the generosity of Tasmanians. Part of Pathways fundraising is an annual charity dinner. This year's dinner, put together by the Dynamic Pathways CEO Aldo Antolli, was another sellout, showcasing the changes made to individual lives. The Tasmanian community came together to raise much-needed funds to support the Pathways team. For myself, the work of Pathways is particularly heartwarming as it is the successor organisation to YazTAS, Youth Accommodation Services Tasmania. I had the privilege of serving on its inaugural committee and as its honorary legal adviser. Indeed, I made reference to YazTAS in my first speech. The work of Pathways, and thus the number of rehabilitated young men, has grown ever since Aldo Antolli took over as Pathways CEO. Every young man assisted is a life turned around, from drugs and despair onto a pathway of hope, self-esteem and self-reliance, a profound good for each individual, a wonderful restart to their lives. As each life is put on the right pathway again, so our society benefits with lower incidence of antisocial behaviour, criminality and welfare dependency. Pathways, so ably led by Aldo Antolli, deserves the Tasmanian community's full support. Thank you, Senator Abet. Senator Patrick. Uh, thank you. As has been mentioned, this week is Youth uh, Voice in Parliament Week, and so with the indulgence of um, you, Madam Acting Deputy President, I'll be reading a short statement prepared by one of my constituents. My name is Hugo Tahini. I'm 20 years old, and I live on Nang Nang Nangara, uh, country in the electorate of Grey in rural South Australia. I live with a, an intellectual disability. My vision for Australia in 20 years would be for a more inclusive life for everyone. I hope that people of all abilities, cultures, communities and backgrounds would be working together in a more friendly way to enjoy the beautiful land that we live on. I would like to be treated like a person, not a person with disabilities. I would like people to include me, to talk to me and to help me and my friends contribute positively to make our society a better place. It is so important to be inclusive in every way so that all people feel welcomed and equal. Everyone should be given the same opportunities for school, health care and jobs. When my friends and I are included, we feel proud. When we're not included or treated differently, we feel sad and lonely and, we, and like we don't matter as much as others do. It is really important that everyone embraces diversity and opens up to being inclusive in every way to help make the world a better place. Thank you. So good on you, Hugo, for preparing such a well-considered and articulate speech, and I'm honoured to have been allowed to read it in the Senate today. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Senator Watt. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Eight long years. That's how long this government has been in power. Eight long years of opposing action on climate change. Eight long years of running around regional Australia lying through their teeth about what action on climate change means for our regions. Eight long years of 21 energy policies, constantly changing, constantly unable to make up their minds, constantly stopping investment in renewables and the jobs that come with them. Eight long years of this government that says it's about the regions, sending regional jobs offshore and stopping our regions from getting those jobs that other countries are grabbing with open arms. Eight long years of holding our regions back 
and stopping them from gaining the opportunities, the jobs and the prosperity that other countries are grabbing with open arms. So it's eight long years of regional Australians paying the price for this government refusing to take action on climate change and literally handing jobs to other countries that should be going to places like Rockhampton, like Gladstone, like Mackay and like Townsville. And still, after eight long years, still they are squabbling. Eight long years isn't enough for this incompetent mob of people who want to chase jobs offshore rather than put them into regional Queensland. We've had enough of the fake farmers and the fake miners in the National Party. We need to listen to real farmers and real miners who know that net zero emissions is how they will create jobs in the future and support their communities. Thank you, Senator Watt. Senator Cox. Last week I had the privilege of attending the Yamaji on Country Forum in Carnarvon. Over the two days, people gathered from the Midwest, Murchison and Gascoigne to talk about their important issues and solutions. There was a strong focus on the WA government's draft Aboriginal Cultural Heritage Bill. This bill will enable the destruction and harm of First Nations cultural heritage. It undermines our right to self-determination and dismisses our cultural heritage. Traditional owners are asking the WA government to stop all proceedings on this bill. It cannot go ahead in its current form. The government needs to go back to the drawing board and engage in public consultations with traditional owners. This would allow traditional owners to co-design more culturally inclusive conditions of the bill. Any changes to cultural heritage legislation must put First Nations people at the centre of decision making about our land, culture, language and heritage. This bill provides us with a once-in-a-generation opportunity to implement best practice cultural heritage protections in WA, standards that ensure that the destruction that occurred at Jukun Gorge can never happen again. I'm urging the WA government to listen to the traditional owners and to act to protect and preserve First Nations culture, heritage and our climate. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Cox. Senator Henderson remotely. Oh, thank you so much. As part of Raise Our Voices campaign, I have uh, the great honour of reading two speeches prepared by two outstanding young Victorians. Hello, my name is Anna O'Brien and I am 10 years of age and I live in Northern Victoria. I believe that social media has a major impact on primary school students as much as high school students. The bullying via social media can attack children's mental health as much as it does face to face. That's why I believe schools should have more education about these sorts of topics. There should also be more consequences for those who have a part in these bullying situations. For instance, if a child's bullying behaviour is detected, teachers and parents should take action. These situations should be openly talked about in the classroom. Overall, I believe the government should make legislation for all schools across Australia to add awareness about social media bullying and the impact on mental health uh, to their weekly curriculum. Well done to Annabelle. And from Kate McNeil. I'm 13 years old. I live in the Corio electorate. I have been interested in politics from a young age. I'm passionate about trying to make the lives of people better. Here is my proposal for a better Australia in 20 years. We need to educate Australian youth about how to be financially literate for when they grow up and leave home. Right now, kids my age and older still don't, don't know that much about finance. There is so much to learn with superannuation, compounding interest, good debt, bad debt and more. This can be daunting and therefore they just don't learn it. This is a big problem because it means that youth grow up not knowing about banking and how to make educated uh, money decisions, and this can result in poverty. I want to commend both Annabelle and Kate for their inspiring words, and perhaps one day we will see them advocating in what they believe in uh, in the national parliament. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Henderson. I will remind senators that are participating remotely to put their microphones on mute. We had a little bit of feedback in that last contribution, unfortunately. Senator Lyons. Thank you, Acting Deputy Chair, uh, President. Well, eight days before Glasgow 26, and what have we got from the Morrison government? Complete disarray on climate policy. Complete disarray. After eight years and 21 policies, we still have nothing. Goodness knows what will be taken to Glasgow right now. We have a handful of National Party uh, members who are holding the government to ransom. What an absolute disgrace. A handful 
of National Party people who are now trying to distance themselves, who are now trying to pretend somehow they're not part of the government and are holding the government to ransom. We heard Mr Barnaby Joyce today, the Deputy Prime Minister of this country, saying on radio, well, we mightn't have a view before Glasgow 26. Well, Australians are very clear on this issue. They want climate change policy and they want action now. Not eight years of nothing from those opposite, from the government of this country. And what cowardice we've seen from our Prime Minister in not staring down his party and not creating a vision for Australia, a vision for private sector health, who are clearly calling out for vision, a vision for farmers who want action on climate change, a vision for workers who also want action on climate change. And what have we got? A handful of the government backbenchers and some of their ministers and indeed the Deputy Prime Minister of this country holding everyone to ransom. Well, Australians are watching. I can let you know that in the electorate of Pierce, the number one issue is climate change. They're pretty disgusted with their local member as well. They think a million dollars hidden away in a trust fund is not OK. But their number one issue is climate change. And Australians are watching, and it is time the, the Prime Minister stood up and let us all know exactly what is being taken to Glasgow and not allowing himself to be held to ransom. It being very close to 2 p.m., we will proceed to questions without notice. Senator McAllister. Thanks very much, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister, Senator Mackenzie. Indeed, Senator Mackenzie is not here. Senator Wong. I'm not sure where any of the. Oh, Senator Birmingham and Senator McKenzie are here. We will ask that question time proceed for a few minutes further to reflect the delay. Senator McAllister, I will ask you to please repeat the question. Just hold for a moment while Senator McKenzie. Order. Senator McAllister, please start your question again. Uh, my question is to the minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister, Senator McKenzie. Liberal Senator Alex Antic has said that net zero by 2050 was an absolute folly and that, and I quote, there is no way to achieve net zero without costing us jobs, without winding back our economy. Does the Deputy Prime Minister agree with Senator Antic? Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and thank the Chamber for um, a few minutes to catch my breath. Uh, but thank you also, Senator McAllister, for your question. I think the National Party has been very, very clear on the only thing that is exercising our mind uh, this week, and in fact the only thing that's exercised our party room for the last 14 years this place has had this debate, and that is actually the impact of our country's climate policy decisions on rural and regional Australians, the people that live there, the poorest people in our nation live out in rural and regional Australia. They Order. live out in rural and regional Order. Australia. And when the Senator electricity Ayers. prices go through the roof, they are the ones that feel the impact. The people that the transport workers who drive our food and fibre up and down the highways and byways of this nation, they will Senator be the ones Ayers. that were slugged by former Labor government's uh, follies in this area. And it was only Senator one McAllister. political party that stood in the way. Minister, please resume your seat. Senator McAllister. President, uh, my point of order is direct relevance. The question went to a quote that was provided by Senator Antic and whether or not uh, the Deputy Prime Minister agreed with that. Senator McKenzie has not really touched that question and I'd like her to answer it. As Sen Sen Senator McKenzie, please resume your seat. As Senator McAllister, you know well, I cannot direct the minister how to answer the question. The question had a long preamble, including a quote. It, Senator Wong. Well, thank you, Mr. President. I recognise this is your first question time, and there will, it will take. 
Senator Wong, what is your point of order? Senator Wong, what is your point of order? Uh, we disagree with your ruling, Mr. President, and we would ask you, we would ask you, to reconsider a suggestion that there was a very long preamble as the basis of, of your ruling. There so was... I'd ask you to read the Hansard. I take would... account. I haven't finished, if I may, Mr. President. I haven't finished my submission. Senator Wong, please thank you, continue. Mr. President. I appreciate it. Senator Wong, please continue. Thank you. I was just waiting to see if there was something more you wish me to address. I would ask you to reconsider so your ruling so early to rule out an issue of direct relevance on the basis of a very long preamble. It was not a very long preamble, and I reiterate the opposition's point of order as to direct relevance. The minister has not even got close to Senator Antic's quote. Senator Wong, you did not actually wait, me to com wait for me to complete my ruling. Uh, I said there was a long preamble in the form of a quote, if you had allowed me to finish, that contained a, uh, a particular assertion. I believe the minister was being directly relevant to matters contained in the question. Senator Mackenzie, you have the call. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Uh, as for Liberal Party senators and MPs, their contributions to this public debate, Senator Antic being one of them, I have no comment to make. I am absolutely prepared to stand by the Deputy Prime Minister's uh, public commentary and, in fact, the National Party's public commentary around the debate before the public at this time. And it is our whole sole focus as the representatives of the 30 per cent of Australians who don't live in capital cities, our miners, our manufacturers, our farmers, our regional capitals, to make sure their interests are served in this place and this debate. That is all we're interested in. That is the only question before us as a party, and that is the thing we are taking very, very seriously. Senator McAllister, you have a supplementary question? Yes, thanks, Mr President. Uh, Mr Antic has declared, and I quote, from a personal point of view, I certainly don't have any appetite for net zero. Does the Deputy Prime Minister think it is reasonable for Mr Morrison to ask the Nationals to sign up to net zero by 2050 when, after eight long years in government, members of his own party room aren't signed up? Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. Again, I'm not going to reflect on Senator Antic's uh, commentary. Someone else in this place can. What we are actually focused on as the National Party is absolutely ensuring that every single policy that our government prosecutes and puts before the people has rural and regional Australia's best interest at its very, very centre. And that is absolutely the thing. We are not ashamed to be standing up and saying, hold the horses, let's not gallop off to Glasgow, let's make sure that what we are considering as a government has actually come, gone through the prism of how it will affect the poorest in this country, the most high energy intensive industries in this country. And you know what? If it wasn't for us, no one else would be raising this. You all would have signed up in a heartbeat, and the only one standing up Minister, for the regions Minister, is the National please Party. Please resume your seat, Senator McAllister. Thanks, Mr. President. With two weeks to go until the COP26 conference in Glasgow, this morning Mr. Joyce refused to rule out sending Mr. Morrison to Glasgow empty-handed and without a climate deal. After eight years. Three Prime Ministers and 21 energy policies. Will the Deputy Prime Minister agree to the Liberal plan on net zero emissions by 2050 before Mr Morrison steps on the plane? Minister Mackenzie. Well, one, one thing that all Order, National Party Senator MPs, uh, senators, ministers and, and the leadership group more broadly have made very, very clear it is that our party room will be the determinant of what our party room does, 
Uh, I won't actually be answering a question from the Labor Party in this place and surpassing the supremacy of the party room in determining my actions and the actions of our ministers and our party room more broadly. I think, though, what the rural and regional Australians actually need to understand is the biggest risk to their in industries, to their jobs, to their Order, children's Senator future is an Albanese Bant government that has no plan, never has, and it's why on this question they do not trust you, they do not trust them. And so for as long as you two are in partnership, you can forget Order. the working class of this country Order. backing you at any election. Senator Molan, you have the call, and may I say it is great to see you back, Senator Molan. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank, you. Order. Th Thank you, Mr. President. It, it, and it's just great to be back, I've got to say. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. With Australians responding magnificently to the call to get vaccinated against COVID-19 so we can safely return to normal life, can the minister advise the Senate how the Liberal and National Government is supporting our safe reopening and economic recovery from the pandemic? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Minister Birmingham. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President. Mr. President, I too would like to warmly welcome back Senator Molan. It is wonderful to see him back in this chamber and indeed to see him looking so well. And congratulations on your battle, Jim. Mr. President, uh, indeed, Australians have been responding, as Senator Molan said, magnificently to the call to get vaccinated. More than 32.6 million vaccines have been administered across Australia. Some 84.8 per cent of those over the age of 16 have received their first dose of a vaccine, and 68.3 per cent across the nation have received their second dose being fully vaccinated. Mr President, this comes when Australia's comparison in terms of the saving of lives across the rest of the world remains an incredibly strong one. We indeed remain the nation amongst the 38 OECD countries to have the second lowest incidence of COVID cases per capita. We're in the nation where we have seen far fewer deaths. In fact, if you look at the UK or the USA, they have seen some 40 times the number of deaths per capita than have occurred in Australia from COVID-19. And by avoiding the OECD averages in terms of COVID-19 deaths, we've seen some 30,000 plus Australian lives saved. And also the time indeed, Mr. President, for these millions of Australians, the vast majority of Australians now, to turn out and to get vaccinated, enabling us to see those states who have been battling lockdowns, such as Victoria, New South Wales and here in the ACT, begin the steps of reopening, and other states begin the steps of looking at how they transition to the next stages of a more vaccinated population. And can I welcome, Mr President, the news just prior to question time from the Queensland government, indicating that as those vaccination targets set out in the national plan our Prime Minister released, informed by the Doherty Institute modelling, will see Queensland open its borders at those 70 and 80 per cent thresholds. That is welcome news and sign of the progress that is being achieved. Senator Molan. Thank you, Mr President. Despite the recent challenges of the Delta outbreak, how does Australia's economic and health performance compare internationally? Minister. Well, Mr President, Australia is one of the few countries in the world that, after the COVID-19 recession of last year, saw our economy grow back to be larger than it was prior to the pandemic starting. And whilst the Delta strain and the lockdowns across parts of the eastern states have caused an impact, on the whole, our labour market remains strong. Despite the havoc of the Delta variant, indeed the outlook for the Australian economy is incredibly strong. This was reaffirmed last week by one of the three major global credit rating agencies, Fitch, who not only reaffirmed Australia's AAA credit rating, but indeed upgraded our outlook. They had previously indicated that Australia was on the negative watch list. They've removed Australia from that, reaffirming the AAA credit rating, removing that negative watch list and indeed pointing to the strength of the Australian economy, to their confidence in terms of the jobs rebound that we've seen before in coming out of COVID lockdowns and that we will see again. Australia stands tall in the world for saving both lives and livelihoods, and that Minister, is something that we should all be very grateful for.
Senator Molan. Thank you, Mr. President. Minister, what further measures will help to ensure confidence in our economic recovery and secure Australia's reopening in a safe and responsible way? Minister. Mr. President, what we'll see is that uh, the continued opening up in accordance with the national plan that is happening across New South Wales, that we're now seeing Victoria take steps and the ACT take steps to follow, will give that confidence. The encouragement of seeing greater freedom in terms of international movements to come will enhance business confidence. The news from Queensland today will be one to enhance business confidence and I hope will be looked at by other state and territory premiers and chief ministers in relation to decisions aligned with the national plan. Because what we've been able to achieve as a country is not just saving lives but providing the scientific framework for decisions to be made. The scientific framework of the Doherty Institute modelling demonstrating that at 70 per cent fully vaccination rates and 80 per cent fully vaccination rates, we can not only take the steps to reopen but do so while keeping Australians safe, do so in ways that enable us to manage COVID-19 more analogous to the flu and create an environment of confidence Minister, for Australian businesses and confidence expired. for Australia. Senator Ayres. Thanks, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister, Senator McKenzie. Liberal Senator Andrew Bragg has said, and I quote, It is quite clear that we should be looking to commit to net zero. Does the Deputy Prime Minister agree with Senator Bragg? Minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister, Minister McKenzie. Uh, thank you very much for your question, Senator Ayres. Uh, I've made it very, very clear that we as a party room are considering the question of committing to net zero by 2050. What are the implications for rural and regional Australia? And Labor senator after Labor senator is going to quote me Liberal Party senators. Well, they don't sit in my party room. They don't sit in my party room. The people who are actually considering this question are National Party senators and MPs uh, who have made it very, very clear whether it's uh, Ann Webster, who said we're not signing up to a blank cheque a couple of months ago, whether it's Matt Canavan, you can probably catch him uh, this evening on Sky, uh, often has made his views very, very clear on this, this issue. Uh, Senator Perrin Davey uh, on Chris Kenny made it very, very clear about our agriculturalists and our farmers who paid the price of our Kyoto uh, targets. So whilst Order, it Senator may not Watt. resonate, it may not resonate to Senator you Watt. because you don't live where we live, you don't serve the people we serve, and out of sight is out of mind for the major parties in this building. And so it is the National Party who once again, who once again stands before a policy if not implemented appropriately, will severely impact rural and regional Australia will severely impact mining, agriculture um, and manufacturing. Order. And we need to make sure we need to make sure we've assessed the plan that's been put to us to understand the implications uh, and to proceed in a calm and reasonable manner uh, with the Liberal Party on Senator a pathway McKenzie, forward. McKenzie, your time has expired. Senator Ayres, you have a supplementary? Thank you. Liberal MP Jason Felinski has said, and I quote, Economic benefits for Australia in signing up to net zero by 2050 are overwhelming and can't be understated. If Mr Felinski is correct, why have the Nationals still refused to sign up to net zero by 2050? Minister. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. I think, um, again, for 100 years, rural and regional Australians have been sending National Party and, before us, Country Party MPs to Canberra to do one thing, uh, and one thing only, to stand up for the interests of rural and regional Australia and our industries. And all we are doing is our job. We are doing our job. So we have uh, seen, seen uh, a, a pathway to net zero that's been put to us, and our party room is carefully considering that. That is what our constituents expect of us. Uh, that is actually a sensible and rational thing to do. Uh, we are actually two parties of government, the most successful coalition 
uh, has been maintained in this country for 75 years, and have we delivered not just for the regions but for the whole country? And we are just Senator doing McKenzie, our... time for the answer has expired. Senator Ayres, a second supplementary. Liberal MP Trent Zimmerman has said net zero by 2050 is the right thing to do. Does this minister agree, agree with Mr Zimmerman that net zero by 2050 is the right thing to do? And if not, why not? No. Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Well, I'm happy to table my opinion pieces of recent times on this issue of why I think it is, um, we need to adopt a cautious approach. We need to make sure we're doing the right thing by our people, because if we're not standing up for those with the lowest median income in the country, which is actually national party seats, uh, then we Order. actually aren't doing our jobs. And so if it's such a good Senator idea, Ayers. if it's such a good idea, what happened, you know, what happened under Rudd and Gillard? What, what, what happened? When you had the chance to do the miracle dream team deal between the Greens and Labor, you walked away from it, and you never really assessed what happened to the regions. If I asked you today what is the impact of Anthony Albanese's climate change policy on rural and regional Australia, what would you say? You'd have no idea, Order. no idea, because you have no plan. Senator McKenzie, I will order. I will just remind the chamber that we should address those from the other place by their correct titles, even if they are former representatives. Senator Abetz. Uh, thank you, Mr President, and congratulations on your election. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Can the minister explain the importance of the AUKUS announcement and how the partnership will contribute to security and stability in the Indo-Pacific? Minister for Foreign Affairs, Minister Payne. Thank you very much, and thank you very much, Senator Abetz, uh, for your question. Because AUKUS is a significant and historic enhancement of Australia's cooperation with the United Kingdom and the United States to promote both security and prosperity in the Indo-Pacific, in line with our shared values. This is a task on which we've worked together for more than 70 years. But today, we face a growing set of challenges in our region. Military modernisation is occurring in our region at an increasing rate, and capabilities are advancing rapidly with ever-expanding reach. To meet these challenges and to help deliver the security and stability our region needs, we are taking our partnership to a new level. Building on our three nations' long-standing bilateral ties, the AUKUS partnership will provide a foundation for deepening cooperation on a range of emerging security and defence capabilities. As announced, the first initiative is the acquisition for the Royal Australian Navy of a nuclear-powered submarine fleet, leveraging decades of experience from both the United Kingdom and the United States. As a three-ocean nation, it is necessary for Australia to have access to the most capable submarine technology available. However, beyond that, the initiative will be wide cooperation in the most critical areas of innovation that will shape the 21st century, including cyber capabilities, artificial intelligence, quantum technologies and additional undersea capabilities. Through AUKUS, we will foster deeper integration of security and defence-related science, technology, industrial bases and supply chains. AUKUS is a partnership where our technology, our scientists, our industry and our defence forces will work together more closely than ever before to deliver a safer and more secure Indo-Pacific that ultimately benefits all nations. Senator Abetz, you have a supplementary question. I thank the minister for that detail. I further ask the minister to outline the ways in which AUKUS complements our existing network of partnerships. Minister. Working with partners is central to shaping our region uh, for Australia's foreign policy. AUKUS will complement our network of partnerships with ASEAN, with the Pacific, with our European partners, as well as with the growing Quad. It is a partnership that seeks to engage, not to exclude. We we'll look for opportunities to enable and empower, rather than control or coerce. Australia, the United Kingdom and the United States are committed to strengthening our partnership with ASEAN and to deepening collaboration with our partners in Europe, including on the European Union's new Indo-Pacific strategy. We understand and have said clearly that we understand 
France's disappointment that we are not proceeding with the attack class program. We place great value on our relationship with France, and we look forward to continuing to work with France on our many shared interests, including in the Indo-Pacific. Senator Abex. In the context of the historic AUKUS agreement, can the minister advise the Senate of Australia's nuclear non-proliferation commitments? Minister. Again, I thank Senator Abetz uh, for his question. Australia's commitment to nuclear weapons non-proliferation is unchanged. We are embarking on a nuclear propulsion program. Australia has clearly, explicitly stated that we will not acquire nuclear weapons. Australia has the strongest non-proliferation and safeguard standards and one of the best nuclear non-proliferation reputations in the world. For the fifth time in succession, Australia has ranked first globally on the Nuclear Threat Initiative's 2020 Nuclear Security Index. We ranked first for measures against the theft of nuclear material amongst 24 states, and first out of 47 states for measures to prevent the sabotage of nuclear facilities. We will adhere to the highest standards of safeguards, transparency, verification and accountancy. We are committed to fulfilling our obligations as a non-nuclear weapons state and to meeting minister, our non-proliferation obligations the time such as the has South Pacific nuclear. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, President. My question is to the Foreign Minister. The countries going to the climate summit in Glasgow that have significantly increased their 2030 targets in this critical de decade are the US, the UK, the EU, Canada, South Africa, Norway, South Korea, Japan, Argentina, Chile, Colombia, Kenya, the United Arab Emirates and many others. Australia and Russia have not increased our ambition. Will you, as Foreign Minister, allow the National Party to throw this country's global reputation in the bin? Minister of Foreign Affairs, Minister Payne. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Waters, for your question. And, uh, to be very clear, and you and I have discussed this before in this uh, chamber, and I've made it pretty clear what the government's commitment is. I absolutely reject the uh, last part of your question, quite frankly, because it really is important to note, Senator Waters, that Australia's emissions are at their lowest levels since records began in 1990. That emissions in 2020 were more than 20 per cent lower than in 2005, which of course is the baseline for the Paris Agreement that Australia, since 2005, has reduced, achieved reduction in our emissions faster than Canada, than Japan, than New Zealand and the United States. We're on track to beat our 2030 Paris target of reducing emissions by 26 to 28 per cent. On a, on a per person basis, that's a reduction of 48 to 49 per cent on 2005 levels. That is more than either France or Germany or Canada or New Zealand or Japan are expected to achieve. And in 2020 alone, Australia deployed more renewable energy than in the six years of the previous Labor government, but I don't hear that welcomed by those at the end of the chamber. I don't hear any commentary in relation to that. In fact, we are building wind and solar around three times faster than Europe or than the United States on a per-person basis. We've got the world's highest uptake of rooftop solar with one in four homes with rooftop solar panels. Our government is building Snowy 2.0, one of the largest pumped hydro projects in the Southern Hemisphere, the Tasman and Tasmania's Battery of the Nation, and an interconnector. I don't hear much about that from that end of the chamber either. Enough clean energy to be stored to power around a million homes. We're also investing in transmission projects to support our record levels of renewables to continue to deliver affordable, reliable energy. That's a record, Mr President, that this country will take to Glasgow. Senator Waters, you have a supplementary question. Thank you, President. Will the government go to Glasgow and do what the science requires for a safe climate and triple our targets for 2030? Or will you confirm reports of Minister Taylor's party room briefings that the government will not increase their 2030 targets? Minister. Thank you very much, and I thank Senator Waters for her question. I'm not going to comment on party room deliberations, uh, and uh, nor, nor I would have thought would uh, with those at the end of the chamber. But, Mr. President, what we have said we will take to Glasgow, and what we have said we will commit to, is being worked through by the government in terms of the discussions that many have commented on in recent days. 
But as I made clear in the answer to the previous question, many countries in the OECD can't claim Australia's achievements. I know you want to ignore achievements. I know they're an inconvenient truth for those of you at the end of the chamber. But, Mr. Pre President, and uh, through you to Senator Waters, what Australia will take will be to deliver a long-term emissions reduction strategy, one that we will release ahead of COP. COP26, but it's an economic strategy that will be underpinned by delivering affordable and reliable energy in a way that positions Australia to be successful uh, in lowering and ultimately net in a lowered and ultimately net zero emissions global economy of Minister, the future. Your time has expired. Senator Waters, a second supplementary. Thank you, President. The International Energy Agency has said that to reach net zero, not one single coal, oil or gas infrastructure project can be built. How can you go to Glasgow ignoring 2030 and pledging net zero by 2050 when Australia has 72 new major coal projects and 44 major gas projects planned in the coming years? Minister. Thank you. And I know those at the end of the chamber want to ignore all of the achievements that I've spoken about. But let's be very clear about what we will be able to focus on and what we can focus on as a nation, importantly, because we can develop, notwithstanding the intransigent and the small-minded approach of those at the end of the chamber, we can develop practical, scalable, technological solutions that will enable Australia to reach net zero while partnering with other countries to decarbonise and grow our economies. I know you don't care what the developing world can afford, Order. but we do. We do. We have a priority on supporting Senator technology Pratt. access of the developing world, low emissions technology, low cost. That is our focus, and that's what we're delivering. Senator Ayers. Yeah. Senator Green. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister, Senator McKenzie. Mr Morrison has previously claimed electric vehicles would end the weekend and claimed emissions reduction targets would wreck the economy. Does the Deputy Prime Minister agree with those views? The Minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister, Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. And I really thank you uh, for another hit out and another chance to respond on behalf of rural and regional Australia. People are berating the nationals right now. You can't pick up a newspaper in this country without saying, you know what, the Nats Senator are the last McKenzie, man's man Minister, and woman. Please resume your seat. Senator Wong, you have a point of order. Thank you, Mr. President. Direct relevance. This is a question about whether or not the Deputy Prime Minister, whom the Minister represents, agrees with the statement the Prime Minister has made. I would ask you to draw the Minister to the question. Well, uh, on the point of order. 16 seconds that the minister has had uh, to respond. And the minister responding uh, as the minister representing the deputy prime minister, who is also the leader of the National Party. A series of questions that are clearly related to National Party decisions and National Party deliberations and discussions. The minister was clearly on a trajectory of talking about those National Party decisions, those National Party discussions, and in doing so, obviously addressing the broader issues that are raised. I think it is certainly very premature and probably uh, erroneous for the Leader of the Opposition to suggest that the Minister is at any point yet not being relevant. I, I was going to make the point that uh, the Minister had only been addressing the question for around 16 seconds. Uh, I, you have had the opportunity, Senator Wong, to bring the minister's attention to the question. However, Senator McKenzie, you have the call. Well, thank you very much. Um, and in, in the, within the first 20 seconds, I shall address um, the sacrosanct nature of weekends to rural and regional Australians, and the fact that we like Order. to honestly, honestly. Order. Rural and regional Australia, and indeed the broader, broader Australian public, are very thankful for the National Party. We, we, I know, you know, there's no friends for the National Party at the moment this week. Not a friend in the country. The peak bodies have deserted us. You know, Order. not a friend internationally. But you know what? If it wasn't for the National Party, our country would have a carbon tax right now. We'd have the Labor Party's carbon tax. And you know what? Our country, under a Liberal National government, has been able to achieve since we came to, to government without a carbon tax, a 20 per cent decrease 
in emissions. A 20 per cent decrease in our emissions. You don't want to hear that, do you? 20 per cent decrease in our emissions whilst increasing our mineral exports, whilst increasing jobs in agriculture. So for you to argue that the only way back then for us to actually lower emissions in this country was to tax us was wrong. And you admit it now because it's your own policy. It is the Labor Party's policy not to instigate a carbon tax. So you need to be saying thank Minister, you to the National Minister, Party for saving Minister, you from yourselves. Minister, please resume your seat. Minister, I would ask you when I call you to resume your seat. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr President. We've given the minister a good go on relevance. It was a simple question about whether the Deputy Prime Minister agrees with opinions expressed by the Prime Minister. We haven't had an answer remotely close to that, and I'd ask you to bring the minister to order. Minister, uh, Senator Watt, you've had a chance to remind the minister of the question. Minister, you have the call. Well, I, I think that the Prime Minister and the Deputy Prime Minister, as I alluded to in an earlier answer, the coalition between the Liberal and the National Party has been the most successful political partnership this country has ever seen. It has delivered more, kept us more secure for the 75 years it's been in place, and long Minister, may it continue. Please resume your seat. Senator Green. Uh, thank you. Mr Morrison has previously described renewable energy targets as nuts. Does the Deputy Prime Minister agree with this view? Minister. Well, good question, Senator Abetz. Uh, thank you very much uh, for that supplementary, supplementary question. It is rural and regional Australians and the MPs that represent them that actually see renewable projects in their backyard. Yep. We're the ones that have the wind farms. We're the ones that have the solar farms. And it is true that those and the hydropower stations, obviously in areas with a lot of water, uh, Senator Colbeck, like Tasmania. So we know very well the benefits that renewable projects Minister, bring to our communities. Minister, sorry, Senator Watt. Again, on relevance, Mr. President. Very straightforward question: whether the minister, the, the deputy prime minister, agrees with the view of the prime minister. We don't need a long. Senator Watt. Fairy tale Senator from the minister. Watt. We just need an yes, answer from the question. Point of order. On the point of order. Point of order, Mr. President, and uh, uh, and Senator Senator Watt there uh, seeks at the conclusion of his point of order to try to try to define how the minister should answer the question. It is clearly uh, not the role of the Senate uh, to define how a minister answers the question. Uh, the minister, from what I heard in the first ten seconds of her answer, I think, turned to uh, renewable projects. Uh, and renewable projects uh, and their impacts in regional Australia. Uh, the question indeed went to uh, renewable energy. Uh, well, uh, perhaps this just shows the Labor Senator Party thinks Watt. targets don't result in projects or action or change. Mr. Senator, President. that seems to be Senator. Senator Watt. I'm sorry, Senator, Mr. President. I apologise. Senator Wong, please resume your seat. Apologise. Senator, he, Senator Birmingham has apologised. Senator Watt was interjecting. But the point. Senator Birmingham. The point being, Mr. President, Senator Watt clearly is, does not have a point of order in this Se case. Se okay. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. Um, uh, I believe the minister was being directly relevant. I cannot direct a minister how to answer a question. Minister. I think it's pretty clear, if you look at the international evidence and the evidence here at home, that setting targets without plans to achieve them, or indeed the will to achieve them are actually meaningless. So there are a lot of vacuous promises that are made, and the Greens uh, champion those promises in this place, uh, where countries overseas make very bold, ambitious targets and then fail to deliver Minister, on them at all. Minister. Senator Green, a second supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Last week this minister said, and I quote, We've had all of these promises before, and I'll tell you what, the lived experience out there in the region isn't what was promised prior. If the government doesn't trust the government to deliver what it says it will, why should anyone else? Minister. Uh, thank you very much for giving me the chance to clarify um, a comment I made in an opinion piece last week. So when we talk about 
the sell of Tel Telstra, which both the Labor Party supported and the Liberal Party, who dealt with the poor communications, telecommunications, who couldn't, who couldn't call an AMBO, who couldn't Order. homeschool their kids. It was no one in Woolloomooloo and it was no one in any of your electorates. It was our electorates. On the Murray-Darling Basin Plan, the water policy in this country, it was our seats that pay the price. Out of sight, out of mind. And Order, I'm sorry, you don't like to Senator hear it, but it's true. And it is the Senator same. It is absolutely the same on this issue. We need to be assured on behalf of our people who sent us here on the impact on them, and that's Senator all McKenzie, we're doing. Please resume your seat. Senator Roberts. Mr. President, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Minister, I note that the Department of Statistics data for Australian fatalities has not been updated since June 30, 2021. At that time, deaths in Australia during 2021 were noticeably above the five-year moving average, even after allowing for the small number of COVID deaths. Minister, given that until June 30 this year, the Australian Bureau of Statistics posted that data six weeks after the period, why is the reporting of death data now 15 weeks after the period? The Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Thanks, Senator, for the question. Uh, Senator, I'll have to take that question on notice. Um, it may be, it may very well be that there's some delay in data being transmitted um, uh, between agencies. For example, we know in Victoria the uh, deaths due to COVID are uh, reported into their uh, public health emergency uh, system, the FEST system, which is where we use our death data and report our death data for, um, uh, for COVID deaths. Uh, that is then transmitted across to uh, their database for births, deaths and marriages. And there is sometimes a period of cleansing that needs required to actually certify whether or not a death has been uh, ca um, caused by COVID, for example. So, Mr President, I will undertake to uh, get some information on that, but I suggest that that may be part of what's occurring because uh, there has been uh, some movement up and down in the reporting of deaths over uh, the last 18 months or so. Um, I've had some experience with that, in, particularly in relation to COVID, as deaths are recertified. In fact, uh, in the last few days, I had the number of deaths from COVID in aged care reduced because somebody who was thought to have passed away actually hadn't. So there are some issues with respect to reporting and translating that information through the system, so I'm happy to take that on notice and report back to the Chamber. Senator Roberts, a supplementary question? Thank you, Mr President. I did advise the Minister's office of the subject of my question today and directed his office to my question on notice number 3970, asking for the same information. It's been outstanding for 12 weeks. Minister, how many people died in Australia in July, August and September of 2021? Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, and if you, uh, in the circumstance that you did advise my office, um, uh, I, I haven't been advised of that, so I can only apologise to you for not having the data with me right now. But I clearly don't have that information. Uh, and if there is a delay in the reporting, I suspect it has something to do with the uh, explanation I gave you in your primary question. But I am happy to chase that information up and come back to the chamber as soon as possible. Senator Roberts, a second supplementary. Minister, this information is critical to trust in vaccines and its omission raises serious doubts and serious questions. How is it possible that you don't know? What are you hiding? Senator, Senator Colbeck, Minister. Thank you, Mr President. Can I reject the assertion that the government or anyone is actually hiding anything? Um, I've uh, given to the chamber a quite plausible rationale for the fact that uh, there is uh, a del are some delays in respect of the reporting of deaths in this country. There is no reason for us to um, make any um, to hide at all. And can I also 
uh, reject the assertion, Mr. President, that somehow the death data has any relationship or should have any relationship to uh, vaccines, Mr. President. The overwhelming data in this country right now indicates to us that vaccines work. Uh, we can see that in the data. We can see that in the circumstances in the general community right now. Uh, and if anybody has any questions with respect to the fact that vaccines work, just look at the data that's available right Minister, now. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Bragg. Thank you, Mr. President, and congratulations to you in your new role. My question is to the Minister for Emergency Management and National Recovery and Resilience, Senator McKenzie. Can the Minister up Order. Order. Senator Bragg. Can the Minister update the Senate on how the government has supported Australians who have been unable to work during the COVID lockdown? The Minister for Emergency Man Management, Minister, uh, Senator McKenzie. Oh, thank you, Mr. President, and thank you so much, Senator Order. Bragg, for the question and for your ongoing advocacy for Order. the people of New South Wales. Throughout this entire pandemic, our government has stood side by side with Australians and carefully monitored their needs to ensure that our uh, recovery remains on track. More than 65 per cent of the eligible population has done the right thing, rolled their sleeves up and is now fully vaccinated. But a few of the states are leading the way, and there is no doubt this is due to the fact that they have had to endure lengthy lockdowns that have meant millions of workers uh, have been unable to work or have had that, seen their hours significantly reduced. The Liberal and Nationals government has been there to support those Australians and have paid more than $11 Order. billion dollars to over 2 million people throughout uh, this period through the COVID disaster payment, a payment that was always intended to be temporary to ensure the financial viability of Australians while we slowed the spread of the virus and increased vaccination rates. A payment that has kept food on people's tables, kept fuel in the car, kept the heater on and removed financial stress at a time of such uncertainty. Without these payments, a lot of people wouldn't have made it through. As more and more Australians are getting their vaccinations, states and territories have been able to safely ease restrictions, and we're finally beginning to see the end of these lockdowns. This has meant that people have not only been able to get back to work, but get back to doing things they love and learning to adjust to living with the virus. This week we've seen Victoria, the state with the longest lockdown city in the world, bring forward their plan to ease restrictions. And Canberra has one of the highest vaccinations in any, of any city across the globe, with over 99 per cent of their population having received their first dose. This means, as we transition back to normal life, there will be less need for the COVID-19 disaster payment. It served its purpose and will continue to do so until vaccination rates reach 80 per cent in states and territories. Senator Bragg, you have a supplementary President. question. Uh, New, South Wales has endured, New South Wales has endured a lengthy lockdown, and we are now seeing people back to work and getting back to a normal life. Can the minister update the Senate on what support has gone to New South Wales? Minister. Uh, thank you. A very, lockdown, a very long lockdown indeed, Senator Bragg, um, and it's good to see opening up. Over 100 days, in fact, and 100 days of limited to no income for some. And that's why we were there supporting the people of New South Wales to be able to come out of lockdown in a strong economic position. The Liberal and Nationals government COVID disaster payment has provided more than $1.3 billion in financial support for those in New South Wales alone. They did the right thing. They stayed at home. They got vaccinated, reaching both 70 and 80 per cent milestones before any other state in the country. And they did this with the hope that at some point their life would return to normal. Well, Mr President, I'm so pleased to see that coming Order. to life, and I'm sure you are too, Senator Bragg. And our support has extended to businesses across the state. In partnership with the New South Wales Liberal National Government, we've seen more than 200,000 businesses receive nearly $6 billion through the Job Saver program. Our government will continue Senator to support the people of New South Wales as they transition out of this pandemic. Senator Bragg, a second thank, supplementary. Thank you very much. As we begin to see the safe relaxing of restrictions in our workforce opening back up, how will the government support Australians through the transition back to work? Minister. We know Order. that people want to just get back to normal. It's been an incredibly tough period for our country. They want to be able to travel without restrictions. 
They want to be reunited with loved ones, their friends, their colleagues in the workplace, and to put this pandemic behind them. And this means when state and territories reach 80 per cent double vaccination rates, our support won't stop. It will wind down, though, over a period of two weeks, because the COVID disaster payment is just that. It's a disaster payment. It was never intended to be long term. Once phase B, C and D of the national plan are reached, we will no longer be in a state of disaster. We're not abandoning workers like those opposite have claimed, a claim that is completely unfounded given the continued Order. commitment throughout this pandemic Order. of the federal government to both individuals and business support payments. After the disaster payment has tapered down over a two-week period, we will continue to support Australians who have been unable to transition back to their usual employment through our existing strong safety support network Minister, run through Services Minister, Australia. Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr President. My question is also to the minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister, Senator Mackenzie. National Senator Matt Canavan has said Mr Morrison does not have that Mr Morrison does not have a plan for net zero, but is instead relying on, and I quote, a prayer that hydrogen comes along and saves all these jobs. Does the Deputy Prime Minister agree with Senator Canavan? The Minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister, Senator Mackenzie. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. What Senator Canavan is concerned about, what the Deputy Prime Minister is concerned about, what the entire National Party is concerned about, is the impact of any uh, move towards net zero on regional jobs. It's that simple. Uh, we only wish that the Labor Party and the Greens could have a similar concern, because the reality is you actually have no plan to get to net zero by 2050. You actually have. You walked away from your 2030 target at the 2019 election. You don't have a medium target. You don't Minister, have a plan to achieve. Minister, to Minister. Minister, please, Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. On a point of order. Uh, point Senator of order, Wong. direct relevance, uh, and there are there are long-standing precedents that a discussion of opposition policy is not directly relevant to a question about government policy. Uh, yeah, there is. Senator Mackenzie, um, I I will bring you back to the question that was asked, and I um, ask you to resume your answer. Senator Mackenzie, you have the call. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. As I was saying, the Labor doesn't currently have a medium-term target nor a plan Se to get anywhere Se near Senator, to. Senator Mackenzie, I, I will bring you back to the question. Um, no, it's about Senator Canavan and the Deputy Prime Minister. And do they agree? And they agree. They agree on the need to protect regional jobs for not just the next three weeks. Just, not just the next three months, but the next 30 years. They are absolutely agreed on that, as we all are in the National Party. The National Party has a broad, broad range of views on the substantive issue of climate change. That's no, there's no secret there. Uh, but what we are all united on is to ensure that any climate policy that this country agrees to does not disadvantage the regions, and we're taking our time to assess that and come to a position. But in this place, it isn't just talking about the Nats as much as I could do that all day and what our plans for the regions are. It is actually to put before the Australian people what the alternative is. And the fact is you don't have one. You have no idea how you're going to get to your plan of 250. Absolutely not. You want to join, you'll have to form a government with these guys. And you know who's under attack if, if Labor and Greens get in power? The fishing industry, the foresting industry, the live cattle export, export industry, the mining Minister, industry, your time the gas industry, Minister, the coal Minister. industry. Senator Watt, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Canavan has also said, and I quote, the Prime Minister might believe in miracles, but I don't think we should gamble people's jobs on a wing and a prayer. Does the Deputy Prime Minister agree with Senator Canavan? Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Well, I agree. I believe in miracles too. I do. So, um, you know, Order. we don't. We don't. Um, I guess on this. I think 
I think when, when you phrasing that um, particular quote you put to me, was it in context of the last election? That was actually the miracle win because Australians actually woke up, woke up to what a racket the policy positions being put before them by the Labor Party and Bill Shorten and his leadership group were, and the negative impact that they would have, not on the top end of town, on mums and dads out there right across regional Australia and the suburbs and the suburbs. And they rejected it wholeheartedly. So yeah, I believe in miracles. Absolutely. Senator Watt, a second supplementary question. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. President. Given Senator Canavan also declared in a piece entitled Woke Net Zero Targets Will Weaken Us, and I quote, Net zero emissions is the public policy embodiment of corporate bullshit. Does the Deputy Prime Minister think Mr Morrison should still be confident he can wrangle a climate deal with the Nationals just two weeks from the COP26 conference in Glasgow? Minister. Um, I think you know, if, it's good that you're actually reading Matt's articles. I suggest you also sign up to his YouTube channel. Um, you can usually find him on most Sky After Dark. Uh, commentators, if you're a fan of Matt Canavan, that's where you'll find him. You know what? Se through you, Mr. President, Senator Watt, Senator Watt, we don't shy away from having 20 very proud rural and regional Australians in our party room yeah. who all have a view on a range of matters, and they are actually able to speak freely, not just in the party room, but outside of it. What we are committed to doing is actually making sure we keep you out of government. That's actually what the National Party and the Liberal Party want to see happen, is stopping the Labor Party, whose policies would decimate Order. this country, Order. decimate the regions and our industries, because you don't Senator care. Pratt. That's why they don't Senator vote for Pratt. you. Pratt. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Mr President, and congratulations on your election earlier today. My question is to the Minister for Women's Safety, Senator Rustin. Can the minister outline to the Senate how the Liberal and Nationals government is assisting women who are escaping domestic violence? Minister. Thank you very much, Mr President, and I too add my congratulations to your appointment to the auspicious role of being president of this amazing place. And can I also thank Senator Chandler for her question. Um, you know, a question that is just so incredibly important to all Australians is about ending violence against women and their children. Sadly, we know that one in six women will actually experience violence at the hands of a partner from the age of 15. And it is an absolute blight on our society, and I can assure everybody in this chamber that this government is absolutely committed to doing something about it. We must aim to prevent violence before it happens. But unfortunately, when it does happen, we also need to be there to support women and their children to help them rebuild their lives. That's why today I was pleased to announce the Ending Violence um, Payment, which is a $144.8 million initiative that was part of the $1.1 billion investment in women's safety during the budget. The payment aims to help 12,000 women. Uh, however, it is a demand-driven system uh, and payment. Um, to make sure that we provide them with the necessary supports so that they are able to overcome the financial barriers of leaving violent relationships and, in doing so, alleviating one of the main reasons why women stay in violent relationships or potentially go back to violent relationships. The flagship investment will give women more se security when they make that extraordinary brave decision to leave a violent relationship in all the forms of domestic family and sexual violence, including physical violence, coercive control and financial abuse. The payment, escaping violence payment is uh, up to $5,000 to help women rebuild their lives free of violence. $1,500 of this will be in cash to buy something perhaps as simple as buying the kids a new lunchbox. The other 3500 can go towards things like paying for rental bonds, white goods, school fees, etc. It's not taxable, it's not reportable, and it doesn't impact on other, uh, other payments. And I look forward to continuing to update the Senate on this initiative. Senator Chandler, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. 
Can the minister explain how the escaping violence payment responds to our growing understanding of the ways women experience violence? Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, well, it is an extraordinarily important issue and one which we know that we must continue to address as we work towards developing the next national plan to end violence against women and their children. Since the first plan was implemented in 2010, our understanding of what violence is and how it manifests has certainly grown. New and emerging forms of domestic violence, things like coercive control, financial abuse, technology facilitated abuse, are absolutely insidious and make it near impossible in some circumstances for women to have the resources to gather them to make that decision to actually leave an abusive relationship. These barriers to leaving an abusive relationship are exactly what the escaping violence payment is directed at making sure we address. Importantly, as I said, the payment is, uh, is not means tested in the traditional sense. We want to make sure it's available to every woman, no matter where she comes from, because we know it's not uncommon for bank accounts to be frozen, credit cards to be cut off. It doesn't matter what size the house the Minister, woman comes from, no. she Minister, needs our support. The time for the answer has expired. Senator Chandler, a second supplementary. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister please advise the Senate how women can access the new escaping violence payment? Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, I'm really pleased uh, that as of tomorrow morning, um, Uniting Care Australia Consortium, who is, uh, is our preferred and selected partner, will start the two-year trial to support this program. Uniting Care has an extensive um, experience in supporting victim survivors of domestic family and sexual violence. And they also have a footprint that covers very, uh, a very huge amount of Australia. The support that is being provided under this program will be tailored to meet the individual circumstances, and we will also be working through Uniting Care with state and territory um, governments to make sure that we have got a seamless support for women when they leave uh, a domestic violence uh, situation. Eligible applicants must be experiencing domestic violence and have, have changed living circumstances or may find themselves in changed living circumstances and be under financial stress. But uh, evidence can be included but is not limited to making uh, things like domestic violence orders, um, referral from a, uh, a uh, domestic violence service the provider. Time for the question, the answer has expired. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister and the Minister for Finance, Senator Birmingham. It is reported Mr. Morrison is preparing to fork out more than $20 billion to get the Nationals to support his net zero plan. How much taxpayer money is Mr Morrison willing to spend to buy a political fix? Minister for Finance. Minister. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. And I thank Senator Gallagher for her question, because, uh, because certainly what our government is quite proudly doing at present is preparing indeed the commitments and plans that the Prime Minister will take to the Climate Change Conference in Glasgow. Those commitments and plans entail planning not just in relation to what the emissions reduction framework and commitments will look like, but indeed how we will protect the jobs of those communities across Australia who are facing change brought about by a changing international environment. How we will protect the jobs, how we will protect those communities, how we will ensure that they can have confidence that they will be supported through transition that is going to occur as a result of a changed global investment environment, of a changed environment in relation to many of our key export markets and commitments they're making. These are changes that are happening, and it sounds to me, from the tone of the question put by Senator Gallagher, that she's happy to leave those communities behind, to not care about those jobs, to think that if there is some investment in protecting those communities, in supporting them to take Order. advantage of the opportunities to come, that that should just be ignored. Well, those of us on this side, the Liberals and the Nationals on this side, we will certainly not leave regional Australia Order, behind. Senator we will McAllister. not leave regional communities behind. We will make sure that just as we invest to pursue lower emissions and to work towards net zero, that we equally invest to protect Australian communities, the regions that we have relied upon as a nation for so long for so many of our export activities, and to ensure that they have a bright future, that they can seize the opportunities ahead be they in new energy opportunities or be they other new opportunities that can be created. And indeed, for Senator Gallagher to come here and want to ask a question about wasting money, but I saw just yesterday she seemed to walk back from the $300 vaccine payments. Talk about a $6 billion waste Order. of money. 
paying people to do Order. something that Australians have thankfully already turned out Order. to do and turned out to do in their millions. Minister. Order. Order. Senator Gallagher, supplementary question. I do have a supplementary. Given it has been reported that one government MP has said, and I quote, there's going to be a giant National Party green rainbow across regional Australia with crocs full of pork at the bottom. Is there any upper limit to how much taxpayer money Mr Morrison is willing to spend to buy a political deal? Minister. Thanks, Mr President. Well, I could just as equally ask, is there any place or point at which those opposite will acknowledge the importance of those regional jobs or those regional communities? Now, Mr President, we are going through these discussions asking all the Order. right questions. On this side, we ask all the right questions. We don't make a commitment and then try to work out how to put the plan in place. We are in parallel working through the questions of how we deliver the commitments in relation to climate change, but do so in ways to support the regional communities and jobs of Australians. That's the responsible way to go about these sorts of policies, to do it in alignment, to do it together and to make sure that you can present plans that do provide that support and respect to Australians. It's unsurprising, given the question Senator Gallagher is asking, that indeed those opposite simply make the promise Order. without consideration for the consequences, Senator Watt. make the promise without actually thinking about the plan. For them, they sort of jump out of the plane and then see whether they pack the parachute. Well, Mr President, we're making Minister, sure Minister, that we have everything Minister, answered in advance. Minister. Uh, Senator Gallagher, thank that's you, not Mr. helping. President. A second supplementary Sorry. question. Um, thank you. The Minister for Finance has said it's critical for the Morrison-Joyce government to have, and I quote, a target and a plan. Will the minister guarantee that any last-minute political deal with the Nationals will meet the standard he himself has set? Minister. Well, yeah, it, it, indeed, Mr. President, as Senator Betts, I think, just alluded, I, I, I do agree with my own words. Um, I'm, uh, I'm happy to confirm that to, uh, to the Senate. And, uh, and, and, Mr. President, and that is precisely, if, uh, if the senator had been listening to, I think, the previous two answers I'd given, what I have talked the Senate through: the fact that we are working concurrently through the process in relation to targets and the process in relation to the plans to meet those targets, and not just the plans to meet the targets without consideration of the consequences of meeting the targets, but the plans to meet the targets whilst considering the consequences of that for different communities across Australia, not just Order. looking at it at a national level or a macro level, but drilling it down to consider the impacts across different states and territories, across different regions, across different industry Order. sectors, because that's how you do the job properly. That's how you take care of Australians. That's how you ensure that Australian regions, communities, states, families have the strongest possible future, which is what Minister. we wish to secure. And Mr President, I ask that further questions be placed on notice. And whilst on my feet, I would also table for the Sorry. information of the Senate a revised ministry list. Apologies, I didn't do so at the start of question time, albeit there's no change to representational arrangements in this chamber. Uh, I seek leave to have the document incorporated into Hansard. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Thank you. Sorry, uh, Senator Roberts. Good. I seek leave to correct the record of a statement I made in question time. Sorry. <laughs> is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Thank you. I just want to correct the record that um, I said to Senator Colbeck that his that my question on notice uh, three nine seven zero has been outstanding for twelve weeks. That was correct, but I didn't. But I also said that my staff had tried to contact his office today. While that's correct, they didn't get through and did not follow up later. So Senator Salt Colbeck staff was not advised of that question today. Thank you, Senator Robert. Senator Ayres. Madam Deputy President, understanding order 745A, and on behalf of Senators Wong, Gallagher, Watt and Kitching, I seek an explanation from the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham, as to why 71 questions placed on notice through the table office between 15 September 2020 and 12 September 2021 remain unanswered. I further seek an explanation on behalf of Senators Wong, 
Gallagher, Chisholm, Smith, Kitching, Keneally and myself as to why 61 estimates questions placed on notice through the Finance and Public Administration Committee for the Department of the Prime Minister and Cabinet remain unanswered. I note I've provided an itemised list uh, to the Minister's office earlier today. Minister. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. Deputy President, uh, firstly, just in response to Senator Ayres, could, uh, could through you, I ask uh, the new president just to consider, uh, in relation to this standing order, um, what has become an emerging practice of senators asking, not just in relation to questions uh, that may be unanswered that they have asked, but also seeking to do so in relation to other senators. Uh, I am uh, not sure, Deputy President, uh, that that is uh, truly in keeping with the letter of the standing order uh, and would, uh, would encourage uh, the President to, uh, to just take a look at that and to reflect upon it uh, following advice. Can I say, in relation to response to questions, that this government in this parliament has been more responsive to more questions than at any time in recent memory. That, Mr. That Deputy President, uh, through the course of this parliament, we have responded to some 4,313 parliamentary questions on notice. 4,313. That is almost as many questions on notice through the parliament, through this chamber, in the life of this parliament as in the two previous parliaments put together. Mr President, when it comes to Senate estimates questions on notice, we have responded since the 2019 election to 31,486 questions on notice. So, Mr President, I make the point, as I said, that in terms of parliamentary questions on notice, we have been more responsive to more questions than in either of the last couple of parliaments and, in fact, at the point where this parliament has done more in, and this government has done more in responding to questions than the previous parliaments combined. And that in total, across parliamentary questions on notice and Senate estimates questions on notice, uh, we indeed uh, are now tracking, are now tracking uh, close to 36,000 questions that have been asked and answered uh, by the government during this time. And so the government well and truly lives up to the expectations of accountability. In fact, I think most people would be incredibly surprised to learn of that sheer volume of questions asked and answered and tabled and responded in this place. And that, Mr. President, uh, Deputy President, does not include the myriad uh, of other committees, including, for example, the uh, COVID Select Committee that was established, uh, which have posed many additional questions. Nor does it count, of course, the many, many hours spent in estimates in committee hearings or in this place answering questions that are not taken uh, on notice. Uh, so, uh, yes, Deputy President, I know there are a handful, in relative terms, a handful compared to the tens of thousands that have been answered uh, that remain outstanding. The government works through these things uh, as best we can uh, with the record volumes uh, of questions that we have continued to face, uh, and we have provided not just uh, handled a record number of questions, but provided record numbers of answers. And we will continue to work through uh, providing those record numbers of answers as uh, much as we, po as we possibly can. Thank you, Minister. And I will respond to the question you asked. I have ruled on this before, and it is in order for a senator to uh, combine a, a number of unanswered questions from different senators in the one motion. <coughs> Uh, Senator Ayres, are you seeking the call further? Yeah, I just move to take note of the um, minister's response. Um, just make this point uh, gently uh, to the Senate that, uh, notwithstanding Senator Birmingham's pre-prepared response, the problem that this government has uh, with responding to questions, the questions on notice. The problem this government has indeed in responding to questions in the chamber is that the culture of secrecy, the, the, the entire lack of accountability, the commitment to avoiding transparency 
is the, is the characteristic that will define this government. It will leave no lasting legacy uh, when it's finally gone in policy terms or in terms of achievements. It will only leave a giant hole in public finances, created in large part through its failure to deal effectively with the COVID-19 pandemic, the greatest public policy failure in Australian history. It, even its own supporters say it's the greatest public policy failure in Australian history. Uh, the lasting legacy that will be left, that will need to be swept aside, is the culture of secrecy and servility and complacency and lack of accountability that it has infected the upper echelons of Australia's public service with. That's why there's so much obstruction to questions being asked on notice. That's why we have 71 questions through the table office provided over just the space of a few days, treated with utter contempt by ministers uh, and by the leader of the government in the Senate. That's why 61 questions placed through the committee that I've got the honour to be the deputy chair of by Senators Wong and Gallagher, Chisholm, Smith, Kitching, Keneally and myself, 71 questions unanswered. And the thing that's interesting about those questions is that they're all questions directed towards the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. And we saw last week the culture of secrecy that surrounds that department when they became before the Legislation Committee of the Finance and Public Administration. <laughs> Mr Gaitchens, the secretary of that department, the Prime Minister's friend appointed to become the secretary, the most partisan departmental secretary in Australian political history. There is a relationship between being the most partisan secretary of that department uh, in Australian history and having the greatest public policy failure in Australian history, because this government is all about the partisan okay. politics. It's all about the announcement. It's never about the delivery in the interests of the Australian people, and we saw that because this bill that the government proposes to submit to the parliament at some point, if it can find some friends uh, for the COAG amendment bill, was the subject of scrutiny early last week. And Mr Gaitchens from the department refused to turn up. And that the effect of the bill would be to drop the black veil of secrecy, of cabinet confidentiality, over the deliberations of national cabinet. You see, there's a pattern here, a refusal to answer questions, a refusal to deal with questions on notice, an ever-creeping extension of opposition uh, and lifting the costs and pro providing every procedural barrier to freedom of information applications. Now, when the government and the department in particular got smashed in the Administrative Appeals Tribunal uh, through a decision of His Honour Justice White, which said that their pathetic attempt to define the National Cabinet as a subcommittee of cabinet could not be sustained. And the government's position was trashed in the Administrative Appeal Tribunal. It was utterly, utterly humiliating defeat. And so what is the response? Well, the department and the government draft a piece of legislation which is designed to say that the earth is flat, that the moon is made of cheese, that the National Cabinet is somehow a subcommittee of cabinet. Well, it has none of those features. This government, so desperate, so desperate to put the shroud of secrecy 
over the operations of government when there is no possible public interest in doing so. No possible public interest in doing so. And the government has so debased the notion of effective government accountability in this country, has retreated so far from its own responsibilities to be open and accountable with the Australian people, that this process of dealing with questions on notice by just pretending that they are not there should come as no surprise to anybody. Now that bill, the COAG bill, is entirely friendless. Not a single coalition senator stood up or moved a muscle for a whole day while that bill was torn apart by all of the legal experts, all of the witnesses, anybody who had any interest in public accountability and transparency pulled that bill apart and not one Liberal senator moved a muscle. Do you know why, Madam Deputy President? Because they were ashamed. They are ashamed of the direction that Mr Morrison has taken this government in. They can't defend the position that Mr Morrison and Mr Gaitchens have taken around public accountability. And while they'll be in here thumping the table and shouting and hollering about, uh, about questions on notice, and, and Minister Birmingham, Senator Birmingham, will be in here with a pre-prepared response, they know that it's gone way too far, that the culture of secrecy and cover-up and acting in your own political partisan interest rather than in the public interest has entirely captured this government, has entirely reduced it uh, to a, a government that is disappearing so fast in terms of its capacity to act in the public interest, in terms of the place that it should hold in the Commonwealth, uh, that it's collapsing uh, under its own weight. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Senator Patrick. Thank you. Um, I also rise, uh, understanding order 74-5, uh, to seek an explanation from uh, the minister representing the Prime Minister as to why question number 3985 has not been answered. <coughs> minister. Thanks, uh, thanks, Deputy President. Uh, uh, Senator Patrick, uh, through the chair, um, I don't have specifics in relation to that question, Senator Patrick. Uh, I appreciate you asking about uh, one particular question, but I've not been able to, uh, to get um, a specific update. I draw your attention to the broader points that, uh, that I made, uh, albeit it was in relation to a much more general question from Senator Ayres before. Uh, I respect you asking about one particular question and uh, I will follow that up uh, upon leaving the chamber. Um, just a moment, Senator Patrick, because I assumed you were speaking on the same matter, so I'll just dispose of the first matter and then I'll come to you. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Ayres be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Patrick. <coughs> uh, I apologise, um, uh, Madam Deputy President. Um, the, uh, so I, I seek to take note of the minister's answer in, re in yep. response to uh, uh, my uh, query as to why the question hasn't been answered, and uh, look, I'm not in intending to cluster a whole range of questions. Uh, every question I put on notice, I read uh, the answer when it comes back. It's provided by my staff, and I read them and consider them. Um, this is an important question, and I'll uh, run through uh, uh, the question. It uh, really deals with two matters. One of them is the uh, fact. Oh, well, both of them relate to costs uh, in relation to AAT matters, freedom of information matters, where the Commonwealth uh, challenged uh, uh, a, um, or, or, or sought to try and uphold what were later found to be erroneous and cavalier FOI decisions. One of them relates to the Hawkeye audit mm -hmm. conducted by the Auditor General in 2018. Uh, and the fact that the auditor was censored by the Attorney General who issued a S Auditor General Act Section 37 certificate to censor information provided uh, to the Parliament. Uh, uh, of course, uh, Deputy President Britton Jones found that the Attorney General was just simply wrong 
in, uh, in issuing that, uh, that certificate. Uh, um, uh, that particular question, I've actually, been, I've actually asked it three or four times, the question as to what is, what's the cost associated with that? What's the cost associated to the taxpayer of the Commonwealth resisting, or the government resisting, the provision of um, or, or, or the release of, of information which should have been made available in the public? The second one relates to the costs associated with the National Cabinet. So, just uh, the, you know, the question says, you know, what was the Australian uh, government's uh, solicitor's um, estimate when it was engaged as to what uh, those costs would be to the taxpayer? What were those costs, and um, whether or not the matter or the invoices have been finalised? I actually have had an answer through the estimates process that the National Cabinet matter to date has cost. $107,000. $107,000 went to the AGS to try to defend that particular matter, and I'll come to uh, their performance in relation uh, to that. Um, it follows another FOI answer I got the other day relating to a matter on foot where the government spending has spent $250,000 opposing access to what effectively is one number. Uh, I wonder what the Hawkeye matter will cost. I've asked on several occasions, and uh, on several occasions the answers come back with there have been no the, or the invoices haven't been finalised. I will be raising that with the AGS when I uh, uh, when I uh, see them at estimates, because in actual fact that particular matter is over a year old. So it's hard to believe that they that they haven't properly invoiced that matter. Uh, I think the tally in re in relation to the government opposing access under FOI to me must be coming up to a million dollars. I mean that's shameful. A million dollars, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, that's a guess. But we know, uh, you know, at least it's at least three hundred and fifty thousand dollars. I haven't added up, added up all the other wins that I've had and the costs associated with them. Maybe I should do that. Um, but this is real money. Real money being used to oppose transparency. So just to go to the, the National Cabinet uh, decision, and I know Senator Ayres talked about this, obviously the history of that, uh, that particular matter was that uh, at, in the face of a pandemic, the Prime Minister called together uh, all of the First Ministers, all the Premiers and the uh, Territory Chiefs uh, to conduct a, a, a regular meeting, and no one has any objection to that. That's actually quite a sensible thing to do. The offensive thing that was done was that the Prime Minister, uh, in a, in, you know, consistent with his secrecy obsession, decided to, to, to um, pull uh, the eyes over the Australian public and suggest that it was a committee of the Cabinet. Uh, now, of course, Justice White he did examine this, and he examined it and found that the, um, the, the, the National Cabinet wasn't even established by the Cabinet, the, sorry, the, the, you know, as a committee of, uh, of uh, the federal cabinet wasn't even established by the cabinet. It was actually established by COAG. Uh, Justice White found that uh, there's no co cabinet solidarity. Justice White found that there's no collective responsibility in the national cabinet. Justice White pointed out that uh, there is no um, one single parliament to whom the national cabinet is responsible to. In fact, it's responsible to a whole range of different uh, parliaments and therefore can't be a cabinet. And along the way, uh, it's interesting if people read the decision, they'll see that Justice White was quite frustrated with the approach of the Commonwealth in, um, uh, in the way in which it handled the matter, not putting primary evidence on the record. Um, his view on uh, evidence received from uh, Mr. Gaitchens and Ms. McGregor um, was that it couldn't be relied upon. And in actual fact, it was found that the uh, Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet advanced some facts that turned out not to be facts. On affidavit, they swore certain facts that were not true. And uh, look, counsel for the uh, f for the. Uh, for the, for the Secretary of the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet had to concede that during the proceedings that, in actual fact, they were wrong. 
And that disturbs me, not just from the fact that uh, you know, someone puts on an affidavit something that is not true, but it is the Premier Department in our government. Prime Minister and Cabinet, everyone's supposed to look at Prime Minister and Cabinet and say they set the example. And greatly disappointed in the way in which that particular matter was con conducted. And uh, you know, Senator Ayres is right. In response to that um, very solid judgment by Justice White, there's no room to manoeuvre in relation to that. There is no appeal. You can't appeal what he put in his judgment because it is legally correct. And you know, one of the astounding things. Uh, in the affidavit of um, uh, Mr Gaitchens to the tribunal at some stage was to say that uh, don't worry about all these judicial precedents on what uh, National Cabinet is because we're the authority on it. Now, it really bothers me that the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet think that a word in a statute, i.e. a cabinet or a committee of the cabinet, gets defined by the Prime Minister and not a judicial officer. That's not how it works. Sure, in this place we can provide clarity, but if there's any question as to the meaning of a word in the statute, that is the clear purview, the clear um, decision-making place for the judiciary, not for uh, a uh, department. So, you know, very, very surprising that such a statement was advanced in the context of those proceedings. And in in response to the uh, I think uh, Senator Ayres said the trashing of the argument of the Commonwealth. What have they done? They've introduced a new law. They've introduced a new law, so more costs associated with the taxpayer to try and keep um, matters which are not cabinet matters uh, secret. They've introduced no new laws which, again, as Senator Ayres said correctly, has no friends. I went to the committee hearing and found there were no friends of that bill other than the De Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, Professor Twomey, um, uh, Mr Geoffrey Watson SC, whomever it was that appeared before that committee just rejected that, uh, that partic particular piece of proposed legislation. We've even got um, uh, uh, Senator Rennick committing to cross the floor on that one, and good on him for doing that, for standing up for what is right. Hopefully we'll see some other uh, uh, people who have some loyalty to the courts. Uh, do exactly the same thing if the government dares to even bring it into this place. Um, and then on the back of that, interestingly enough, uh, I spoke to Senator Gallagher the other, uh, the other day about whether or not uh, in the COVID committee, where Prime Minister and Cabinet advanced a public interest immunity claim on the basis of, uh, basis of National Cabinet, whether or not those documents had been returned to the, to the COVID committee. And the answer is no, they haven't. I mean, I know she's looking at that now, but imagine that. We've had a judicial officer rule that the National Cabinet is not a cabinet, and yet uh, we still see the government hanging on to that and denying information to Senator, to Senator Gallagher's committee. I mean, that's just extraordinary. All the, you know, well, it, Senator O'Neill, I actually think you're wrong. It's not a rule unto themselves. It's actually an affront to the rule of law. The separation of powers in our, con in our constitution, where we have an executive, and, you know, we have a parliament, we have an executive, and we have a judiciary, and we must respect the boundaries. And for uh, a judicial member to state that it's not a national cabinet, and then to have uh, departments say, "Well, we're not going to comply with that," it's, it's hugely problematic, hugely problematic. So. Uh, I know you're, you're really in support of me, Senator O'Neill, but you haven't, you haven't properly expressed the gravity of this situation. It's a, it's a, <laughs> it's a, it's a, uh, it's an affront to the way in which our constitution is set out. So, you know, that that's a problem. And uh, I'm simply asking in my question, what was the cost? What, what was the estimate when you went, when the Commonwealth went into the proceedings? People may not know this, but when you engage a lawyer. Uh, to conduct proceedings on your behalf, you are entitled to get an estimate of the costs. I asked what that estimate was. I asked what the, 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 the real cost is and um, uh, asked to make sure whether, whether or not the answer I was going to get was a final answer. So I moved to the other part of the question, which related to the Hawkeye uh, audit. As I said, this is a really strange one. 
First time ever the, the Attorney General censors an Auditor General's report. Now, the Auditor General, skilled in every audit he does, he considers what he's putting in his reports to make sure they don't uh, include information that damages national security or international relations or any commercial interests. He does that day in and day out. And yet, two years ago, three years ago almost, um, the, uh, uh, in fact it was three years ago, the Auditor General tabled a report um, where he's told to censor some information because somehow the Attorney General, Mr Porter, knew better. And uh, uh, of course, uh, the uh, J, uh, JCPAA did an inquiry into this, had a look at the whole matter. And that's what spurred me to seek uh, access to that particular document under FOI. And thankfully, uh, it went from uh, the department who simply do the tick and flick on this is all, this is all confidential to the information commissioner who flicked it onto the AAT straight away because she recognised the complexity of the, the issue. But the matter then was heard by the AAT and, and the AAT uh, found that uh, pretty much all of the redactions that were made by the Attorney General were in fact wrong. They were wrong. They should never have been redacted. Uh, uh, to be accurate, there were a couple of uh, 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 numbers that were redacted, which I agreed might have been sensitive from a commercial perspective uh, and, and did not contest them in, in, the, uh, in the proceedings. Um, one wonders how much that cost. Now, that matter concluded in 2020. So it, it concluded a year ago, and yet there is no answer to this parliament, despite me asking on three occasions what's, what was the cost of that. There's been no answer to this parliament. And I think people are entitled to know how much does the government spend on, f on falsely defending FOI claims. I'm sure not, I'm not the only one that goes through this. I think the government are entitled to know the, the cost of the Prime Minister's secrecy obsession, just as we like to know you know, how much uh, you know, drug addiction costs or alcohol addiction costs, I want to understand what the secrecy addiction of the Prime Minister costs the Australian taxpayer. Uh, and, um, and it's troubling that I simply can't get an answer. So whilst this question is more than 30 days old, it's the third time I've asked it. And each time I've asked it, you know, uh, Perhaps foolishly, I asked for the total cost. Uh, a very sneaky answer is coming back saying, well, we haven't received all the invoices. So I've finally changed the question to say, well, what's the total invoices to date then? And uh, uh, you know, the government's just not ans answering these questions. And they've got to be, they've, they've got to be um, open and transparent to the Australian taxpayer about the costs of these matters, how much they are costing, particularly. You know, I don't know. Maybe. Maybe this particular uh, matter was a favour for Talis and, and they've paid him back through some blind trust. I don't know. I take that back. I'm sure Talis didn't do that. But the, the, the proposition lies. I just don't understand why people are trying to hide the value of all of this. And, uh, and I think uh, the, the minister should uh, see why this question Thank hasn't you, been Senator answered. Senator Patrick, your time has expired. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Patrick be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. We'll now move to motions to take note of answers. Senator Watt. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Uh, I rise to take note of the answer given by Senator Birmingham to the question asked by Senator Gallagher. Well, again in question time today, we saw how hopelessly divided this government is on the question of action on climate change. Just observing the government during the answers that Senator McKenzie gave to a series of questions, and then Senator Birmingham as well, it was patently clear the chasm that stands not just between the National Party and the Liberal Party, but within elements of the National Party and elements of the Liberal Party. Now, I notice Senator Scar is sitting there ready to have his turn speaking. And I'm sure that Senator Scar, as someone who would regard himself as a modern Liberal, would be horrified to hear the views of probably the other two Liberals who are in the chamber, let alone Senator Rennick, the one that they all want to disown. 
Um, and the reaction on the faces from Liberals as they had to listen to Senator McKenzie bang on and on and ramble all around the countryside about the Nationals' position on net zero emissions and climate change. It's no wonder that so many Liberals regard the National Party as the mad uncle who turns up to Christmas lunch. They are so embarrassed by their National Party coalition partners and the resistance that they have put in place year after year to taking action on climate change and to grabbing the economic opportunities and the jobs that await a country like Australia. Because what has become clear over the last few days and was reinforced in question time today is that the National Party have become the anti-jobs party of Australian politics. For years they've been going around crowing and saying how much they care about jobs in regional Australia, ignoring the fact that they have cheered on big mining companies who have casualised their mining workforces, brought labour hire in in droves, undermining wages, undermining working conditions. Uh, Senator Watt, please resume bit sensitive your about casual uh, Senator Scar. Order, Deputy President. On uh, many occasions, you have correctly uh, brought me to order in terms of this section of business to make sure that I can confine my remarks to the actual answers to questions that are the subject of this section. I note that there was no discussion of casualisation of workforce in the mining industry or some of the other matters that Senator Watt is touching upon. So I'd ask you to bring him to order, please. Thank you, Senator Scar. As you know, this is a broad-ranging debate, and I have been listening carefully. And I will remind Senator Watt to uh, take note of the answers given by Senator Birmingham to questions put to him by Senator Gallagher. Thank you, Senator Watt. Please continue. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Well, we always are interested to see how sensitive Liberal and National Party senators from Queensland are when their selling out of mining workers through casualisation and labour hire is raised. And here comes Senator Canavan, the biggest sellout of the lot, of the, lot. the man who likes to grade his fancy dress drawer, put on his coal miner's clothes, smear a bit of dust on his face and then come down to Canberra and sell out those very coal miners by backing in the big co mining companies about casualisation and labour hire year after year. Senator Canavan and the National Party are so worried about jobs in regional Queensland that they have assisted the big coal mining companies to casualise their workforce and bring in labour hire year after year and do nothing about it. Now, in answer to Senator Gallagher's question to Senator, Senator Birmingham, that question was all about the cost of the LNP's plan for dealing with climate change. Now, we already know that that cost involves the thousands of jobs which have already been lost across regional Queensland and regional Australia as a result of this government's failure to put forward policies about climate change and renewable energy. We already have seen thousands of jobs that should be going into places across regional Queensland be sent offshore by the National Party uh, because they just can't come to grips with the present, let alone the future. But what we've also learned over the last few days from comments from various National Party members is that that is not the limit of the cost of the LNP's climate change plan. It's not good enough for the LNP to be sending thousands of jobs offshore rather than seeing them grow in regional Queensland and regional Australia. They also want to put in place a $250, sorry, a $250 billion coal fund. I stumbled over the number because the number is so large. They want to give mining companies $250 billion of taxpayers' money to prop them up. These are profit-making companies that they want to give $250 billion worth of taxpayers' funds to. That is $10,000 for every man, woman and child in Australia that they want to hand over to big profit-making mining companies. Senator Canavan wants to impose a mortgage tax on every Australian to rather than do something positive about creating jobs through renewables. He's been reported in the media as saying that if we just have to jack up mortgages by a few percentage points, that's not a big price to pay. So he wants every man, woman and child in Australia to pay more for their mortgages. And again, Thank Senator you. Scar Senator is embarrassed by Senator his National Party. Senator Scar. In fact, I, I'm, I'm very enamoured with my National Party colleagues, far from embarrassed. But 
Once again, uh, Madam Deputy President, there was no discussion in terms of mortgage, uh, mortgage tax, or taxes on mortgages in the, uh, the last uh, uh, question time, and I do ask you to uh, um, bring Senator Watt to order, or uh, certainly the debate will be extremely broad-ranging over the course of the next 45 minutes. Thank you, Senator Scar. Uh, the question was about net zero, and Senator uh, Watt is talking broadly about climate change and net zero, so he is still within the scope of the question. Senator Watt. Thank you, Madam Deputy Resident. Again, we know the Liberals are sensitive to the National Party's crazy ideas. And finally, what we've learned in the last couple of days is that the Nationals want to have a $20 billion rort fund. They've already got the spreadsheets drawn up in Senator McKenzie's office. They're ready to go, colour coding it all. It's rorts, it's mortgage taxes, it's coal funds, and it's jobs lost across Queensland. Uh, Senator Canavan, are you seeking a point of order? It, well, I was. Um, it's a little redundant now, but Madam Deputy President, well, just draw your attention. Your seat. I do make a point of order. You, you draw uh, your attention to. Senator I don't know if you were watching Canavan, it. please resume your seat. Thank you. I'm going to give the call to Senator Carr. Sen uh, beg your pardon. Sorry, Senator Scar. Senator Scar. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam <coughs> Deputy President. And Senator Watt did indeed uh, broadly range over a number of matters during his uh, contribution to the debate, but did um, try and bring them. Uh, in some way to connect with uh, Senator Gallagher's uh, uh, question of Senator Birmingham. At the outset, can I say there is no greater champion for regional Queensland than Senator Matt Canavan. There is no greater champion for regional Queensland than Senator Canavan. And he is, he is recognised in central Queensland by the people who actually live there, by the people who voted at the last federal election and by the people who voted at last federal election as a champion for that region, for those businesses and for those jobs. For that region, for those businesses and for those jobs. And that's why he's in the position he's in today. And it gives me um, absolutely no surprise whatsoever that Senator Canavan is advocating for the region and advocating for the livelihoods of those Queenslanders who he stands up for every single day. That's what Senator Canavan does, and that's what we expect him to do, and that's what the people of Queensland voted him to do, and what they'll vote for him to do again come the next federal election. I think we've got to look at some facts in terms of this debate around climate change and uh, net zero. Uh, the fact of the matter is that Australia's emissions are at their lowest level since 1990. Emissions in 2020 were more than 20 per cent lower than 2005, which is the benchmark time baseline under the Paris Agreement. Since 2005, Australia has reduced our emissions faster than Canada, Japan, New Zealand and the USA. We are on track to beat our 2030 Paris target of reducing emissions by 26 to 28 per cent, and on a per-person basis. That's a reduction of 48 to 49 per cent. And we've done that. We've done that on the basis of a policy which is technology, not taxes. Technology, not taxes. Technology, not taxes. And that is the pathway forward. That's the responsible pathway forward for the Australian government and for the Australian economy. Technology, not taxes. You will not see this government. You will not see this government adopt an overly ambitious, reckless, reckless plan, reckless target, I should say, without a plan for 2030, which will cost jobs in our regions, decimate our regions. You will not see that coming from this side of the chamber. And one of the reasons you won't see that coming from this side of the chamber is because of people like Senator Matt Canavan and because of the National Party representing their constituents in regional Australia. What you will see, what you will see is a reasonable, proportionate response to the realities of the world. That's what you will see, reasonable and proportionate. And there is no doubt that the world is changing in terms of its demand for its energy sources. So it's fit and proper. It is absolutely fit and proper that the government prudently and soberly consider a long-term a long-term plan in relation to net emissions. And as part of that plan, as part of that plan, you only have to look at our technology roadmap to see what needs to be part and parcel of it. It includes appropriate investment in terms of industries such as the hydrogen industry, blue hydrogen, green hydrogen. We have to work with our trading partners, and there are great Japanese and Korean partners who are engaging today 
Yesterday, over the last 12 months, with great Australian companies in relation to hydrogen investment in this country, and that's the pathway. That's the pathway where we can achieve, we can achieve milestones in the longer term in a prudent fashion. And at the same time, at the same time, our coal industry, where we produce some of the best quality thermal coal in the world, will continue to supply coal power plants in our region. At the same time, our gas industry. The Gladstone LNG project and other great gas projects will continue, continue to provide energy sources to the world and continue to do that effectively based on the efforts, the enterprise of great Queenslanders and great Queensland companies. We are having a debate on this side of the chamber, and the National Party is an important part of that debate, as are all of the views and, and considerations put forward by members of, of the Liberal Party. And they will be considered, they'll be considered soberly, and at the end of that process we'll have a reasoned, proportionate plan tied to a target. It won't be a, re a, reckless, a reckless proposal which will hurt regional Queensland and hurt regional Australia. It will be considered and it will be based on technology. Technology advances, not taxes. Technology, not taxes. Thank you, Senator Skye. Your time has expired. Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy President. And, uh, I rise to take note of answers um, of Minister Birmingham to the question asked by Senator Gallagher, who is uh, still here in the chamber. And, uh, sometimes my, my breath is just taken away by the crazy statements that I hear coming from those who have been in government for eight years, eight years already, three terms in government, 493 weeks they have had to have the kind of the, the debate that Senator Scars just said, we are having a debate in this House on this side of the chamber. After 493 weeks, 21 energy policies, they are on the cusp of the 22nd and they are still having a debate. That's not leadership. That's a joke. It's a joke. Senator Birmingham, in his defence of this failure in climate policy, has actually commenced his answer here in the chamber this afternoon in response to Senator Gallagher by saying, we will not leave regional and rural communities behind. Well, I've, I've got news for him. He's left them behind. For those 493 weeks, they know they have been left behind, and they know that they are being taken for granted by this National Party set of representatives that come to Canberra, who are here to look after themselves and have jettisoned the good interests of the people of regional Australia, who are dying at a higher rate than their, uh, their cousins in the city because they have no access to proper GPs or any health care. The regions are well and truly left behind by this government that does not deserve another term. And if there's anything that the last three years of the Morrison government have taught us is the Prime Minister is prepared to spend any amount of taxpayer dollars to keep his spot in the lodge. But he's a miser when it comes to NDIS staffing levels. He's a miser when he refused to reintroduce JobKeeper during the most recent lockdowns when businesses across the great state of New South Wales that I represent were getting absolutely slammed. But when it comes to buying voters or buying the compliance of his coalition partner, Mr Morrison has shown that he's willing to spend as much as $20 billion to try and keep this rabble that considers itself the Australian government loosely cobbled together. $20 billion. That's the reported sum that it's going to cost the taxpayers of Australia in order for the Nationals to stay in the cart with Mr Morrison. Finally, by being bought off despite their continuing ignoring of the science and their failure to, black, to back climate change. This should all have been figured out eight years ago. We've had eight long years of government. And here, at two minutes to midnight, uh, with the horses bolting off to Glasgow, we've got $20 billion of discussion underway because Mr Morrison's found he actually can't work with his coalition partners and he's going to buy them off. And Greece, the election, the re-election of his government, 
by billions and billions of dollars to buy votes. Now, farmers throughout New South Wales have struggled through adverse weather, bushfires, tornadoes, droughts, all caused by the rapidly changing climate. The National Party have continued to bury their heads in the sand, while farmers and agricultural business owners and investors in that sector in Australia have actually seen what's going on and have tried to get this out-of-touch National Party rump on board with reality. Senator Mackenzie's in here saying, oh, it's great, we've had a 75-year effective partnership with the Liberal Party. Well, this is not a partnership. It's a debacle. And it's delivered for Australia what Senator Mackenzie described today as the poorest people in the country, the most marginalised people, the most vulnerable. 75 years of a supposed partnership, it sounds more like a, a toxic relationship, is not delivering for the people of Australia. And $20 billion of good Australian taxpayer-funded um, money should not be invested in some sort of fanciful way to appease the National Party, who don't even represent the people of the nation who live beyond the Great Dividing Range. They've sold their votes in an easy lie rather than face Thank the you, hard Senator truths. Senator O'Neill, your time has expired. Just before I call you, Senator Canavan, could all senators please make sure their phones are completely turned off or onto silence? Senator Canavan. Thank you, um, uh, uh, Madam Deputy President. Um, well, as a, as a senator in the, from the Nationals Party here today, there's a, there's a lot of people upset with us. Uh, geez, we, we are not flavour of the month down here in Canberra uh, today. We get everybody's at us. The, the press are all over us. We're doing all these terrible, evil things. And I suppose my message back to the, the people of, of, of Central and North Queensland is um, that's the way I like it. That's the way I like it. If, uh, if we're doing things that making, are making people down here in Canberra upset, we're probably doing something good for you. Because I tell you what, down here in Canberra, the people down here in Canberra are not on your side. They're not on your side. They're always trying to find ways to kill your job, to take away your industries, uh, to deny opportunities for people in regional Australia. So, so you can take it as a given. You can take it as a given that if people in Canberra are upset with the Nationals Party, the Nationals Party are fighting for you. That's that is the that is the test. That's the test. And I boy, boy, are we meeting that test this week? Everybody is angry with us. Everybody is upset with us. And as I say, that is the way I like it because I don't come to this place to make friends. I don't come down to Canberra, leave my family, have to go back through quarantine now. The way it works, I don't do those things to make friends in Canberra. That's not why I'm here. Other people might be interested in doing that. I don't care. I don't care that the restaurants aren't open or haven't been open here in Canberra because I don't care about making friends. I'm here to fight for people's jobs. I'm here to fight for pe the people's futures. I'm here so that families in central and north Queensland can have a future for their children working and living where they live. I don't want people's kids to have to move to a capital city just to get a job. That's why I fought for the Adani mine. There are 2,000 people working at that mine right now. It's about to export coal into a market, into a market that is absolutely desperate for coal right now. So let's judge people on how good they have been at predicting things the last few years, because we were all told a few years ago that the Adani mine had no commercial case, that it was never going to happen. Uh, that it was going to all be robots. Do you remember that, Senator Roberts? Robots. There were going to be robots, or Indians maybe, sometimes, uh, working as mine. We'll go out to Carmichael now. When, when has any Labor senator turned up there? Go out and we'll meet the 2,000 people who have a job thanks to the fight and effort that we put in. And that's what I and many of my Nationals colleagues are continuing to do here. Because we learned today, we learned today that this whole idea that we should sign up to net zero is actually because the US and UK want us to do it. That's, that's apparently why we've got to do it. We didn't get a vote. I mean, I, I was a lot of concerns about the US presidential election last year, but there were apparently there were allegations of dead people voting, other people voting. There were no allegations that Australians voted. I don't think anybody here got a vote. But apparently now, because the US wants us to do it, we've got to do it too. Well, I don't know if that's true. I don't know if that's true. But what I do know is that signing up to net zero would be a massive sellout of Australia's interests, a massive sellout of our interests. Because 
how would we build anything anymore under a net zero target? How are we going to build another Adani mine? Given the demand for coal is through the roof, everybody wants our coal. There is more coal out there in the Galilee Basin. There are another five mines that would employ another 15,000 people if we had the guts to open them up. How are they going to do that if we sign up to a net zero target? Because they will. What will happen? We all have seen this before. Senator Ferravanti, Wells, I'm not saying anything about uh, your, 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 your um, heritage here, but you've been here a while. You've been here a while. You know how it works here in Canberra. If we set a net zero target, we will weaponise the bureaucracy here in Canberra, who is not on your side. And they will take an inch, take an inch, and run a mile. And anyone who wants to build a mine in this country need not apply because they'll have to offset all their emissions. They'll have to offset them all. What does that mean? They have to pay people to plant trees or do other things uh, to to go back to zero, to get to this net zero. Now, when they have to pay that, guess what? That is a tax. That will mean a tax on every mine built in this country. It'll mean a tax on every dam built in this country because farming creates emissions too. It does. It'll be, there'll be a tax. There'll be a tax even on airports. If you want to build an airport in the Great Barrier Reef and open up a new island for tourism, that will attract a tax. Already, overseas courts have stopped in the UK have stopped airports because the UK government signed up to net zero. That has happened. That has happened. And that is about to be our future. Our future is about to be what the UK is getting right now which is petrol lines, energy shortages. They can't even feed themselves because guess what? Guess what? In the ultimate irony, they don't have enough carbon dioxide. They're running out of carbon dioxide because you need gas to make that and they now get all their gas from Putin who's not giving it to them. This is madness and we should put a stop to it. Thank you, Senator Canavan. Senator Green. Oh, thank you, Deputy President. It's always a pleasure to um, uh, proceed uh, to, go, to speak after mortgage tax Matt Canavan and talk about North Queensland and Central Queensland. It's where I have spent the last couple of weeks uh, before coming back to Canberra. I've been in Gladstone, Emerald, Townsville, Mackay, all the way up to Bamaga and Cape York and, of course, uh, my hometown of Cairns. In Gladstone, they're talking about hydro. They're talking about hydrogen, and in Townsville, they're talking about the minerals that you need to power renewable energy. Of course, in Cairns, we already have hydroelectric um, uh, power uh, and renewable energy projects. These people over here don't stand up for the regions. They're not standing up for the national interest. They're not listening to what people are saying in regional Queensland, because if they were, they would understand that people in regional Queensland want the job opportunities that will come from making a decision and a plan around net zero. It is the self-interest that drives the National Party. It's the self-interest that drives the Liberal National Party in Queensland. Because we know that the job opportunities that we are losing because this government has failed to back renewables in re regional Queensland are going missing. They're going overseas. Those jobs are going overseas. People in Queensland are missing out on those jobs because this government has failed to deliver a plan and a target for net zero. And we're not talking about hypotheticals here. The government literally vetoed a wind farm in far north Queensland, which cre would create 250 jobs. They stood in the way of 250 jobs because it was against the government's energy policy to create jobs in renewable energy. And we know that the increase in insurance prices, the increase in severe weather events, drought and rising sea levels, that's all going to happen in regional Queensland. It's happening right now. And the impact on the Great Barrier Reef and the jobs that rely on the reef are also in regional Queensland. So when you've got these people over here talking about the fact that they stand up for the regionals, regional areas of our country, what they really mean is they stand up for themselves. They stand up for their own political interests, and we've seen that time and time again. But what we expect from our government is to govern for our whole country, and a pathway to net zero is significant for every Australian, no matter where you live. But the past eight weeks has shown us that uh, the past eight years have shown us that in Scott Morrison, we don't have a leader who is willing to fight for this. He's weak and unable to act in the national interest. He's more interested in making hollow announcements than actually delivering when things are tough. And what about the backbone of these so-called moderate liberals who aren't prepared to step up and show any leadership? Where are they on this? Well, I'll tell you where they were 
about half an hour ago, they were voting with the Nationals against net zero. They've always sat next to them in Parliament. They've always voted with them. They're in government with them. They're in cahoots with them. And they're still so silent on this such important issue. The pantomime of the last few weeks and the last eight years has been about avoiding responsibility and accountability in every corner of this government. You see, it's quite cute, isn't it? The Nats pretend that they aren't even members of the government, so they're not responsible or accountable for the fact that after eight years, Australia has no climate policy. They're in Cabinet. We've got the Deputy Prime Minister. There's ministers in the National Party, but it's not up to them to govern the country. And then we've got the Liberals on this side, who conveniently are able to pretend that they're not responsible for the Nationals. So it's nothing to do with them, that they're not responsible or accountable for the fact that there hasn't been a climate policy for the last eight years. They are in government. The Liberals and the Nationals are in government. The Prime Minister is the leader of the government. But according to him, it's not up to him to lead the country. Minister Angus Taylor said today, the Nationals' interest is aligned with the interests of the Liberal Party, but the problem is that neither is interested in the national interest. After eight long years of this Liberal national government, we still have no climate policy. And it's clear whatever deal gets cut, whatever $20 billion pork barrel fund gets created, the only way to fix this mess the only way to get action on climate change is to get rid of Scott Morrison and his entire government, the Liberal National Government, at the next election. Thank you, Senator Green. And I do remind you to refer to those in the other place by their correct title. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Watt to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Waters. Thanks, Deputy President. I rise to take note of the response to my question uh, to the Foreign Minister. The, the UN Climate Summit in Glasgow is coming up in a matter of weeks. Australia is being left behind. I asked the Foreign Minister why is Australia keeping company with petro states like Russia when so many other nations have, agree have agreed to strengthen their 2030 targets. The US, the UK, the EU, Canada, South Africa, Norway, South Korea, Japan, Argentina, Chile, Colombia, Kenya, the United Arab em Emirates and so many others. And yet this government is allowing um, this pathetic Nationals junior coalition partner to dictate their climate policy. And they're having a squabble about 2050 while the rest of the world is talking about 2030 and while the science is saying we need strong 2030 targets, it is the ultimate coalition response to be talking about something that is irrelevant and 30 years out of date when in fact we need to be talking about strengthening our 2030 targets if we are to avoid climate catastrophe. Uh, now, the science says we've got to triple our targets here in Australia to have any hope of meeting that one and a half degree aspiration from the Paris Climate Summit. Now that means we could save what's left of the Great Barrier Reef. We could protect our farmland from worse extreme weather events and more drought. We could protect our people from uh, more severe and more frequent bushfires. But this mob are too in hoc to the big mining and the coal and the gas industries uh, to actually take the science seriously. Now I. I <laughs> asked the uh, minister why, when the International Energy Agency says we can't have a single new coal, oil or gas infrastructure opened if we want to stick with one and a half degrees, why, according to the Department of Industry, is there 72 new major coal projects proposed in Australia and 44 major gas projects planned? in the coming years. How on earth are you going to stick with a net zero target for 2050 with new coal, oil and gas happening? What an absolute farce. They're having this dangerous distraction about 2050 while they use public money to open up more coal, oil and gas, meanwhile ignoring the science on the table that says 2030 is what we need to tackle. We need strong science-based targets. Shame on this government. I cannot wait to see the back of them. Thank you. Senator Waters. So the question is: the motion moved by Senator Waters to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. We'll now move to. Oh, beg your pardon, Senator Roberts. Take the rest of the time that um, the green. Two minutes the... twenty, certainly. Thank you. I move to take note of Senator Colbeck's answer to my question. 
As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I have a duty to ensure reasoned and accurate debate in this chamber. The minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck, has the same duty to ensure data central to reasoned and informed debate is made public. For many years, following the standardisation of mortality reporting between the states, mortality data has been made available six weeks after the period to which it relates. The latest mortality data covers the period to 30th of June 2021. It's now October 18th. Suddenly, and without explanation, data is being held back 15 weeks. The minister should have been prepared for this question. My question on notice number 3970 has been outstanding for 12 weeks. The data to June 30th shows deaths in Australia in 2021 are above the seven-year moving average and consistently above anything we have ever seen before in this country. It's troubling that New South Wales and Queensland no longer make this information public. In the absence of Australian mortality data, I'll quickly reference official British data which shows an increase in deaths among 15 to 17-year-olds of 20 per cent following the start of vaccination of that cohort, trending towards 25 per cent at, at younger ages down to four. More worrying is that this distribution is not even. The mortality rate deaths among boys was up 28 per cent and amongst girls 8 per cent. This may result from one of the 268 known adverse interactions between COVID vaccines and other prescription drugs documented by the United States FDA. Logic would dictate that before giving a patient a COVID vaccine, one could check to see what drugs they're already using and what a natural immunity they may have resulting from a previous COVID injection. I don't think the 33 Bunnings stores in Queensland that offered vaccinations to the public last weekend asked for any of that information. I'm concerned this parliament's reckless vaccination crusade is killing people. Sadly, this government and this parliament is neither prudent nor caring. Our community and nation deserve better. Release the data. Thank you, Senator Roberts. So the question is that the motion moved by Senator Roberts to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. So we'll now move to notices of motion to be given for another day. Oh, Senator Fiavanti Wells. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. On behalf of the Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation, I give notice of my intention at the giving of notices on the next day of sitting to withdraw notices of motion proposing the disallowance of 25 legislative instruments as set out in the list I have provided to the clerk. I advise the chamber that the list will be circulated to senators with today's notices. Thank you, uh, Senator Fiavanti. Well, are there any other notices of motion that you given for another day? No, there being none. Um, I shall now proceed to the placing of business. Is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? Senator McGrath. Thank you, Deputy President. On behalf of the Chair of the Joint Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade, Senator Fawcett, I seek leave to move a motion to enable the committee to meet during the sitting of the Senate today. Is leave granted? I move that the Joint Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade be authorised to hold a private meeting otherwise than in accordance with Standing Order 33-1 during the sitting of the Senate today from 3.30 p.m. I'll just uh, move that. So, so the question at is that the motion is moved by Senator McGrath be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator McGrath. I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence for senators. Is leave granted? Being no objection, leave is granted. I move that leave of absence be granted for personal reasons from 18 to 21 October 2021. Senators Antic, Askew, Fawcett, Hanson, Lambie, Macdonald and McMahon on account of state COVID-19 travel restrictions and Senators Dunham, Griff, Henderson and McLaughlin for personal reasons. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator McGrath be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. I move that leave of absence be granted to the following senators. Senators Billick, Mariel Smith, McCarthy, Kitching, Stirl, Dodson and Brown for 18th to the 21st of October for personal reasons. So the question is that motion is moved by Senator Urquhart be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator McKim. 
Thank you, Deputy President. I seek, to leave, uh, seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator McKim. Thank you, Deputy President. I move that leave of absence be granted to the following senators: Senators Wish Wilson and Steele John, for from the 18th to the 21st of October for personal reasons. Thank you, Senator McKim. So the question is: the motion is moved by Senator McKim to be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, no. The ayes have it. I call the clerk. Postponement notifications have been lodged as follows. Senator Patrick's manner of privilege number one for today postponed to the 19th of October. Senator Rice's business of the Senate number three for today postponed to the 19th of October. Senator Wish Wilson's business of the Senate number four for today postponed to the 20th of October. And Senator Patrick's business of the Senate number five for today postponed to the 25th of November. And committees have lodged extension notifications as indicated at item 17 on today's order of business. Thank you. Uh, we're now moving to uh, matter number 18. Pursuant to order, agreed on the 2nd of. Are you seeking the call, Senator McAllister? No. Uh, pursuant to order, agreed on the 2nd of September, the Senate will now proceed to the consideration of two disallowance motions. I call the clerk. Business of the Senate notices a motion number one and two, standing in the names of Senator, Senators McKim and Brown, respectively for the disallowance of Section 7 of the Australian Renewable Energy Agency implementing the Technology Investment Roadmap Regulations 2021. Senator McAllister. Thank you very much, Deputy President. Well, I move the motion on behalf of Senators McKim and Brown. Madam Deputy President, Labor is proud to have created the Australian Renewable Energy Agency arena in 2012. And we did that to support the technologies that are building our future energy system and creating jobs for the future. We invested $2.5 billion in ARENA in 2012, and those opposite, those opposite have consistently, every day since, tried to gut it, tried to abolish it, tried to undermine the integrity of ARENA every single day for eight years. Now, it's the lead up to COP. A little bit of pressure. Royal family not so happy about the behaviour of Mr Morrison and his climate denying government. And so now, to make up for all of this, for the complete failure to have any kind of energy policy, any time kind of climate policy of any meaning for eight years, we hear those opposite parroting the achievements made by this same agency, the achievements by Arena. This is the agency they tried to abolish and undermine. So now they're trying to make all the right sounds, talk about their climate ambition in the lead up to the COP. But let's pay attention to their actions. Because nowhere are their intentions clearer than in their attempts to use our renewable energy agencies to fund pet fossil fuel projects and their willingness to circumvent the law to do so. It's important to note how we got here. The government, desperate to again undermine our clean energy agencies, introduced a bill in February to make the Clean Energy Finance Corporation invest in fossil fuels. The government deserted this legislation because their coalition partner, Mr Joyce, in fact, one upped them, ambushing the government with his own amendment for the CEFC to fund not only gas but coal too. And then his colleagues in the Senate adding nuclear to their list of desires. Now, we haven't seen this legislation since. It has disappeared, chucked into the ever-growing pile of failed policies in climate and energy under this government. And that's where this arena regulation comes in, because not content to try and undermine the integrity of our clean energy funding bodies, the Prime Minister and Minister Taylor also wanted to do it without the scrutiny of parliament without debate. And so they attempted to change the remit of the Australian Renewable Energy Agency to fund non-renewable technologies without even passing necessary legislation. After having the first set of dubious arena regulations disallowed by the Senate in June this year, the government remade the regulations in another attempt to avoid scrutiny and undermine arena. Now, these concerns weren't just held by Labor, the crossbench and numerous stakeholders. 
the government-led committee, the scrutiny of delegated legislation committee, raised its concerns about whether these regulations were lawful. And they raised those concerns with Minister Taylor. And after the minister provided further information to the committee, the committee once again, chaired, I remind you, by Minister Taylor's own Liberal Party colleague, has recommended that the regulation be disallowed. In fact, the committee itself intends to give notice of motion to disallow. That's right. So we have a Liberal-led committee notifying its intention to disallow the government's own regulation. The committee says this, they retain significant concerns regarding the instrument. They said they were unable to resolve these technical scrutiny concerns with the minister. Well, the committee takes issue with the similarities between this regulation and the earlier regulation that they disallowed, that this Senate has already disallowed. And they highlight that while not identical, they say this, both instruments permit ARENA to invest in non-renewable technologies. And they go on to say this issue is ultimately a matter that could only be resolved by judicial consideration. Most significantly, though, the committee finds that the regulation expands the remit of ARENA beyond what was envisaged by Parliament when the Act was passed. And to quote directly, the purpose of the ARENA Act is made clear in the title of the Act itself. That is the Australian Renewable Energy Agency Act. And the committee said this, the interpretation that would best achieve the purpose or the object of the Act is one that limits the function of the arena to investing in renewable energy technologies. Well, it's not rocket science, is it? The Renewable Energy Agency is there to invest in renewable energy. It is not a slush fund for the Prime Minister or for Minister Taylor. Now, this parliament has seen all manner of scrutiny, transparency and due process eroded under the current Prime Minister. And as we debate this today, I call on senators to think about this, to stand up for the chamber that we sit in and the people that we represent in heeding the committee's recommendation to disallow. This committee, the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation Committee, is a critical committee for here, us here in the Senate, helping provide much needed checks and balances on a government as an upper house in a democracy should. The findings of the committee vindicate the Senate in its disallowance of the first iteration of this regulation in June. The Senate has never rejected a recommendation from this committee that an instrument should be disallowed. In fact, this matter is so serious and the regulation is so egregious that it is very rare for a committee to make this recommendation. But it's very clear what we're being advised. If you seek to expand the remit of ARENA's functions, then this is something that you must do through legislation. You can't circumvent that. That's the reason we have a parliament. It's the reason we elect representatives to a parliament, to vote on legislation. A little trip down memory lane reminds us of why those opposite are trying to circumvent the parliament and their own party room on energy legislation. We had a national energy guarantee, of course, the first possibly bipartisan policy on energy in a long time. But Minister Taylor was critical in killing that off, along with its champion, then Prime Minister Turnbull, just a couple of years ago. More recently, we had the CFC fiasco, and that was, of course, crowed about for all the important new investment and grid reliability it would deliver. But that's disappeared from the House of Representatives entirely. So instead of debating all of this on the floor of the parliament, trying to settle an energy policy here in the place where we should settle it, the government decided that its own internal divisions were so difficult to manage and should take priority over the proper democratic process of decision-making. It's just more sneaky tricks. It is a sneaky government that, instead of developing a climate policy ahead of COP26, develops an advertising campaign instead. Those opposite like to say that this is about the cost of solar going down and so ARENA needs to broaden its remit. Well, absolutely, the cost of solar in Australia has gone down. 
in no small part thanks to the commercialisation and innovation work that was done by ARENA. And we want to see ARENA keep doing this work across a number of other clean technologies to hasten emissions reduction and create jobs. But ARENA does much more than solar and wind already, and it is dishonest of those opposite to characterise it otherwise. ARENA is already working to accelerate the adoption of hydrogen, creating opportunities for hydrogen export to lock in Australia's rightful place as an energy exporter well into the future. ARENA has been critical of backing mines in regional Australia to increase their use of renewables and, in turn, cut down their running costs. ARENA invests in bioenergy, getting gas out of landfills to create power for tens of thousands of homes. They invest heavily in the grid, including transmission, storage and batteries, ensuring stability as the uptake of renewables increase and households and industries seek to cut the cost of their power bills. There are many other technologies that ARENA can and does invest in. Any suggestion otherwise is dishonest and just more sneaky tricks from the government trying to get our renewable agencies to fund fossil fuels. Labor created ARENA in 2012. We will always protect it. Because it has maintained its integrity, it's been able to provide jobs for Australians and deliver returns on investment for taxpayers. We don't need sneaky tricks in this place to fiddle with it, and I urge senators to support the disallowance. Uh, thank you, Senator McAllister. Senator Stoker. Um, thank you very much. I seek leave to make a short contribution. Uh, it's very short. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Um, if successful, this motion will stall funding for critical projects that will implement the government's technology investment roadmap. Expanding ARENA's mandate will reduce emissions while creating jobs in projects including healthier soils, hydrogen, low emissions aluminium and steel production, and carbon capture and storage. Developing these technologies is critical to any serious attempt to reduce emissions while supporting our traditional industries. ARENA has welcomed the expanded mandate along with extensive support from industry and climate organisations. The Business Council of Australia reiterated their support for the expanded mandate just last week. The continued opposition to this regulation is bad for jobs, bad for emissions reduction and bad policy. Senator Waters. Deputy President, and, uh, I rise to speak on this disallowance of a regulation by this government to try to force a renewable energy agency to give money to fossil fuels. Now, honestly, if it wasn't so serious, it would be hilarious. But this isn't the first time they've tried to do this. It's like Groundhog Day. We were here in June and we got the numbers to knock off this dodgy attempt to force ARENA, the Renewable Energy Agency, to fund carbon capture and storage and gas. Now, thankfully, the reason uh, we managed to knock off that dodgy attempt was thanks to the support of One Nation at the time, who rightly formed the view that when these big gas companies aren't actually paying the tax that they're meant to pay, they shouldn't be getting extra public handouts. Now, that situation hasn't changed. These big gas companies are still renowned for avoiding uh, their tax obligations, and yet they still have their handout for public funds. So I'm hopeful um, and expect that we will again say to the government, no, you can't force a renewable energy agency to fund gas and uh, so-called carbon capture and storage so that you can keep polluting business as usual. But we'll see how we go on the vote uh, just shortly to come. Now, it's also very interesting timing, isn't it? Because we're on the eve of Glasgow and we have the whole world many, many, many nations talking about increasing their 2030 targets. And we have our Australian government completely out of touch with the community, out of touch with the science, um, out of touch with many in the business community, all of whom are calling for strong 2030 targets. This mob are having a little spat with their coalition partner about a date that's almost 30 years in the future, where none of them will still be in parliament. Um, and they're avoiding talking about the real issue of 2030. But what's worse, today the first piece of legislation that they brought on to this chamber after a six-week break 
was legislation to allow the Export Finance Agency to give more public money to fossil fuels. You might be sensing a theme here. This is what they do. They want to use taxpayer dollars to either fund their own re-elections, because they keep rotting all of these, uh, these community funds, or they want to simply give it to fossil fuel companies uh, with no strings attached and without making sure that those companies pay their fair share of tax. So I'm very hopeful that the Senate will again disallow this attempt, this dodgy attempt by this dodgy government to force the Renewable Energy Agency to give money to carbon capture and storage and to gas. The clue is in the name, Renewable Energy Agency. And it's an important point because most people might realise that when you have a piece of legislation that says this is a body to fund renewable energy, you can't actually have a piece of delegated legislation like we're seeking to disallow today that goes beyond the powers of the HEAD Act. So, in fact, it's arguable that this uh, attempt by government is ultra vires or beyond power. And it's not just us that think that, it's many lawyers. It's also the government's own scrutiny of delegated legislation committee, who in this place, and I was sitting here when I heard the speech and the, uh, the chair of that committee speak to this piece of delegated legislation, said that the committee had significant concerns, that it was against the law for the government to seek to do this because the parameters of the legislation are about renewable energy. They're not about gas. They're not about carbon capture and storage. So here is the government's own committee saying, you're potentially breaking the law here, folks, and it's very telling, isn't it, that this government is so desperate to give more public money to fossil fuels that they'll break the law to do it. So I hope that the chamber takes the same decision today as they did last time and sees the wisdom of stopping this government giving more handouts to big polluting companies that don't even pay their tax. Honestly, you just couldn't make this stuff up. I've mentioned already that the scrutiny of regulations uh, and delegated legislation uh, committee chair has said that this is beyond power. The parliamentary library has also agreed that there's no way they could see no way that this regulation can be lawfully made. Uh, there's a, a barrister, Fiona McLeod, has provided some legal advice saying on multiple fronts this piece of delegated legislation was unlawful. Um, so not only is this bad policy, it is unlawful policy. Um, unfortunately, this isn't the first time that the government has sought to give public money to fossil fuels. Um, we saw that the uh, Beedaloo, uh fund that was announced several months ago was an attempt yet again to give $50 million to gas companies <coughs> to open up the Beedaloo Basin in the Northern Territory against the wishes of First Nations owners of that land, against the wishes of the farming community in that area who are desperately worried about their groundwater and have very good reason to be so worried, against the wishes of all of the climate scientists, including the Energy, International Energy Agency, which says you can't open up new coal or gas or we're going to absolutely blow any chance of keeping our climate targets. Against all of that advice, this government is giving $50 million uh, to open up the Beedaloo Basin for gas fracking. So that's just yet another example of the fossil fuel cosy relationship that this government um, has sewn up. We saw today's piece of legislation to do the same, and now we have a further regulation by this coal addicted and gas addicted government um, to, to tip yet more taxpayer money, good money after bad. Now we were in the room when this legislation was created. Um, uh, we were in the room negotiating this legislation back in 2011, the Renewable Energy Agency legislation. And Martin Ferguson, Mr. Martin Ferguson, was the responsible minister at the time. Um, that was before he left Parliament to become the chair of the gas lobby. Um, but we weren't going to give him an inch, and so we ensured that this legislation was drafted tightly. And that's exactly why this regulation today is beyond power. It is unlawful, and I think in future it would be used as a textbook example of uh, an unlawful use of executive power or an attempted un uh, use of unlawful executive power. Um, if, if you want to waste money on a lawyer's picnic, this regulation, if, it, if it's not disallowed today, and I hope it will be because I hope that those same arguments still apply, but if, if, um, if this regulation stands today, it will go to court. There are many people who have said that they will challenge this. What a waste of money and time to spend more time arguing about this in court when we could just stop it today. 
We could just say to the government, once again, like we did in June, you can't make the Renewable Energy Agency give money to coal and gas. Find another community fund that you're going to rort. Don't use this one. Sadly, I'm sure that they probably will find another fund because it's just how they roll. Sports rorts one and two, urban congestion fund, building better regions. Oh goodness, the list. I mean, I've got a piece of paper and it goes on two two sides. The number of uh, community uh, uh, electorate funds that have been rorted by this government. So I'm sure they'll have other ways of tipping money into the fossil fuel sector, but they shouldn't be using the Renewable Energy Agency to do it. So one final uh, plea to this chamber to stand firm, just like we did in June, where you shouldn't be letting big gas companies get more public money when they're not even paying their own uh, tax obligations. I hope that that argument remains persuasive and that, once again, we can stop this government attempting to prop up the fossil fuel sector uh, while simultaneously taking generous donations with the other hand. Pretty good return on investment there. Um, I haven't done the figures for a couple of years on just how much um, grants and handouts they get versus how much donations uh, are received by this government, but it was looking like a pretty healthy return on investment when I last looked about two years ago. We can stop this here today, and I urge those in the chamber whose vote will be crucial in determining this outcome uh, to make sure that we get the same outcome as last time and we knock off this dodgy, uh, ultra-virus delegated legislation that would tip more taxpayer money into big corporate pockets that don't even pay their tax. Thank you, Senator Waters. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. The core issue here is integrity. We see the Nationals Party and the Liberals Party tying themselves in knots, the coalition unravelling, according to some, the coalition all over the place, according to others. depends who we listen to. But the core issue is a complete lack of integrity from the Labor Party and the Greens. This parliament says, according to Senator McAllister, has seen all manner of scrutiny. Oh, really? I can remember Senator Macdonald up here standing Senator, Senator Ian Macdonald, when he was a senator here, standing up saying that this parliament has never, ever debated the climate science. Never. So this is all being done on nonsense. The fact the science has never even been brought into this chamber that says we need to cut carbon dioxide from human activity, that we need to go to renewables. Never. Always the parliament in, tends to go to the second question. How do we do it rather than should we do it? The core question, if we're really being faithful to and serving the, the people of this country and the taxpayers and the energy users who are being bled dry, is should we do this madness, not how do we do it? How do we do it comes second. The parliament too often in this country goes to the second question. No one no one has ever presented the empirical scientific evidence in this parliament, either house, that says carbon dioxide from human activity needs to be cut. It is now day 770 since I asked Senator Richard Di Natale and Senator Larissa Waters a fundamental question. Where is your empirical scientific evidence that shows carbon dioxide from human activity needs to be cut? That's it. They dodged it. They have never come back with the evidence. They refuse to debate me. I asked Senator Waters this more than 10 years ago, almost 11 years ago. In fact, it is 11 years ago this month. And she refused to debate me then. Senator Waters then talks about a waste of money. Oh, really? When we're spending $19 billion a year on this rubbish destroying our energy sector, destroying manufacturing jobs, exporting them to China. We send them our coal, they generate electricity using our coal after we've shipped it thousands of kilometres, and they sell it for eight cents a kilowatt hour. We use the same coal here in this country, some of the best coal in the world, and we sell our electricity at 25 cents a kilowatt hour. Why the difference? Why is it three times as much here? because of all the renewable regulations, subsidies and climate rubbish. That's why. Not only do we export our coal, we export our manufacturing jobs because the number one cost of electricity of manufacturing these days is electricity. 
Not labour anymore, electricity. We're gutting jobs, throwing people on the scrap heap, no livelihoods, for nothing. Because no one has ever presented the science that says we need to do this. They run from it. In One Nation, we welcome the debate. We welcome a debate on the science. We will welcome putting both coalitions, the Liberal Nationals and the Labor Greens coalitions, under scrutiny. The policies of the Liberal Nationals coalition are so close to the policies of the Labor Greens coalitions. Where's the difference, I ask you, other than in slightly in degree? This is an absolute disgrace with what we're doing to this country, what this parliament is doing to this country, what this parliament is doing to the taxpayers, what this parliament is doing to jobs of real people, everyday Australians, jobs getting gutted. And it's based on a lie. And Al Gore is making out like a bandit because the crook has made hundreds of millions of dollars out of this scam, along with several other people, academics, politicians, government agencies. It just goes on and on and on. This has got to stop. Uh, thank you, Senator Roberts. Um, Senator Rice, I'll just let you know that there's just a few minutes remaining. Yep. Thank you. We seem to be living in a parallel universe here. We've got a government that wants to be putting more money into fossil fuels, more money into polluting our atmosphere, more money for destroying our climate, more money for helping to exacerbate the climate crisis. The planet is on fire. Climate crisis is the most existential problem facing humanity, facing the planet. When I arrived in Canberra this morning, it was great to be back here, and no more so than to meet the brave climate protesters out the front of Parliament House, in particular Frances there in her yellow onesie, as she has been rain, hail or shine every parliamentary sitting day um, this year, because she was, and she was joined this morning by a whole troop of people in yellow onesies. Extinction Rebellion, other protesters, because they know this matters, that our future is at stake. Last Friday, we had young people all around the country protesting, rallying, both in person and online, about their future, about our future. We are in an absolutely existential dilemma as a, as a world. We need to be taking urgent action to be reducing our carbon pollution now, urgently. 2050 is too late. Delay is the new de denial. 2030, this is the decade. This is the decade that we can be taking action to be saving the Great Barrier Reef, to be saving our future from a future of more intense, more frequent fires, floods, sea level rise to be saving us from the fact that we will not be able to be growing food in our current food, uh, food areas. The, the climate of where we grow most of our wheat today, under three degrees of warming, will be more like the climate of the central deserts. You cannot grow wheat in a desert. So it's pretty clear this is the crisis that we're in, what we need to be doing. We need to be stopping the mining, the burning and the export of fossil fuels. And yet this government is actually wanting to be put more money to change regulations, and as my colleague Senator Water said, changing regulations that are probably unlawful to actually be supporting more mining, burning and export of fossil fuels, just at a time when they really need to be seriously looking, as governments all around the world are, conservative governments all around the world, to be saying, OK, this is, maybe it's going to be a bit tricky, but we've got to work out how do we get out of fossil fuels? How do we safely transition away from the mining, burning and export of fossil fuels? How do we transition our economy to be protecting jobs as well as protecting our environment? There are so many ways forward. 
If we had a government that was actually willing to acknowledge the, the seriousness of the problem, to be playing our role as part of the global community, we could be doing it. We could be making those massive investments, supercharging our investments in renewable energy, supercharging our investments in, in um, encouraging more forest cover, in taking action to be doing everything across all of our economy, all of our society, to be shifting to a zero carbon economy. But what have we got? We've got a government that wants to be introducing regulations that have already been knocked off by this Senate, introducing regulations that actually make it easier to keep on on burning and mining and exporting coal and gas and oil. As I said in the beginning, I just seem to be in a total parallel, we're in a parallel universe where the world, Australian society as a whole, global society as a whole, know that we need to be determined, resolute, focused on every bit of legislation that goes through this place. We should look at it and say, is this going to mean that we are going to have less carbon pollution or more carbon pollution. And there is no doubt that if these regulations aren't disallowed today, that it would result in more carbon pollution, the exact opposite of what we need to be doing. I call upon this government to please think of your children, your grandchildren, even yourselves. There is action that can be taken by us here. We can be taking action. It is not too late now. There is, we've already you know, got massive losses in the way that uh, our society and our environment, uh, they are already being damaged. But we can take a stop. We can, we can say now is the time that we are going to move in another direction. And that means taking serious action. It means leadership. It means leadership here in Australia and joining with other countries around the world. It is possible to do it, but not going in the direction that this government is taking us in. Uh, thank you, Senator Rice. Uh, I will put the question, uh, and the question is that the motions moved by Senator McKim and Senator Brown be agreed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. Aye. I think the noes have it. Aye. Is a division required? A division is required. Ring the bells.
Stop the bells. The question is that, pursuant to order, that the two disallowance motions as moved uh, be agreed. Those of that opinion say aye. Oh, no, sorry. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Green, teller for the ayes, and Senator McGrath, teller for the noes. The, role, the result of the division is ayes 25, noes 25, the votes being equal. The question is resolved in the negative. Uh, PI, I'll just give a moment for... Oh, sorry, Senator Waters. Uh, yes, if I could just briefly seek the call. Uh, uh, call you, you will need just pertaining leave. to the vote that was just taken. Um, uh, are remember... you seeking leave to make a short statement? Uh, I'm seeking leave to potentially recommit the vote. If you could perhaps just give me 30 seconds to explain why. Um, to seek leave to make if a 30 there second being statement. No objection. There being no yeah, objection, thank you. leave I'm just is granted. To explain. Thank you very much, uh, President. So, folk will remember last time um, the vote on this first disallowance had to be recommitted, and Senators Hanson and Roberts voted differently on that last occasion. Um, now I note that Senator Hanson has logged in remotely, uh, but her vote has been recorded as with the government this time around. Given that this was such a close vote, I'm simply seeking clarity from Senator Hanson that she has in fact changed her position from the previous vote where she abstained and now wishes to make it a positive vote, given that it's a tied vote and it will make the difference Sen as to whether this regulation passes or not. Uh, Senator Rustin. I'm just seeking some clarification in regards to um, Senator Waters' last comment. Um, I'm, I'm wondering whether she is asserting that the government is in some way 
um, been inappropriately behaving in relation to a vote. Um, so my understanding is that the whip has instructions that are appropriate, which are provided. So I'm just seeking to understand whether you are making an uh, assumption or an assertion that we have somehow put. Minister, Minister, this is this is not an opportunity to debate. Um, Senator McGrath, I think you were seeking the call. Well, um, as explained, um, Senator Roberts. Uh, thank you. Um, by leave. Um, uh, Senator Roberts uh, um, this morning uh, said that he was the whip uh, for One Nation and gave clear instructions to, to me in the chamber just then that he and Senator Hanson uh, are voting to, to oppose this disallowance. Uh, and I did explain that uh, uh, to, to you and also to, to Senator McKim in relation to uh, Senator Roberts' uh, advice. It's, uh, Senator Waters, uh, I am prepared to rule. It's up to a senator, who's vote, a senator who believes their vote has been recorded inaccurately to raise a matter such as this. Pairing arrangements are matters between the whips. Um, I, I, I don't hear either of the, um, the, the government or the uh, opposition's whips raising this matter. Um, my opinion, the, the division stands as recorded. Senator Patrick. Uh, just very briefly. Senator Patrick, are you seeking leave? I'm just speaking, seeking leave to, to just to contribute to this. Um. Is leave granted? Yeah. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. I always want to put on the table is that, that the pairing arrangements are, are blind to, to the crossbench, and, and so I think the question wasn't being unfair and it wasn't actually making an allegation against the, the government. No. It's just that just we are blind to it. Senator Patrick, as I appreciate the point, Senator Waters, I'll get to you, but, but if a senator believes their vote has been recorded inaccurately, then they have the right to bring that to the attention of the chair. That has not happened in this case. Uh, Senator Waters, I, I, I think we should move on. Are you seeking leave, Senator Waters? It's very briefly. 30 seconds. Is leave granted? No, leave is not granted. Well, I was going to apologise to you, but uh, fine. If you haven't given me leave, you miss out. No, I did not deny you leave, Senator Waters. OK. We will now move on to the MPI. We'll just, for those who are not participating, um, I would ask you to clear the chamber rather than discuss things here, and I will perhaps ask uh, Senator Walsh to resume the chair. I'm told we're going to the NPI. Oh, are we? Where's the? Where's that? Oh, thank you. Is it sta a standing up or a sitting down? Thanks, Stephen. Thank you, Senators. Thank you, Senators. I inform the Senate that at 8.30 a.m. today, 17 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate that the letter from Senator Pratt proposing a matter of public importance was chosen. It is shown at item 20 on today's order of business. Is the proposal supported? Thank you, Senators. The proposal is supported. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers for today's discussion. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly, and I call Senator Sheldon. Good, thank you, Acting uh, Deputy President. I rise to, uh, to speak on this very important motion that's been put forward by Senator Louise Pratt. This matter of public importance is incredibly important to um, this country and to my home state of New South Wales, which has now been suffering um, uh, lockdowns, but also uh, is now merging out of those months of lockdowns. Months of lockdowns were only necessary because the Prime Minister, Mr Morrison, utterly failed on the vaccine rollout and quarantine. Because of Mr Morrison's insistence that the vaccine rollout was not a race. Because of Mr Morrison's insistence 
that the COVID-19 pandemic is a problem for the states and territories. There have been lives lost. There have been many more who have suffered serious illness. There have been billions of dollars lost from the Australian economy, billions of dollars that have been drained out of the pockets of small business, business owners and working Australians. There has been severe financial hardship. There has been severe impacts on mental health. It will be some time before we truly understand the full toll that Mr Morrison's failure on the vaccine rollout and quarantine has had on Australia. It is only thanks to the extraordinary response of the Australian people that we have managed to begin turning Mr Morrison's failures around. But now Mr Morrison is moving on to other matters. He is now entirely preoccupied with internal fights about climate change. He is a Prime Minister held hostage by his junior coalition partner. He is no longer even in the room where the decisions his government makes on climate are made. He is a Prime Minister who is held hostage by the New South Wales Premier, who makes announcements about international borders without even telling the Prime Minister. But the COVID-19 pandemic hasn't ended. It certainly isn't over for Victoria, which continues to suffer through lockdowns created by Mr Morrison's failures. It isn't over for workers around Australia who continue to be out of work as a direct result of Mr Morrison's vaccine failure. And rather than support people who remain without work at this critically important time, instead, Mr Morrison is cutting the safety net. He is ending COVID-19 support payments for workers around Australia. The international students haven't come back, but he's cutting support for university workers. International and domestic aviation has been recovered, but he's already cut support for aviation workers. In fact, Mr Morrison excluded outsourced aviation workers from support payments. Perhaps Mr Morrison isn't aware, but the vast majority of ground handling workers at Australian airports are now outsourced. Since the Qantas outsourced 2,000 jobs last year, while simultaneously receiving $2 billion from the government to keep those workers in their jobs, the federal court recently ruled that outsourcing was illegal. But I still haven't heard a peep from the Prime Minister about those workers. But Mr Morrison certainly made sure that the 2,000 workers whose jobs were legally outsourced will not have any access to COVID-19 support payments. I would find it very surprising if this was just an unfortunate oversight, because many of those aviation workers live in his electorate of Cook. And what do workers at Sydney Airport get from their local member for Cook? They get their jobs outsourced and then they get cut off from support payments for their trouble. The fact is that COVID-19 has not gone away. Those jobs have not come back. So why are the payments disappearing? If only Mr Morrison were as quick to roll out the vaccine as he is to cut the safety net for Australian workers. And it isn't just support payments that Mr Morrison has gone missing on. But because while the Prime Premier of New South Wales has taken over control of Australia's international borders, the Prime Minister has gone missing on rapid testing for aviation workers. We all want to see international aviation begin. Aviation workers desperately want to get back to work. But they are rightly concerned about COVID-19 safety, particularly as, an open back up, as we open back up to the rest of the world. Aviation workers want to know what Mr Morrison is going to do to ensure they can be safe at work. And they have heard nothing in response. The Transport Workers Union has produced a COVID safe national transport roadmap. It is a roadmap for how we can safely reopen our road transport and aviation sectors, sectors where workers are uniquely exposed to COVID-19 transmission risks. A key part of that roadmap is rapid antigen testing. 
Rapid antigen testing will reduce trans transmission on planes. It will provide aviation workers with peace of mind and it will keep planes in the sky. Rapid testing is already being used in international airports across the world to detect positive cases early, including at London Heathrow, and in terminals in the USA, Ireland, Germany and Turkey. Sydney International Airport has rapid PCR testing installed with the results in just 20 minutes. Even before international borders opened, we have seen time and time again domestic flights listed as contact sites and hotspots for transmission. So how can we be opening up our aviation sector again without a roadmap and a plan for minimising COVID-19 risks? We already know how it can be done. The TW's roadmap has been endorsed by the leading Australian epidemiologist, Professor Adrian Esterman from the University of South Australia. Professor Esterman said, and I quote, it is a major step forward and if implemented would greatly reduce the risk of transmission of the virus. It is time for Mr Morrison to come to the table and commit to a government funded rapid testing across the network and do that immediately. But no, Mr Morrison has nothing to say about rapid antigen testing. Mr Morrison doesn't care keeping aviation workers safe at work, just as Mr Morrison doesn't care about the tens of thousands of workers around Australia that are about to lose critical COVID-19 support payments. Because what has Mr Morrison been focusing on than fighting the Nationals on climate policy. He's been telling state and territory governments to look elsewhere if they need support with the hospital system as we emerge from lockdowns. Mr Morrison is telling state and territory governments that he's not going to stump up any money to help them deal with increased pressure on ICUs and hospitals. So how unbelievable is that? Mr Morrison was happy to dish out $40 billion to big businesses, over $20 million billion was paid to companies that made an um, improvement in their income. But if you need funding for intensive care units struggling through a surge of COVID-19 cases, if you need funding for emergency support payments for people without work due to the pandemic, Mr Morrison turns his pockets inside out and cries poor. It's just the latest chapter in the sorry saga of the Morrison government. There has been no end to the amount of money that can be dished out for government rorts or in handouts to big business that don't deserve it. But if you're doing it tough, if you need money but to put food on the table or to pay for an ICU bed, then you're tough out of luck. And as raised by the Queensland Nurses Union, the necessity for there to be a 50-50 funding arrangement with the state government. And in a survey recently carried out by Queensland Health, for Queensland health workers, they're calling for funding to address the, the dire safety issues in hospitals. As a survey of nurses and midwives reveals, 72 per cent worry about facilities cannot cope with the COVID-19 outbreaks. The Queensland Nurses and Midwives Union questionnaire reveals 58 per cent of respondents do not believe facilities are safe for patients of staff. Well, Queensland is part of Australia. New South Wales and the rest of the country, the rest of the states, make up Australia. It's critically important that the Prime Minister acts and acts now. Thank you, Senator Sheldon. Senator Small. Thanks, Madam Acting Deputy President. And I think Today we've seen some of the hypocrisy that we've come to expect from the Labor Party on this. Uh, my fellow senator from Western Australia, Louise Pratt, has moved a motion uh, supposedly of urgency, calling attention to uh, the dire state of our health system in Western Australia. But in doing so, she's not only fronted up here today or completely failed to front up here today and put that case, but she's also left out the true story. And the true story, if we look back from the period from 2012-13 through to this financial year, this federal government 
coalition federal governments have increased the federal funding for the health system in WA by an incredible 72.8 per cent. Over the same period of time, the state government has increased funding by 18.4 per cent. That's right, Madam Acting Deputy President. The federal government has increased health funding into Western Australia at four times the rate of the state government that the Labor Party, Premier McGowan and Senator Pratt also uh, hypocritically uh, accuse us of neglecting the health system. Indeed, Premier McGowan and Minister Cook uh, went so far as to blame older Western Australians and NDIS recipients for the overrun of our state's emergency departments. Now, although that's shameful of itself, it also takes place in the context of not a single case of COVID community transmission in Western Australia. And for that, uh, I know my colleague uh, from Western Australia, Senator O'Sullivan, and I do commend the McGowan government for their effective management of the evolving situation with the pandemic. However, I think we can be rightly critical of their abject failure to prepare the health system for the pandemic, despite us being some 18 months down the line. The health system exists to protect us. We mustn't manage our economy to protect the health system that they have neglected. So we're not asking for anyone to open up on a whim. But what we are asking is for the Labor Party to level with the Australian people, be honest with the facts. And that would start with acknowledging that in Western Australia, the state Labor government has chronically underfunded our health system to the point that ambulances can't get into hospital car parks, let alone get their patients into the emergency department. And that takes place in the same context of the federal government pouring four times more money into that health system than the state's own Labor government. If we're going to level with the Australian people, I think we should also be honest around a few other home truths. And they are that despite the fact that this government was the first to close its international border to the world, that this government declared COVID-19 a pandemic a full 14 days before the WHO did so, and despite the fact that Australia's vaccination rollout is occurring faster on a per capita basis than in, in either the UK or the US, the Labor Party do nothing but continue to snipe and undermine the success of our economic and health management of this pandemic. I've heard nothing from those opposite to celebrate the fact that our vaccination here in Australia now outstrips not only the United States but also Israel, lauded for its high vaccination rates. Now, those opposite totally neglect, totally neglect the fact that here in Australia, due to our effective management of the pandemic, the death rate has been one fortieth of those countries that the Labor Party senators would like to compare us with. So, not only have we outstripped the US in terms of the speed of our vaccination rate, but we've suffered a death toll of less than one fortieth of that experienced in the United States. The reason we put our vaccinations through a normal approval process by ATAGI and the TGA is, of course, because we didn't have dead bodies piling up in the streets. Instead, due to Australia's effective health and economic management, this government, protecting lives and livelihoods from the onset of the disease, we were able to take a slow, considered and ultimately very, very successful approach to this pandemic where we have saved not only those Australian lives who are still here today that would have died in any other circumstance, such as we've seen in other advanced economies in the OECD, but of course we've also seen the success of uh, the Australian economy in being able to tolerate uh, the sorts of, uh, well, sorry, thrive with the, the sorts of economic support from the government. So whilst those opposite snipe and undermine and seek to, uh, under, uh, I guess, underhandedly um, detract from the success that we've seen here in Australia, we on the government side are levelling with the Australian people. And that is 
Once we get vaccinated, in accordance with the national plan, we will safely reopen to the world. Our health system is robust. Our health system has been adequately resourced by the federal government, and we're asking for that same commitment from the states. Indeed, when we look at uh, the assessment of the ICU capacity here in Australia and uh, feed that into the Doherty modelling, which National Cabinet accepted as the appropriate way to assess our readiness, we did in fact uh, reach assurance together, the Premiers and the Prime Minister, that the surge capacity in Australia's hospital system was sufficient to deal with the small number of cases that we can expect in a vaccinated nation. And that's the key point that I think seems lost on those opposite. The discussion has continued to evolve through the course of the pandemic because the information in front of us has changed. Back in February and March, not only did we not have vaccines, we didn't even know if vaccin vaccinations would ever be developed for this disease. So, of course, the actions taken by the government were cautious, were considered and were appropriate in the circumstances that that decision was taken. Now, 18 months later, we find ourselves uh, at the tail end of a successful vaccination rollout, an economy poised uh, for a strong economic recovery in the fourth quarter, as particularly the eastern seaboard reopens, uh, businesses reopen, uh, employees who have unfortunately suffered the impacts of being stood down, but with the support from this government through things like initially the job keeper program and later the COVID-19 disaster payments, as they go back to work, as people continue to spend and get ready for the Christmas that we will all enjoy, hopefully as a reunited country, I think that is when we level with the Australian people and say that this really was a Team Australia moment. Despite the wrecking, despite the sniping, despite the undermining that we've heard from across the chamber. And that is, I think, what we need to take away uh, from this when we look back on COVID-19, that this government was bold in its policy making at times of national crisis. But that bold policy making has ultimately been so incredibly successful on both the health and economic fronts. So again, I question why my fellow senator from Western Australia, Senator Pratt, would come to the Senate to, well actually fail to come to the Senate today, having submitted such an outrageously baseless MPI that seeks uh, to blame the federal government when in fact the responsibility for the situation with Western Australia's health system lies squarely at the feet of the McGowan State government and completely ignores the fact that this government, together with our uh, our state and territory leaders through the national cabinet process has agreed a safe plan for reopening. It's not, it's not on a whim, it's not incautious, but it is appropriate and it is necessary. And that is why I am so proud to be part of this government that has delivered such effective management of the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Small. Senator Steelejohn, remotely. Thank you. The reality of this pandemic and the rollout of the vaccine for disabled people here in Australia it has been one of fear as we have watched our government fail us time and time again. It is a hard truth to hear that your government purposely, strategically, outrageously made the decision to deprioritise 4 million Australians as it panicked to make up for its own incompetence in the early days of the vaccine rollout. But that is what happened. That is the truth. And we have our Royal Commission to thank for the clear knowledge of absolute failure of this government's vaccine rollout in relation to disabled people. As a result of this failure, vaccination remained scandalously low among our community, well below the average in the wider population. We must urgently ensure that all disabled people who want to are vaccinated and can get vaccinated right now. 
before the country opens up and inevitably COVID rips through. There is absolutely no time to waste in this endeavour as Victoria and New South Wales change radically the way in which they manage COVID-19 in the community. We know that disabled people are at greater risk of COVID-19 and are more likely to become seriously ill or die if infected. And once again, the Greens call on the government to rapidly upscale the accessibility uh, and the appropriateness of the vaccine programme by making it a proactive programme that goes to people where they are, sets a clear target of 90% of the disabled population, prioritises disability support workers and disabled people's close contacts, while making sure that all uh, vaccination portals and websites are fully accessible. Contrary to what the government's attitude seems to show us, the lives of disabled people are not expendable. The Greens must and always will prioritise committing uh, to putting disabled people at the centre of this vaccine rollout as we change the way that we manage COVID-19. And as we do that, we must also provide a proper plan to make sure that children in our schools have access to ventilation, have access to air filtration, and have a proper socially distanced set of requirements to keep kids safe in schools as well. Thank you, Senator Steelejohn. Senator Ayres. Thanks, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, earlier on we heard Senator Small tell a fairy story uh, about what's happened in COVID-19 in this country. Um, Self-deception runs right through this government. The truth is that as an island nation with a good health system, we had an enormous opportunity uh, to withstand the ravages of the COVID-19 vaccine that have affected the world so badly. We had an enormous opportunity. An island nation in the southern hemisphere, we had to get two things right. Number one, we had to get a decent system of quarantine. And number two, we had to get the vaccine strategy right. And both of those things were so utterly bungled that we have squandered this opportunity. I mean, how dare he or Mr Morrison wander around saying, oh, we've saved 30,000 people's lives. It's a bit like Mr Morrison a few months ago when the Women's March was out the front, he said it's lucky people weren't shooting at them. It's a very low bar this government sets itself in terms of achievement. This lockdown in New South Wales, this lockdown in Victoria is entirely a product of the greatest public policy failure in Australian history. The Morrison government, utterly incapable of doing what is required to protect ordinary Australian families from the ravages of this virus. Billions of dollars worth of economic activity stopped dead in its tracks. Hundreds of thousands of jobs gone. Public finances in absolute tatters. You know, these jokers who say so much about economic management have trashed the Australian economy, have trashed public finances because they couldn't manage the health response. You know, there's a famous quote from Catch-22 uh, where the guy said, Joseph Heller, he said, some men were born mediocre. Some men achieve mediocrity. Some men have mediocrity thrust upon them. Well, this bloke, the Prime Minister, has in a stunning achievement managed all three of those things in the same three years. There's no crisis which this Prime Minister can't ignore until it's not too late. He has not grown into this job. He has shrunk. There is no opportunity that he can't squander, no problem that he can't hide from. Even now, this week, this week, while preparing for the most consequential international summit of his Prime, Minister, Prime Ministership, he is somehow absent. Until a few days ago, 
We didn't even know if he was going to have the courage to appear, the courage to turn up. Now, he has a task in front of him to persuade, and I think people have been generous saying that his problem is the National Party. The problem that he has is not just the National Party. It's the rump of backward ideologues, anti-science, anti-empiricist, backward reactionaries on, in his own Liberal Party backbench. And you know the reason that they're there? He encouraged them to be there. He and former Prime Minister Abbott went on this long anti-science, anti-empirical, backward-looking thing. Robert Menzies would have been ashamed of the conduct of the modern Liberal Party, and they've encouraged all these characters to emerge in their branches, and suddenly it turns out they've all got to vote, and suddenly it turns out they all turn up in parliament because of your failure of leadership. And now, guess what? They're in charge of the show, and you can't manage to pull off the most basic requirement of leadership because it requires leadership and it requires conviction from a man who's got no capacity for leadership and no convictions at all. He's delegated the task of leadership in this instance to the Deputy Prime Minister, who in turn denied the very possibility of leadership at all. And they've left an ocean of space for the fringe dwellers in the back bench. Minister Pitt has proposed a $250 billion fund and hundreds of billions of dollars gone out the door because this government can't manage its COVID vaccine response. Now they want an extra $250 billion of public money for a loan facility. It makes the Kimlani Loans Affair look like a corner shop operation. And they know, Senator Canavan knows, that that will have the effect of pushing up home mortgage rates for ordinary Australians and pushing up the cost of doing business for ordinary small and medium enterprises. And you know what that will mean? Falling living standards, lost jobs. It will mean power prices go up, not down. It is the most backward-looking response you could imagine. And Senator Rennick, well, what a surprise he's in here with nuclear power stations. Where are they going to be? nuclear power stations. Why on earth do we want to put up the price of electricity and have unaffordable, unaffordable energy approaches in this country? Why? Because all these backward-looking characters on the backbench there, who actually run the show, have been told they can frolic with any dumb idea that they like. Where will these nuclear reactors be? Will they be in Jervis Bay? Will they be in Fremantle? Will they be in Port Stephens? Will they be in Harvey Bay? I mean, those are the places. Those are the places that have been recommended before. The Latrobe Valley, Portland in Victoria. They're all on the list, drawn up by former chief scientists. I mean, what a joke. So eight years of shambolic failure on climate policy, a shambolic response to this gravest national crisis. Now, if the National Party fails to endorse the Prime Minister's net zero policy before he leaves for Glasgow, the National's going to leave the Cabinet. Who's going to be the Deputy Prime Minister? Who's going to be the Acting Prime Minister when this conference starts? This is an utter shambles. And all of this swirling chaos comes back to one thing, an utter incapacity for leadership from this man, the Prime Minister. The backbench isn't the only group in society that's reacted to this failure of leadership, this vacuum. Last week featured the astonishing scene of the New South Wales Premier announcing the end of the international border. I mean, he forgot. So easy to forget. That's a Commonwealth responsibility. Why? Because the Prime Minister's utterly absent. He spent the whole of this pandemic in the shadow of the state premiers. National cabinet has descended into a farce. It's neither national, it's certainly not after the decision of Justice White, certainly not a cabinet. The national plan is scarcely national and it's certainly not a plan. And last week, 
the man who built his political career saying, I stopped the boats, is suddenly no longer in charge of the international borders. No one, you couldn't chalk this up as an unfortunate miscommunication. It's entirely consistent with this Prime Minister's total absence, a total lack of vision. So even as Sydney and Melbourne emerge from the Morrison lockdown, the country still faces enormous challenges. There remain pockets of unvaccinated and vulnerable people, particularly in the regions. I heard the, I heard the Deputy Prime Minister on Insiders a month before the lockdown say, oh, I know we're well ahead in the regions, we're ahead of the cities, and I wondered whether he had access to some secret trove of information that we'd been denied. It turned out that he was entirely making it up. Vaccination rates and the supply of vaccines in his own electorate of New England are in the order of 10 to 15 per cent behind the rest of the country. Populations in far west New South Wales are at critically low levels of vaccination. And where is the Prime Minister? He's nowhere to be seen. Nowhere to be seen. We've seen it so many times before. We saw it during the bushfires. We saw it in response to the Women's March. We've seen it with a consistent failure on democratic re responsibility. We saw it in the failure to adequately prepare for the evacuation of Afghanistan. We've seen it in the failure to denounce conspiracy far-right theorists on his back bench. This bloke is just not up to the job. Thank you, Senator Ayres. Senator O'Sullivan. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, I actually thank Senator Pratt for moving this motion, but I have to say, when I read it this morning, I thought to myself that this must have been moved by an eastern state uh, senator, because uh, they couldn't actually know what's going on in WA, uh, because it, it's, it's not possible. And, and I uh, thank my colleague Senator Small for his contribution earlier and made a very similar point. But no, it was, it was actually uh, moved by a West Australian senator, Senator Louise Pratt. And this is uh, quite remarkable, because maybe those maybe on the other side uh, or don't get the opportunity to think much about Western Australia or know much about Western Australia. If you did, you'd know that Western Australian health system is in absolute crisis right now, an absolute crisis. We don't have COVID, though. It's got nothing to do with COVID. The, 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 the health system is in a state of crisis because of the poor management of the Labor government over there in Western Australia. This isn't some hyperbole. This isn't some hyperbole. On Saturday, the AMA president they revealed that Western Australia has the lowest ICU bed per head of capita in the nation, despite the fact that the McGowan government announced a five billion dollar surplus. Now, when asked about this statistic, the AMA president in Western Australia had this to say. He said, unfortunately, it doesn't surprise me. It doesn't surprise me because the McGowan government effectively flatlined operational budget for WA Health over the last four years. Now, what is more galling about this ICU figure is that it's actually lower than what was available last year. So even before, it's actually 10 per cent lower than before we went into the COVID pandemic. Yet the big announcements that were made absolutely necessarily because of what we're dealing with with the pandemic was that we needed to shut everything down, we needed to go into lockdown, we needed to have social distancing, we needed to do all the things that are necessary to uh, 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 you know, help uh, the, the, the system to be able to deal with COVID. And part of it was to build up our capability within the hospital system, was to get the extra beds that were necessary, to get the staff that were necessary, to, to get the equipment that was necessary. But we're actually 10 per cent lower than we were before we even went into the pandemic when it comes to the ICU beds. Now, indeed, Senator Pratt's motion mentions that there is a shortage of beds, overcrowded emergency departments and longer waits as a result of COVID-19 patients in hospitals. But as I said, there's no COVID in Western Australia. So what this motion really should read is that the health system, the WA health system, is facing a shortage of beds, overcrowded emergency departments and longer waits as a result of serious underinvestment and mismanagement by the WA Labor Party. Now, since the coalition government came into power, 
We have increased funding to WA hospitals by 72.8 per cent. 72.8 per cent. And the WA government, over the same time, has increased it by 18.4 per cent. So some, time, some four times more the investment into WA hospitals has been delivered by the Morrison government, yet the state Labor are found wanting. Premier McGowan's rigid insistence on his hard border, which was necessary, we accept that. It was responsible, however, for, uh, in part for staff shortages across the state's health system, not only there but also in our, uh, in our resources sector. Senator Small and I recently were in Kalgoorlie. And we went out to the, uh, the gold mine there, right there in the centre of town, and they've got a shortage of 60 truck drivers. They need 60 truck drivers. And they estimate that it's about $100 million, $100 million in revenue for this country if they could fill those jobs. But they can't because they can't get the staff. And that's what we're seeing in our hospital system right now. A recent survey of more than 600 doctors has highlighted a number of other contributing factors most of which can be placed directly at the feet of the health minister over there, Roger Cook, Western Australia's health minister. There have been reports of staff at hospitals across Perth having panic attacks and taking stress leave due to staff shortages, which is a sad irony, making the situation even worse. The Australian Nursing Federation secretary, a union boss nonetheless, recently suggested that Roger Cook should find another job. Well, I'll add my name to that. The health minister in Western Australia should go and find a different job because he can't manage the administration of WA hospitals. Staff at King Edward Memorial Hospital for, for Women, uh, Perth's dedicated maternity ward uh, hospital, uh, recently rallied to protest the abysmal staffing at their place of work. These are health workers, union members, who are protesting the, the, the dangerous conditions, I quote, that staff were being required to work under. And my wife is actually a nurse, and my sister is a, is a nurse in a, uh, as well. And the stress that they are under and that they know other uh, members of that workforce are under in Western Australia right now is horrendous. Horrendous. Dangerous conditions is what the, the uh, Nursing Federation uh, representative spoke about. In 2017, Roger Cook declared that monthly ambulance ramping of 1,030 hours under the Barnett Liberal government was a massive failure and a crisis, he called it. A crisis. Now, since being elected to government in Western Australia in 2017, Labor has overseen an average monthly ramping of nearly double that figure, with ramping breaking past their self-imposed crisis level some 41 times, in August alone. Ramping hours hit 6,528 hours. Ramping hours for October are already at 2,950. This is why I'm saying it's in a state of crisis. These figures represent hours that Western Australians spend sitting in an ambulance, unable to get appropriate care because the hospital is full. This is often combined with code yellows that signify that the hospital is completely full. And we don't have COVID in Western Australia. There is no cases of COVID in WA. Thank God for that. And I, and I acknowledge the efforts of the McGowan government in, in doing that. But they have completely, completely abandoned their responsibility for looking after the health system of Western Australia. Now, we've just seen earlier today a uh, I think a bold move and, a, and a, a, an appropriate move from the Queensland government to announce that uh, when they hit their 80 per cent targets, their 70 and 80 per cent targets, they've provided a roadmap to people of Queensland for what they can expect when they hit those targets. And that is, of course, to open in a safe way. There will be testing. There will be uh, needs to show. Uh, there will be needs to show vaccination certificates. You know, appropriate measures that are being put in place when they get to those levels. Now, that is good because it gives people a plan. It means that businesses can plan. It means that families can plan to reunite uh, come Christmas time. But in Western Australia, we don't have any plan whatsoever. Uh, Senator Small and I also uh, we have done a bit together over the last few weeks. We had a, a meeting with an events industry uh, representatives who spoke to us about the opportunities to have some very major large-ticket uh, uh, large, large, uh, 
uh, you know, uh, identity uh, concerts in, in Western Australia and big sporting events that could happen there next year. But they're deciding about whether they can come or not based on the status of our borders. And, the, and I guess it's more the lack of a plan. And so I'm calling on the state government over there in Western Australia, my excellent, most, you know, I'm so proud to be a Western Australian here in this place. But right now we've got a situation where there is uncertainty. So I call on the, the, Morrison, uh, sorry, the uh, McGowan government to, to be upfront with Western Australians about what we can expect when we get to 70 and 80 per cent. We know that uh, on the current trajectory with the current vaccine rate that we will be there by about the, the 4th or 5th of December. That's fantastic. We're on track. We're going to get there. We're a bit behind other states, and I understand that because uh, there hasn't been the, the sense of urgency in Western Australia because I guess there hasn't, you know, there hasn't been COVID, so people aren't really focused on it. But we know that that's when we're going to get there on the current trajectory. The government should be making it clear what we're going to do when we get there. I understand, and it's actually very good logic, that, that, that you know, you've got to give people that are a little hesitant, maybe a little bit extra time to, to get themselves sorted. I understand that, and that, there's, there's great logic in that, in that because there is some hesitancy in WA. But why don't you give people that certainty now? We know that we're going to be at 80 per cent come early December. Give some certainty now. Make it known to Western Australians about what we can expect when we get to that point. There's measures that can be put in place with testing, with, with uh, vaccination certificates. There's, there's ability to be able to provide a safe re-entry. And that's going to deal with the issues that we've got with staff shortages, including in our hospitals, including in our resources sector, and right across our agricultural sector, who are having a bumper of a season right now, but they can't Order, harvest because Senator of these Sullivan, closed borders. Your time has expired. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. When Senator Pratt talks about delays in responses and lives being at risk, the Senator and the Labor Party have failed to understand the need to provide Australians with a full range of safe options for COVID. Instead, state and federal parliaments have chosen bullying to force mandatory vaccination on everyday Australians. You've driven a wedge into Australian culture and left many in fear, without jobs, stressed and in tears. Australians need a guarantee that the pharmaceuticals you rush to market without proper approvals are 100 per cent safe. Not just to this generation, to the next. Now Labor is pushing for more healthcare staff and resources when we may only need them for a few months. This will leave us with more debt for decades to come, simply because federal and state parliaments, Labor, Liberal and Nationals, refuse to consider a better way, using treatments alongside vaccines. Healthcare heroes have been defending our health and lives. Now the same professionals are being intimidated and terminated by Liberal, Labor and Nationals governments for choosing, daring to choose not to be vaccinated, not to be injected. How can healthcare workers go so quickly from hero to villain? One Nation values all our healthcare and emergency services personnel. In many cases, stress on the system is not coming from inadequate resources, it's coming from mismanagement and inefficient practices. Given the worldwide demand for healthcare resources, where are Senator Pratt's extra practicing healthcare professionals going to come from? Is Labor going to rehire the unvaxxed people they're sacking? Because of the sackings, we've seen APRA rush to requalify retired health professionals to practice without adequate retraining, support or professional development. Their skills may be out of date and that puts lives at risk. The government's hasty ill research acceptance and $300 million purchase of Molnupiravir is another example of selling pharmaceutical hype over proven treatments. It is Labor, Liberals and Nationals who Order, are putting Senator Australian Roberts, lives at your risk. Your time has expired. Senator Green. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm very pleased to be speaking on this matter of public importance, which deals with um, a lot of the issues that we are facing across the country. Uh, and what we know is that we are in a situation now w that we have been led down, led into a situation by this Prime Minister who failed to lead on vaccines, who failed to lead on quarantine, and now he's failing to lead on our health response to COVID-19. As we know, the Prime Minister was too late to order vaccines, and as a result, we've had more lockdowns across this country. Families have been separated and businesses have been devastated. These Morrison lockdowns this year didn't need to happen. We could have been all vaccinated by October. 
Instead, we were behind the rest of the world in ordering vaccines, in getting vaccines to people. Supply of vaccines was, was the number one issue when it came to vaccinating vulnerable people and people throughout Queensland. And as we've gone through the process, albeit slowly, delayed by this government, of getting vaccines to the people who need them the most in Queensland and throughout the country. What we've got now is the government patting itself on the back for a job well done, sending out messages about how many people have been vaccinated. Can I say this government isn't responsible for those vaccination levels. Queenslanders themselves are responsible for those vaccination levels. They've done the hard work. They've gone in and got vaccinated. They've sought out the vaccination. This government hasn't, hasn't done that, and yet they're here to celebrate their hard work. Well, the hard work isn't done yet, and we know that there are members of our community, vulnerable members of our community, who are still not vaccinated. You see, in, in Cairns, for example, we do have around 52 per cent of people who have been fully vaccinated. And that's great. People have been getting out. They've been doing the hard work. They've been getting out and getting vaccinated. But we know that only 21 per cent of First Nations people in Cairns are vaccinated. They were meant to be a priority group. But under this government's delays, under this government's dithering, we have seen our First Nations people being left behind. We also know that these are the members of our community that will be impacted first and foremost when we do see cases of COVID-19 circulating through our, um, uh, through our community. We know that these are the people that the government has wiped its hands of, doesn't care about whether they are protected when that time comes. I would like to see the government strongly consider those people in their rollout of the vaccine and what they can do to increase participation. Because at the moment they've said it's someone else's problem, it's only the states that, that um, are responsible. So all they've done is delayed, said it's a state matter. I mean, quarantine is in the constitution and yet the government still said that it was a matter for the states. But most importantly, what we need to do now is get our health response right. And what that requires is a constructive conversation between the federal government and the state government. But what we've got is Scott Morrison, the Prime Minister for New South Wales, talking about politics instead of getting things done during this pandemic. We know that our health system is a whole system. And in Queensland, particularly regional Queensland at the moment, it is really hard to get in to see a GP. I've been travelling all across regional Queensland, and where people go when they can't get the GP is they go to the emergency department. We've seen this throughout Queensland. We've got the numbers. Emergency, um, uh, people who appear at emergencies who don't have urgent um, illnesses, that is going up in Queensland because nobody can get in to see a GP. So this government will stand up and tell you that our health response, hospitals, all of that is somebody else's problem, that the state government is responsible. But the health system, the primary health system, is impacting on our hospitals right now, and this government needs to stand up and work with the states. What we won't be doing is being lectured by the party of Campbell Newman, who sacked nurses when they were in power in Queensland, about health and hospitals. What we want Order. is Senator constructive Graham, conversations. Senator Scar. Deputy President, let's look at the facts. Let's look, look at the actual facts when Campbell Newman and his government lost power. The facts are these. Ambulance ramping in, in Queensland was at 15 per cent. 15 per cent. Those are the facts. A month before the COVID pandemic broke out in Queensland, it had gone up to 29 per cent. It had doubled. It had doubled, Madam Acting Deputy President, through you to send the Green. It had doubled. It, got, it had gotten twice as worse. I have dear, dear friends who are paramedics and AMBOs, and they tell me the actual shambles the Queensland ambulance system has come from a management perspective, a management perspective, and that is entirely the fault of the Queensland Labor government. 
right now, ambulance ramping, Senator Green, sits at 41 per cent, 15 per cent when Campbell Newman left office, now at 41 per cent. In the Metro South Health District in, in Brisbane, an area which I'm intimately familiar, it's in excess of 60 per cent. 60 per cent. Six out of ten ambulances that present themselves in emergency departments are ramped. 60 per cent. It was 15 per cent when the coalition, when the LNP left government. 15 per cent to 60 per cent. That's the state. That's the state of the Queensland's health department and our Queensland ambulance system. It's an absolute disgrace. An absolute disgrace under the Labor government. Let me quote from an ABC news story. On April 24, and I quote, this was an uh, ABC News story posted Friday 15 October 2021 at 8am. So 24 April this year. In the early hours of April 24, QAS headquarters was advised of multiple pending Code 1 cases in excess of one to two hours in and around Brisbane. One to two hours for Code 1 cases, the most serious cases. One to two hours to get an ambulance. And I quote, Code 1 patients refer to those requiring urgent care for potentially life-threatening situations. Ambulances are sent to them under lights and sirens. And this is what the brief said, Senator Green. This is what the brief said under Queensland Labor. This is what the brief said. I quote, nil available resources to respond, end quote, the brief said. Open quotation marks. Nil divertible resources, multiple units ramped in hospitals for several hours, end quote. Nil available resources to respond to Queenslanders needing urgent, urgent aid from their health system. And just as, it, as is the case in Western Australia, Queensland has a handful of COVID cases. This is the situation today in Queensland. This is the situation today under the Labor government that's been in power for 25 out of the last 31 years. Hospital ramping under Campbell Newman, 15 per cent, up to 60 per cent in the Metro South region. You want to blame the federal government? The federal government has increased funding to Queensland public hospitals by 100 per cent. In the same period, in the same period, Senator Watt, the Queensland government has, has increased it by 51 per cent. And you want to blame the coalition government? Look internally. Look internally at what is happening to Queensland's health system. We now, we now know what's happening at Caboolture Hospital, the horror stories coming out of the Caboolture Public Hospital. They're reminiscent of what came out of Harvey Bay, again under a Labor government, again under a Labor government, this managerial incompetence. Managerial incompetence. Hospital ramping at the end of Campbell Newman's tenure, 15 per cent. Metro South, south of the Brisbane River, an area I'm intimately involved in, 60 per cent. Six out of ten hospitals, ambulances attending our emergency, emergency departments are ramped. It's an absolute disgrace. And our public health workers are at the end of their tether. Let me quote, let me quote from an AMA Queensland announcement. And I quote, 27 April 2021. Queensland doctors say public hospitals are at crisis point with clogged emergency departments, too few beds, and an exodus of burnout staff. This is what Dr. Kim Hansen says from the Australian Council for Emergency Medicine. Quote, there's been a surge in patients this year. The system was already at full capacity and now it's swamped. Emergency departments are the canary in the coal mine, she said. They bear the burden when other parts of the health system are over capacity. It's awful. It's like putting a band-aid on a stab wound. That's how she that's what how she describes the Queensland government's response. It's like putting a band-aid on a stab wound. Whoever was involved in putting forward this MPI for discussion this afternoon obviously wasn't wasn't aware of the current situation in the WA public health system and the Queensland health system. Thank you, Senator Scar. Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, this government's got a lot wrong in its pandemic response, and one of its most egregious failures is how it has ignored and marginalised people in immigration detention in the middle of a pandemic. And heartbreakingly, tragically, and eminently foreseeably, we now learn that there's been a COVID outbreak at the Park Hotel in Melbourne, one of this government's hotel prisons. And remember, this hotel prison is full of innocent people who asked our country for help over eight 
long years ago, and they've been locked up every day since, and they continue to suffer as a result of this government's cruel indifference to their fate and horrific persecution of them. The government has chosen to cram these people who have got pre-existing medical conditions and illnesses into hotel prisons and other immigration detention facilities without putting effective COVID prevention measures in place. And we now know, confirmed by the government, that at least three of these people have caught COVID, and there could be many more, because many more are feeling sick and are symptomatic as we debate this issue today. This is a massive failure in the government's duty of care. This was predictable and it was entirely avoidable. And the Greens, along with many other people, including most importantly and most critically the refugees and people who sought asylum who were locked up and remain locked up in these hotel prisons, warned the government at the start of the pandemic that exactly this would happen and that this tragedy would come to pass unless people were released from hotel detention into the community. We warned about the overcrowding of people, the impossibility of proper hygiene in these facilities, and we and they were ignored. These innocent people have been detained now for over eight years. They've been exiled, they've been brutalised, they've been deliberately dehumanised, they've been illegally imprisoned, they've witnessed violent assaults, rapes, sexual assault of children and murder, and they are now being infected with a potentially life-threatening disease. We call again on the government to release all low-risk detainees being held in detention into community detention with appropriate medical care and precautions to ensure that they and the broader community Order, are Senator safe McKim, from COVID. Expired. Senator Patrick. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Australia's hospitals face a most testing time as the government lifts COVID-19 restrictions. The hope is 80 per cent uh, vaccination rates will keep the severe cases and hospitalisations low to avoid stretching our hospitals. The Doherty Institute modelling predicts the biggest COVID-19 health challenge may be coming from the pandemic of the unvaccinated. Will our hospitals cope? Adelaide's major public hospitals regularly ramp ambulances, a sign of stress under ordinary circumstances. Now, on 1 October, Professor Brendan Murphy updated the non-national cabinet on our health system's ability to manage COVID-19 cases during phase B and C of the national plan to tr transition out of pandemic restrictions. The prime ministers, premiers and chief ministers received some 100 pages of data and analysis covering the ability of hospitals to cope with the likely surge. Is that Information publicly available? No. In keeping with the PM's secrecy mantra, it's locked away. Imagine this debate, how informed it would be if we had access to that information. Now, I've sought it under FOI, but I don't expect uh, a positive re response anytime soon. Despite being told that the National Cabinet is not a committee of the Cabinet, the government still are claiming cabinet confidentiality in, in, in defiance of a, of a ruling by a member of the uh, federal judiciary. Is there a legitimate reason to withhold this data? No. It's to avoid embarrassment because the preparations should have been months ago and it hasn't been done. Again, too little, too late. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Patrick. And the time for the, the discussion has expired. I will now proceed to the consideration of documents which are listed on page five of today's order of business. If there are no senators seeking to take note of those documents, I'll just check the screen and I can't see anyone there either. We'll move along to ministerial statements. Are there any ministerial statements? Senator Stoker, the minister. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. 
My table responses to two questions taken on notice during question time on 25 February and 26 August 2021, asked by Senators Watt and O'Neill, relating to the COVID-19 pandemic, and seek leave to have the documents incorporated into the Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. I table a document relating to the order for the production of documents concerning the Beedaloo Cooperative Drilling Program. Thank you. If no senators are wishing to take note of those ministerial statements, um, I have will move to committee memberships. Um, the president has received a letter requesting a change in the membership of a committee minister. Leave to move a motion to vary the membership of committee. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. I move that Senator Rice be discharged from and Senator Cox be appointed to the Joint Standing Committee on Treaties. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Stoker be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Uh, we will move to messages from the House of Representatives. The President has received messages from His Excellency the Governor-General notifying assent to 24 laws, details of which will be incorporated into the Hansard. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives informing the Senate that the House has agreed to the, amend the amendments made by the Senate to the Treasury Laws Amendment 2021 Measures No. 2, Bill 2021. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Aboriginal Land Rights Northern Territory Amendment Economic Empowerment Bill 2021 for concurrence. I call the Minister. I move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. The question is that the bill be read a first time. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Aboriginal Land Rights Northern Territory Act 1976 and for related purposes. I call the minister. I move that this bill now be read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated into the Hansard. Is leave granted? Yep. Leave is granted. I move that the debate now be adjourned. The question is that the debate be now adjourned. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. I call the clerk. Business of the Senate, order of the day number one, presentation of the report of the Joint Standing Committee on Northern. Um, Senator Patrick. I'm sorry, just, I was just with, the, with the leave of the chamber, I'd just like to go back to documents to note two documents and seek leave to continue my remarks. Is that, is that a. Um, is leave granted for Senator Patrick to do so? Yes, leave is granted. Thank Senator you. I apologise. The list was very long today. So uh, I'd just like to note uh, document uh, 22 on page 6 and document 35 on uh, uh, so document 22, Department of Defence report for 2020 uh, 20 to 2021, and document 35, COVID-19 vaccination certificates, and uh, would seek leave of the chamber to continue my remarks. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Leave is granted for that. Um, I had called the clerk, um, who I, for um, business of the Senate order of the day number one. Clerk, oh, Senator Urquhart. Thank you. Um, I present the report of the Joint Standing Committee on Northern Australia on the destruction of 46,000-year-old caves uh, at the Dukong Gorge, and seek leave to move a motion in relation to the report. I'm seeking leave. It's granted. Thank you. Uh, I move that the Senate take note of the report, and I understand that Senator Dodson wishes to speak to that report. Thanks, Wally. He's up there. Senator Dodson is on remote. Oh, Senator, Do Senator Dodson. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy Speaker. Uh, I wish to uh, speak to the final report tabled today on the, by the Joint Committee on Northern Australia uh, into the destruction of Indigenous heritage Sorry. sites at Jugan Gorge in West Australia. Firstly, I wish to commend the chairmanship of Mr Warren Ench 
who uh, conducted the inquiry with fairness and sympathy. The committee's interim report titled Never Again was published in December last year. It focused largely on what went wrong within Rio Tinto before and after the explosions on the 24th of May last year, which destroyed the caves at Jukum Gorge. The nation was shocked and outraged. Australia's international reputation was seriously damaged and we're still on trial about it. The caves have provided shelter to the Puntukurama Pinakura peoples for over 40,000 years. Our committee was able to visit the site and hear firsthand the grief and trauma that the, that the PKK people had suffered as a result of the destruction of their heritage. If indeed there's never to be another Jugan Gorge catastrophe, then governments must act with integrity and urgency to fix the legislative regimes around the country that have been shown to be wholly inadequate. Let's not forget that the destruction of Jugan Gorge was licensed by the laws of West Australia. The Aboriginal Heritage Protection Act was never fit for purpose, if in fact that purpose was ever meant adequately to protect Aboriginal cultural heritage. And that wholly inadequate legislation remains in law today. Section 18 exemptions have allowed wholesale destruction of Aboriginal cultural heritage sites across the state of Western Australia. Mining companies continue to hold Section 18 exemptions. Today they could legally destroy similar cultural heritage without penalty. But the laws of other jurisdictions are just as, dis as deficient. First Nations peoples are fearful that their already diminished heritage uh, is at a risk of further ruin and with it essential evidentiary material that supports their native title rights and interests. That's why our report recommended Commonwealth legislation provide minimum standards for all states and territories. Some government members of the Joint Committee say there's no need for overarching Commonwealth legislation. I just cannot believe they hold that after all the stories and heartache and distress in all parts of Australia that we heard about the loss of Aboriginal culture and that we heard from Aboriginal witnesses during the course of our inquiry. But this is not a majority position and it's very clear where the balance of public opinion on this issue is. On this side of politics, we want to see urgent legislation that gives real meaning to the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and emphasise the concept of free, prior and informed consent and give people a right to say no to the destruction of their cultural heritage. And we want to see ministerial responsibility for Indigenous heritage matters move, to the minister, move from the Minister for the Environment to the Minister for Indigenous Australians. Existing Commonwealth laws, as unsatisfactory as they are, should have provided a remedy for the PKK people when they came knocking on the door in Canberra. Instead, the PKKP got the runaround and experienced only inertia and uninterest in ministerial and departmental offices. For too long, governments have turned a blind eye to the widespread destruction of the heritage of First Nations peoples. It's been nearly a year and a half since the explosions at the Jugan Caves reverberated across the world. What has this government done over, the limited, over that time to give comfort to First Nations peoples that they can, that we'll never see another Jugan Gorge. Very little, in fact, nothing, nothing at all. All we hear from the other side is this nonsense about better laws and regulations could be used to deliver, as deliberate weapons against resource, the resource sector. But the evidence we heard from the sector itself during our inquiry acknowledges that things must change, especially we heard this, the support of the mining industry for upholding the principle of free, prior and informed consent and removing gag clauses from contracts that limit the rights of First Nations peoples to seek redress when their heritage is threatened. 
From the earliest times of colonial settlement, there's been no appreciation of the intrinsic and, pre and precious value which First Nations peoples attach to their heritage. The widespread and mindless destruction of ancient materials that uh, accompanied the occupation of this land of the First Nation peoples has served to obliterate the connection to country and the prima facie proof of their native title in these lands. Real property rights have been trashed without compensation. What did become apparent during the Joint Committee's inquiry was the weight of demand endured by native title holders who have to deal with the well-resourced mining sector, especially in the Pilbara. Native title representative bodies and prescribed body corporates are clearly under-resourced. Some have had to use compensation monies to respond to demand uh, to demands placed on them by uh, the, the industry, and therefore limiting their own capacities to leverage their opportunities. There's a fundamental imbalance here. By getting governments to face up to the responsibilities, there's always been a difficult exercise. The private sector has shown itself to be more ready and willing to improve its performance. It demonstrated more leadership than this government, has, has driven perhaps by their commercial imperatives and the pressure from shareholders, the outrage over the destruction of the Jugend Gorge prompted investors to call for sanctions. The protection of Aboriginal cultural heritage is now not only a moral and ethical issue, it's now an issue of economic risk. The government should at least recognise that in this space, that, that alone should be sufficient reason for the, for the Commonwealth and state governments to reshape their cultural heritage laws and their relationships with First Nations. The nexus with the Native Title Act is also a matter that came to our attention and the real need for a, a, an investigation and inquiry into various sections of the Future Act regime under which many of these Native Title holders uh, operate and uh, they feel very much at uh, under duress and certainly disadvantaged, even to the extent of criticisms about the nation, the Native Title Tribunal itself. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy Chair. Uh, thank you, Senator Dodson. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I wish to speak to the Jukan Inquiry Report tabled today. And I want to acknowledge uh, the traditional owners, the elders and land defenders who took the time to come and speak to the inquiry, but also who opened up their lands for us to come and visit and see for ourselves. I'd like to acknowledge uh, their resistance and their fight and their ongoing uh, connection to country, land, culture and song, which is all affected uh, and which we've heard through the inquiry from those people, that it's not just about a piece of land, it is about a piece of us, because we are no separate to our land and our water and our animals. We are the same as. We don't own them and they don't own us. We care for one another and we protect one another. We don't look at our animals and our land in a way that the colonisers do, and that is to dig up, destroy and make as much money as you possibly can in a very quick, short time. Uh, that won't sustain you for thousands of generations like it has sustained us, but uh, we'll see about that, hey? So I just want to acknowledge all of those people that were involved, and I also want to acknowledge my colleagues on the committee who uh, were, you know, there were people who knew uh, about the destruction, who'd been personally affected by destruction on their own lands, and there were also people uh, who, who got a greater understanding of what this actually means to people on the ground. Because I think people in, in these 
places like this. They lose track of what actually is happening uh, to communities and everyday people out there. So it was an exercise for people to gain some empathy. Instead of doing the training around it, they can actually create some of their, of their own empathy by hearing real stories. So as we know, in May last year, the incredibly magnific magnificent uh, Jukan Gorge Caves on the country of the PKK was destroyed by mining giant Rio Tinto. It sent a shockwave through not only that country and those people, it sent a shockwave throughout the world. It was referred to or compared to the, uh, the Notre Dame. You know, it's, it's as simple as that. It is our place of prayer. It is our place of connection. It is our place to speak to our, our ancestors and speak to our country the same way as a Christian would go to church and speak to their God. Well, our gods and our, our waterways, our mountains, that's who we pray to. That's who we connect to because that's what's going to keep us alive at the end of the day. During the inquiry, we heard from so many First Nations people and communities about the struggles they face around the country, not just in WA, not just Jukan, right across this country. We heard stories of destruction. We heard stories of dodgy deals. We heard stories of mining companies coming to communities saying, we'll give you a four-wheel drive. We'll give you some money for your family. Just sign here, uncle, auntie, brother. I saw it with my own eyes. The con job that goes on in these communities is unconscionable, illegal. So I acknowledge the struggle that our people are facing out there with these dodgy deals and the coercion that goes on to, to manufacture the consent, you know, these so-called consultation processes. Consultation, may I remind everybody in this place, particularly the government and Labor, consultation is not consent. The word consultation is different to the word consent. Okay? So be clear about that. You have no consent to destroy any part of this country. You've never been given consent because there's never been a treaty. So you can't say, but I consulted, I went to the land council, we had a meeting, we got buses there. We paid for people, you know, the same old story that you hear, the con job, you know which family's blue and which family, so you just get the one that's going to agree. Come on, we're awake up to that. It's the 21st century and there's a lot of black fellas educated out there and we know exactly what you're up to. So, the inquiry clearly showed how broken our heritage protection laws are in this country. They not only fail to protect in most instances, but are even designed to favour the developers and the miners. Well, I wonder if the system's really broken at all. Or is it that the system was actually designed for the developers and the blackfellas come later because, you know, we are at the bottom rung here in, this, in these lands. And miners and those de developers who want to destroy country, they get 
they get given this really high precedence and the blackfellas are the low rung. We see that all the time. It's not going to happen anymore, not on our watch anyway. Traditional owners should be the ones making the decisions over their country. Otherwise, stop doing acknowledgement to countries and getting your welcomes done. The system does not provide for adequate consultation and consent. And the possibility to say no to a proposed activity, the system doesn't even allow this to happen. It encourages coercion. It brings division into our communities. And in the end, it is the minister not the traditional owners, who has the last say on what happens to our land. Hello? The minister says what happens, not the traditional owners. <laughs> Talk about being part of the colonial project. The committee recommends for this framework, uh, for a framework to be uh, developed, a national framework, so that we can better protect our cultural heritage, which at the end of the, end of the day is yours too if you opened your eyes and connected with it some more. The whole process needs to be First Nations led. We need to start putting First Nations people at the centre of any decision making. And we need to be careful of co-design. The word co-design, because it's not. Come on, that's just another gammon word or word that it, gammon means pretend in Blackfellow Way and co-design is a bit gammon because it's not really talking to us, it's telling us how you want to do it. Whereas free, pride, informed consent, like Senator Dodson has raised and which came through very, very clear, clearly in the inquiry, that's what we have to look at, not co-design. Free, prior, informed consent. Now, may I also say that Jukan would not have been destroyed, nor any other site in this country would never have been destroyed if we had a treaty in this country. You know we have been at war for 240 years against the first people of these lands. There's never been an agreement to even settle this country. So it really questions the legitimacy of this government and this whole place, doesn't it? Until we have a treaty, we have so much unfinished business and it's time to mature as a nation and come on this journey to protect everybody. Thank you, Senator Thorpe. Senator Chisholm. Thank you, I'm acting Deputy President. Uh, and I too wish to speak uh, to the report Table today regarding the Juk and Gorge inquiry that was conducted by the Joint Standing Committee on Northern Australia. Uh, it's a pleasure to follow on from Senator Dodson and Senator Thorpe. And uh, of all the committees I've been involved with in the five years I've been here, uh, I think this is the one where I have learnt the most uh, of uh, the way that uh, traditional owners have been treated, the way that uh, native title has been used. Uh, and the complexity with how this is managed around the country as well. And I sincerely hope that this report table today that uh, does lead to change, uh, that does mean that these are better managed into the future. And I wanted to go to some of those complexities uh, that I saw at play. Uh, the inquiry was commenced after Rio Tinto destroyed the two rock shelters at Jook and Gorge on the 24th of May 2020. The rock shelters were sacred to the PKKP people and contained evidence of continuous occupation stretching back 46,000 years. The legislative frameworks that govern the protection of Indigenous heritage are complex, comprising state, territory and Commonwealth laws and international treaties. However, clearly, none of these frameworks adequately encompass the complexity of Indigenous heritage which is living and evolving and is connected not just through historical artefacts but through songline storylines landscapes and waters. And I particularly thank those traditional owners that came and gave evidence to us uh, and, and explained some of those connections to us, which uh, I found really significant. Whereas the interim report focused on the events of Jook and Gorge, the final report reviews the inadequacy of legislation across Australia 
to protect Aboriginal cultural heritage that has resulted in widespread destruction of heritage. The report recommends legislation to give real meaning to the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, emphasising the concept of free prior and informed consent and the need for First Nations people to have primary decision-making power in relation to their cultural heritage. It calls for a new standalone framework for cultural heritage protection, including minimum standards for state and territory heritage protections, to be developed in co-design process with First Nations people. It also calls for a review of the Native Title Act with the aim of addressing inequalities in the negotiating position of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in the context of the future Act regime. And we saw so many examples of this in the limited work that we were able to do as part of the committee process. Consistent with the committee's interim report, it also recommends measures that transfer of ministerial responsibility for First Nations heritage protection to the Minister for Indigenous Australians, as well as legislative prohibition on gag clauses or clauses that prevent traditional owners from accessing current Commonwealth heritage protections. It was challenging due to the COVID-19 pandemic, which prevented the ability to travel and meet with more people on country and in community. But I want to particularly thank those senators uh, who were able to do a significant amount of travel. Um, from my side, my colleagues, uh, Senator Dodson and also the member for Lingiari as well, um, and particularly covered off on the Northern Territory and Western Australia, uh, which was obviously a significant part of this inquiry. The report covers a number of areas. Uh, chapter 2 reviews the events that occurred at Jook and Gorge and the decision-making processes undertaken by Rio Tinto leading up to the destruction and actions undertaken by Rio since the committee's interim report was tabled. Chapter 3 gives voice to those other destructive events that have occurred more broadly in Western Australia because of inadequate cultural heritage protections. Chapter 4 analyses the Aboriginal Heritage Act 1972 WA, and, it de and the deficits that gave legal authority for the destruction of heritage, site heritage sites at Jook and Gorge. Chapter 5 outlines the relevant legislation governing the protection of Arab Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander heritage in the states and territories and considers the benefits and critiques of each of these frameworks. So again, goes to that complexity that I talked about in different states and territories. Chapter 6 discovers the common, uh, discusses the Commonwealth legislative framework governing the protection of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander heritage and the international laws and covenants that bind Commonwealth obligations. The committee thanks the PKK people and other traditional owners for engaging with this inquiry and the resources industry for also participating. Despite the hurt losses that, have they, that the traditional owners have experienced, the committee acknowledges your strength and resilience in the face of this pain and loss. The committee has prioritised the voices of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples throughout the report. The committee acknowledges that there are many companies within the resources industry taking strong measures to protect heritage sites and commend these companies. But the committee considered it important to highlight Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voices above all others as part of this review. The committee view on the destruction, the evidence presented to the committee, suggests that a combination of factors were responsible for the destruction of the heritage sites at Jook and Gorge. State and Commonwealth legislative frameworks enabled Rio Tinto to exercise excessive power over the PKK peoples in negotiation, but it was also Rio Tinto's internal processes that made the destruction of the Jook and Gord heritage sites almost inevitable. Changes to the corporate stru structure at Rio Tinto, introduced in 2016 by the then CEO, saw appropriately skilled and experienced staff replaced with less experienced and unsuitably qualified replacements, resulting in a drop in adherence to internal standards and an organisational culture focused around securing quick and easy approvals. Certain community relationship responsibilities were taken away from mine managers who were on the ground and redistributed to other corporate roles who were removed from on the ground. The events at Jook and Gorge were not one-off, rather as evidenced by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander experiences outlined in Chapter 3, which only highlighted a few of the destruction of cultural heritage sites as an alarmingly common occurrence. The committee is heartened to see that the reckoning over the events of Jook and Gorge, some companies in the resource industry are reflecting on their previous relationships with traditional owners and trying new models of engagement that are more culturally appropriate. Nevertheless, while commitments have been made to review and modify agreements, there is little transparency about how this is being done. 
The protection of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultural heritage across the states and territories is at best complex, with no consistency in how legislative frameworks are developed or applied. The committee acknowledges that Western Australia is not the only state pursuing an inquiry into Aboriginal her heritage legislation. Queensland, South Australia, New South Wales and Tasmania are also conducting inquiries into cultural heritage legislation. We finished with the pathway forward and the committee has therefore made the following findings. The Australian Parliament should legislate for an overarching Commonwealth legislative framework based on the protection of cultural heritage rather than its destruction. In line with the principles set out below, state and territory legislation should also be required to meet these principles set out in the report. The Commonwealth, state and territory governments should endorse a set of standards that set best practice in the management of cultural heritage sites and objects and the development of cultural heritage management plans. The economic benefits of protecting and celebrating cultural heritage sites should be promoted. In conclusion, it is clear that there is a need for strong federal leadership to ensure that heritage protections across the nation are clear, consistent and effective at protecting the living culture and heritage of First Nations people. Unfortunately, we haven't seen any concrete action from the federal government in the 18 months since the Jukun disaster. It is time for the government to stop dragging its feet and come clean about what, it, what reforms it intends to make to imp improve protections for First Nations cultural heritage. As the committee's report indicates, the mining industry has recognised the need for change and is beginning to step up to the plate by reviewing existing Section 18 permits and agreements with traditional owners. But without further reform, we will continue to see the destruction of precious heritage that forms part of the oldest continuing culture on earth. At a minimum, Ministers Lay and Wyatt should explain what improvements have been made to prevent the kind of bureaucratic mishandling that we saw from both officers when they were approached by the PKKP people in the days before the explosions. There is no excuse for inaction at the federal level. I wanted to put on record my thanks to the committee staff and those, those people who gave time as witnesses, uh, particularly given the complexity over the last 18 months with travel. I wanted to thank the committee chair, Warren Ench, and other members uh, for the way they worked as part of the committee process and a particular thanks to my fellow Labor colleagues, the member for Lilly, Senator Dodson and the member for Lingiari as well, uh, and particularly to Senator Dodson and the member for Lingiari, whose vast experience in this area uh, was invaluable, invaluable for me as one of the participating members of this committee. Thank you. Senator Smith. Thank you very much, Mr. Acting Deputy President. In the very, very short time that is available to me, I'll just add that I was very, very happy to give way to Senator Thorpe's contributions and Senator Dodson's contributions, and uh, I concur with some of what uh, Senator Chisholm has also had to say. But people should ask themselves, after 18 months since the destruction of the Jugan Gorge, which we know to be of such tremendous heritage value to Indigenous people in my home state of Western Australia, what has changed? In the report, there are some additional comments from myself and others which make it very, very clear that Rio Tinto should not get off free. And to date, there has been little or no financial penalty to Rio Tinto. This is outrageous. In addition to those comments, I also make the point that Rio, Rio should be held accountable and Rio's actions should not reflect on the resources industry in my home state of Western Australia and indeed across the country. I encourage you to read the additional comments and I absolutely support a judicial inquiry into Rio Tinto's actions. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Smith. Um, Senator uh, Cox. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Uh, this is not my first speech, but I rise to make contribution to the tabling of the uh, Joint Standing Committee on Northern Australia's final report, A Way Forward. I wish to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands I'm on, the Ngambri and Ngunnawal people, and traditional owners all over the country. I pay my respects to the elders past and present and to their continued practice of caring for country and culture. This was a significant inquiry that shone the light on many ways which First Nations cultural heritage is destroyed and sometimes even encouraged in this country. While Duke and Gorge was the wake-up call for many Australians, the legal and willful destruction of cultural heritage is not new for First Nations people. 
As the final report clearly shows, First Nations people across WA have been experiencing the impact of inadequate legislation for decades. Sorry, uh, Senator Cox, the, the time for your contribution has finished. Uh, do you seek leave to continue your remarks? Yes, please. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if you, if you yeah, and, uh, the debate will uh, uh, con conclude on Thursday, so that's when you'll be up there. in continuation. Uh, Clark. Government Business Order of the Day number one, Export Finance and Insurance Corporation Amendment, Equity Investments and Other Measures Bill 2021, Presumption of the Second Reading Debate and on the amendment as moved by Senator Cox. Minister. Thank you very much, Mr Acting Deputy President. Um, in, in continuing the um, contribution in summing up on this bill, um, can I say the bill boosts Export Finance Australia's important role in supporting Australia's economic growth and facilitating stronger links between Australian businesses and the Indo-Pacific region while maintaining its robust processes for assessing commerciality, risk and environmental and social impacts. I commend the bill to the Senate. Uh, thank you, Minister. So the question before the chair is the second reading amendment, as moved by Senator Cox, be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against? I no, no. think that the, the question before the chair is the second reading amendment, as moved by Senator Cox. I believe the noes have it. Noes have it. Okay. Clark. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. And I believe we need to. Oh, Clark. A bill for an act to amend the Export Finance and Insurance Corporation Act 1991 and for related purposes. Is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, is so ordered. The question is that the bill stand as printed. And I'm looking. I believe there are two two uh, amendments proposed by the Australian Greens. Senator Cox. That's right. I move uh, Amendment One on sheet one four zero six. Do you wish to speak to that? Sorry, yes, to, I do. Yes. yes, Senator Cox. So this amendment seeks to prohibit the uh, Export Finance Australia from investing in fossil fuel projects and fossil fuel-based infrastructure. Uh, since 2009, uh, EFA has invested at least 1.57 billion on in fossil fuel projects, and we can't afford to be propping up fossil fuel projects anymore. It's bad for the climate and it doesn't make any economic sense. In order to respond to the global climate crisis, we need to ensure export finance is not being used to invest in fossil fuels. There is a very real possibility that the government will want EFA to fund gas import terminals throughout Southeast Asia and in desperate attempt to find more customers for our gas. We cannot let this happen if we want to stay below the 1.5 degrees of warming. The International Energy Agency has said to meet the Paris objectives, not one new coal or gas infrastructure project can proceed. By voting against this amendment, both parties are abandoning our, a chance of a safe climate. Minister. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Um, I might take a few moments to respond to some of the matters raised um, in the contribution just made by Senator Cox, who I welcome to the chamber, having um, seen her sworn in today. EFA's equity powers will be focused on overseas infrastructure development and export-linked Australian businesses and sectors of economic significance. Um, that includes, for instance, critical minerals. EFA assesses requests for its financing support on a case-by-case -case basis, consistent with its mandate to support Australian export-related businesses and overseas infrastructure development that delivers benefits for Australia. As a key export industry for Australia, EFA offers support to the fossil fuel sector, including small and medium-sized enterprises that are involved in supply chains. EFA investments are carefully screened. There's robust due diligence processes in place that assess 
any financial, social, environmental or other risks. There's a range of policies, rules and guidance that impact upon EFA's ability to finance fossil fuels. Those are um, in various places, but including in the statement of expectations that is issued by the Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, OECD, OECD rules and the equator principles. The Minister's statement of expectations for EFA sets out criteria that all resource-related projects, including fossil fuels, must meet to qualify for financing. And those are that, one, there is a demonstrated market gap in the availability of finance. Two, that the transaction doesn't come at the expense of SME transactions. Three, that the project has significant Australian content, including through SME supply chain participation and or benefit. And finally, that the, com that the project is commercially viable. The government also requires EFA to align its environmental policies with several internationally recognised environmental and social standards, including the International Finance Corporation's performance standards, which set out a process for assessing project-related greenhouse gas emissions, the Equator Principles, a risk management framework adopted by financial institutions for determining, assessing and managing environmental and social risk in projects, and these policies and practices will also apply to the EFA's use of its equity power. In closing, it's also worth noting that EFA is also increasing its investments in the renewable energy sector. For example, EFA recently provided a $41 million loan to facilitate the development of three onshore wind farms in Vietnam. Um, I think all of those matters go um, really to the, the essence of the concern that is expressed in this amendment um, and demonstrate substantially why it's not required. Thank you, uh, Minister. Uh, Senator Pratt. Um, I note that I think the Greens have moved both uh, the amendments on sh uh, sheet 1406, both to subsection 1 uh, and, sorry, subsection 3, part 1 and part 2. Uh, and subsection my, my 1, is that where we're up to? No, my understanding is that the question before the chair is um, amendment 1 on sheet 1406. Or is being moved separately? Is that correct? Uh, that, that would be the case, because the question no, for no, the chair is, is well, it's up to the, the Greens to, to, to formally move it, but we're dealing with uh, Amendment 1 on sheet 1406. Thank you. And therefore, I'll use this opportunity to outline Labor's response to those issues. So it is our approach to be informed by scientific evidence rather than by ideology, including with regard to the financing of fossil fuels and associated infrastructure. There will, uh, as we recognise, continue to be international demand for fossil fuels for some decades, even in the context of reducing global emissions. And you know, you come, uh, I come from the, my home state of Western Australia, where indeed we see um, a large proportion of national income uh, and exports being derived currently from uh, these exports, and that we need to work with industry to bring down and manage those emissions so that we can meet a net zero target. So in that context, we don't believe that Australia as a resources trading nation should be lifting up the ladder from underneath us. While economies that are emerging and are trying their hand at producing energy and trading resource commodities, we can't leave them behind when we've had so much economic benefit from this already. Labor stands by the Paris Agreement principles, which encourage developed economies to assist emerging. Uh, uh, sorry, to encourage developed economies to assist emerging economies on their slower journey to decarbonisation, rather than, rather than starving them off from fair financing. If nations like this do not get this pivotal investment from ethical countries like Australia, then they will risk falling into debt. 
De diplomacy traps from unethical actors in the region. We see here unintended consequences of the proposed amendments. Uh, if we were to exclude Export Finance Australia from supporting developing economies to transition to cleaner fuels. For example, under its overseas infrastructure powers, Export Finance Australia can provide finance to assist developing economies to build energy projects that support transition to a cleaner fuel. Export Finance Australia can then monitor the implementation of these projects during the life of the loan including through the use of independent environmental and social consultants where appropriate. We are concerned that had the Greens Party's proposed prohibition been in place, Export Finance Australia could not have funded an Australian electrical firm's work on an LNG power station <coughs> in PNG, the POM power station near Port Moresby that has replaced diesel electricity with LNG and has, in those terms, significantly reduced PNG's carbon footprint. So we're concerned that other critically, critical infrastructure could fall foul of the prohibition that's put forward in this amendment. For example, airports or marine ports that require construction of fuel infrastructure for ships or aircraft or critical minerals and rare earth projects. So on that note, um, I conclude those comments to say that Labor does not support this amendment. Thank you. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, Acting Deputy President. If I could beg the indulgence of the Chamber and just ask that the position of the Australian Greens on the second reading amendment, for which a division was not had, be recorded, that we supported our own amendment. I'm not sure if our colleagues um, were popping that on the record at the time, because we've left them in a pickle on their first day, and our apologies to them for that. No, I'm, certainly, I'm, I'm sure that that can be certainly accommodated. Thank you. Thank so, you. And I'd yes. now like to speak on um, Amendment One. If I can just confirm, it's Amendment uh, One on Sheet One Four Eight. That is correct. Before, Senator Waters. before the Chamber, thank yes. you. Um, I'll just speak briefly to it, in addition to any comments that my colleague Senator Cox would like to make. Um, so this is an amendment that's been circulated in my name, which says that um, EFIC or the, the EFA, the subject of this bill should not be giving money to fossil fuel infrastructure. And it's somewhat reminiscent of the discussion that we had when we were debating the Northern Australia Infrastructure Facility Bill, or the NAIF Bill, which likewise this government sought to allow equity investment to be made by that uh, investment vehicle. This is a similar bill. It wants EFIC to be able to take an equity stake in projects, but also there's no prohibition on such investment being made in fossil fuel infrastructure. So we are concerned that this bill will facilitate yet another body simply investing public dollars and taking an equity stake in fossil fuel projects. Now, this is five seconds before Glasgow. This is when we are in a climate emergency, and it is uh, somewhat distressing, but perhaps not surprising, to hear the opposition say that they're worried that this will stop the Commonwealth funding airports. That is not, in fact, the case. The, the drafting of the amendment is very clear. Um, this would apply to the Export Finance Insurance uh, Corporation. Um, and as we previously said when the NAIF bill was up for debate, we do not think the government should be taking an equity stake in fossil fuel infrastructure, and we do not think the taxpayer dollars should be used to fund fossil fuel infrastructure. So the intent of uh, this first amendment, Amendment 1 on 1406, is to do just that. It would cover coal, it would cover oil and petroleum, it would cover uh, natural gas and byproducts related to that. It's a very simple choice for the chamber to make. Do you want public money to prop up fossil fuels, and do you want the government to be taking an equity stake in fossil fuel projects, or don't you? I'm looking very much forward to the vote on this one, because this is a crucial point of distinction, and I think the Australian public expect uh, that, perhaps not this government, but they certainly expect that the opposition would not be supporting public money and an equity stake being taken by a government in fossil fuel projects. So I commend this amendment to the House. Thank you, Senator Walters. The question before the, sh the chair is that Amendment 1 on Sheet 1406, as moved by Senator Cox, uh, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. Aye. I think the noes have it. Division required. Uh, division required. Ring the bells.
Lock the doors. The question is that the amendment one on sheet 1406 moved by Senator Cox be agreed to. The ayes will move to the right of the chairs, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator McKim teller for the ayes and Senator Ciccone teller for the noes. Yes, yeah, that's going to happen. That's going to The result of the division is ayes 8, noes 30. The question is resolved in the negative. And I'll just let Senator Cox return to her seat. And I will be giving the call to Senator Cox. Thank you. I wish to move amendment number two on sheet 1406. Uh, this amendment seeks to remove uh, EFA's partial FOI exemption. Uh, this will increase the transparency and accountability to ensure that the public can understand what projects are being funded by EFA. Just as the government seeks to hide the investments of the Future Fund, which poured money into Adani and Myanmar military. They want to hide where our public money is being invested overseas. The government is also seeking to exempt all national cabinet discussions from F FOI, yet another move designed to hide decision-making from, from the public. And This is a government addicted to secrecy, and this has to stop. Thank you, Senator Cox. Uh, Senator Pratt, and then I'll come to you, Senator Walters. Senator Pratt. Thank you. I just wanted to put Labor's position in relation to this uh, further amendment. 
We have been engaging with stakeholders in this area, particularly about increasing transparency. And we note that the FOI Act provides partial exemptions for Commonwealth agencies. The government has argued that the existing exemption is important, providing certainty to export finance Australia customers and financial institutions so that they are assured their sensitive financial information even including the fact that they might be seeking finance, is confidential. So we have the view that we need to look more closely at this area and we will continue to work with stakeholders regarding the impact of the current FOI laws and exemptions on export finance, Australia's financing practices, and we are open to developing genuine standalone policy in this regard. However, we also note that Australian exporters are facing significant difficulties at the moment because of the Prime Minister, Mr Morrison's inability to manage the relationship of Australia with China. Therefore, we don't believe the Senate should be in a position where we hastily tack on an amendment in this area that risks significant unintended consequences for this critical export agency and the businesses it works with. We therefore oppose the amendment. Senator Walters. So, sorry. Thanks very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. Well, far from it being hastily tacked on, this is an amendment that would make sure that the investment decisions that are made by EFIC are not exempt from freedom of information. I mean, this is just classic form from this government that want to hide everything, mostly because they're up to their necks in it and it's dodgy stuff that they want to hide. Um, but it's not just us that have recommended this. The Productivity Commission has previously recommended that FOI exemptions for EFIC be removed. And they noted, and rightly so, that the FOI Act already has protections for national security and commercially sensitive data. So there's no good reason for this additional uh, shroud of secrecy to be applied to EFIC, and that's exactly what this well-considered and succinctly drafted amendment would achieve. We need some more transparency about government spending of public money in this place, not less. And it's shocking uh, that the opposition are once again siding with the government to let the government give money and take an equity stake in fossil fuel projects, and then happy to let that continue to be concealed from freedom of information. Uh, I mean. Uh, you just, I'm incredulous sometimes at the, the lack of opposition from this opposition. I want to point out that the um, submission in the uh, Senate inquiry into this bill from uh, Jubilee Research Australia, ACF and Action Aid, that is a joint submission, also objected to the lack of transparency around the investment activities of EFIC, and they called for the removal of EFIC's exemption. And they made the valid point that limiting access to this information undermines efforts to audit the effectiveness of the fund or the projects that it funds, um, or to even assess the return on investment for public money. It's like putting this money into a black box and then no one can ask any questions about it. And this government now wants an even, even bigger blank cheque to say, well, we want to be able to take equity stakes now, but no, you can't ask anything under freedom of information about whether it's good value for money, um, you know, whether there was any sort of environmental assessment or social assessment undertaken in the decision to fund this project. It is a complete black box process. It's an absolute farce, and that's exactly why we're moving to say, do as the Productivity Commission recommended and remove this exemption from FOI. This is public money being spent. It should be made public. It's not a difficult concept. So again, I object to the notion that this was uh, hastily tacked on. This is a fundamental principle that the expenditure of public money should be made public and that the deliberations of an agency which is being given a massively expanded jurisdiction should be subject to scrutiny by the public, considering it's their money. So, with that, I commend the amendment. Thank you, Senator Waters. Um, Minister, did you want to respond? I did. Thank you very much. Um, look, in, in my contribution on this amendment, um, I think it's important that I put on the record the answer to this question, which really goes to the heart of why the Greens have put this forward. Why does EFA need a freedom of information exemption? Um, and I think if we can answer that, members of this chamber um, will feel comfortable um, to 
not support um, this amendment. So the exemption that exists for EFA from freedom of information um, laws provides certainty to EFA's customers and other financial institutions that the sensitive information they provide as part of those deals will remain confidential. Now, the exemption is partial and it only applies to transactions EFA is handling. It doesn't apply in a broader sense to, for instance, its accountability to government. Removing this targeted exemption in the way that is proposed by this amendment would have an impact on EFA's ability to safeguard the legitimate interests in the financial or business sense of its customers, uh, which would in turn have a negative impact on those businesses' ability to work with EFA. It becomes a bit of a self-defeating proposition. I should also put on the record that it's not correct to assert that EFA doesn't provide transparency on transactions. EFA is required to disclose its participation in all transactions, no matter what industry that transaction touches upon, within eight weeks of the finalisation of that transaction. Those details include the name of the client, the sector in which they operate, the goods or services involved, or the overseas infrastructure that's involved, the country, the type of facility and the value of the facility of the export or overseas infrastructure support. EFA discloses its proposed involvement in transactions with the potential for significant environmental and or social impacts, in addition to all of the things I've set out, on its website prior to making a decision on the provision of finance, um, giving that extra layer of transparency um, should it be anything that might be um, a matter of a sensitive nature. So I'd suggest that um, senators can feel assured um, that the exemption is limited only to what is necessary to give a commercial efficacy um, to the transactions involved and otherwise provides that there needs to be disclosure within eight weeks of finalisation of key information here in Australia. Senator Patrick. I to contribute to the discussion on the, on the amendment, um, uh, and I will point out that if, uh, you know, I do a lot of FOI, so I understand the space uh, quite well. Um, everyone must understand that FOI has this unique characteristic about it in that it's the only tool that citizens have to directly engage in oversight, to directly uh, access information so uh, to, to be able to participate in debate. So we in this chamber can ask questions on notice, we can seek uh, order for productions, we can do you know, Senate inquiries. Uh, we also have other inst institutes that look at uh, oversight, like the Auditor General, who does a fantastic job, but the only method for citizens to be able to, to, to engage is, to, uh, is, is to, through the use of FOI. So they, they directly control that. Um, the, the FOI Act has a number of exemptions already in place. Section 45 is one of the business ones, section 47 uh, relating to commercial activities and so forth. Um, and there's a certain reality about FOIs. If I were to FOI ethic uh, right now in the middle of a transaction, I can assure you I'd get a, a return that was redacted. Um, I would probably uh, go to the Information Commissioner uh, and likely that would take two years to come out the other side of that and then perhaps get appealed to the AAT. Very, very lengthy process. So it's not like FOIs would generally uh, seek to interfere with commercial sensitive transactions that are on foot um, because, uh, because of the way in which our system is quite, quite broken. Uh, if you yeah, another point to, to make is, just so senators understand this, is that uh, you can make an FOI request and have it knocked back because of some sensitivity. Five years later, you can make the same FOI and you might find that it doesn't get uh, knocked back because of the time uh, that, has, that has passed since the original application was made. Uh, there's a requirement in law that FOI decisions are made on the basis of, of, the, uh, of the circumstances at the time the decision is made. And uh, often you'll see an FOI 
uh, decisions that are published by the Information Commissioner or the AAT that uh, they've, um, they've made consideration as to the, 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 uh, the time that has lapsed since the information uh, was first brought into existence, and often that gives rise to uh, access to the documents. So um, I, I just say that it's very difficult under the current regime to get access to, to uh, information um, uh, that is truly sensitive from a business perspective. Um, but even in, in circumstances where you might normally seek access to it, because the time it takes to get, to get uh, through the FOI challenge, uh, it's unlikely to be sensitive by the time you do uh, get to the point of, of getting it. And, and at that point, you're dealing with a very experienced information commissioner or the AAT, where you know, their examination of any claims of uh, commercial sensitivity are very uh, deep and precise. Um, so for that reason, I, I don't think there is a requirement for additional um, for, for additional uh, exemptions to be put in place or for class exemptions to be put in place uh, and uh, uh, you know, so, so th that that's the basis upon which I'll be uh, uh, supporting this amendment. Thank you Senator Patrick. Minister, did you seek to respond? No. So the question is the amendment put by Senator Cox. Item 2 on sheet 1406 be agreed to. Uh, all those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. no. Uh, the ayes have it. No. Uh, is a division required? Yes. Ring the bells for four minutes.
stop the bills. The question is that the amendment on sheet, two, sheet 1406, number 2, moved by Senator Cox, be agreed to. The ayes will move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left, and I appoint Senator McKim for the noes and Senator Ciccone for the ayes. Sorry, Senator Ciccone for the ayes, for the noes, and Senator McKim for the ayes. There being eight, I've still got the other one. The result of the division is eyes eight and nose twenty six. Uh, therefore, the question is resolved in the negative. The question now is that the bill stand as printed. Uh, all those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Is the division required? Ring the bells for one minute. Stop the bells. Uh, the question is that the bill stand as printed, as printed, the eyes to the right, the nose to the left. I appoint Senator Davey as the teller for the eyes and Senator Kim as the teller for the nose.
The result of the division is ayes 27, noes 7. The question is resolved in the affirmative. The question now is that the bill be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. The committee has considered the Export, Finance and Insurance Corporation Amendment Equity Investment and Other Measures Bill 2021 and agreed to it without amendments. Minister. I move that the report be adopted. The question is that the report be uh, adopted. All those of opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. A third time. The question is that this bill be read now a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Third reading be recorded, please. Senator Waters, could you restate that because I didn't call you properly? Senator Waters. Sorry, could I just ask that the Australian Greens' opposition to the third reading be recorded, please? There's no objection to that. It's so recorded. Thank you. Uh, Clark. A bill for an act to amend the Export, Finance and Insurance Corporation Act 1991 and for related purposes. I believe Sep 20, isn't it? So it now being 7.20, I propose that the House do now, the Senate do now adjourn. <laughs> Senator Chandler. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. For the last two years, I've been campaigning for the protection of women's single-sex sports. With the support of female athletes, from Olympic medalists through to women playing local sport, academics, parents, volunteers and many others, I've been making the simple and obvious point that women's sport was created specifically to cater for the differences in physical capabilities between males and females, and that it's unfair and often unsafe to have biological males competing in women's sport because males have a whole host of advantages in strength, stamina and physique. The vast majority of Australians know these things to be true. Yet, for some reason, Australia's peak sporting body in 2019 began claiming the opposite, that sport should be based on self-affirmed gender identity rather than sex. Over the last two years, Sport Australia has ignored a spate of expert findings demonstrating the importance of single-sex sport for women. When World Rugby found that females were a hugely increase, increased risk of serious head and neck injuries when playing against trans women, Sport Australia dismissed it. When peer-reviewed research was released demonstrating the advantages males have over females, even, with tes even after testosterone suppression, Sport Australia ignored it. When the IOC allowed a young female athlete to miss out on the Olympics so a 42-year-old biological male could compete in the women's category based on guidelines the IOC has since admitted are not fit for purpose, Sport Australia refused to comment. Thankfully for female athletes around the world, not all sporting bodies have turned a blind eye to the evidence. Earlier this month, their counterparts in the UK released new guidance for transgender inclusion in sport after an extensive project consulting with athletes and looking at the scientific evidence, something that Sport Australia has since admitted that they didn't do. The UK Sports Council's made findings which mirror exactly the points I and many other advocates have been making for years. They found, and I quote, Categorisation within the sex binary is and remains the most useful and functional division relative to sporting performance. 
Competitive fairness cannot be reconciled with self-identification into the female category, and based upon current evidence, testosterone suppression is unlikely to guarantee fairness between transgender women and natal females. These findings are direct contradictions to Sport Australia's position that women's sport should be based on gender identity rather than sex. So what did Sport Australia have to say about the UK findings when they were asked by the media for comment? Absolutely nothing. No acknowledgement of the work the UK sports councils have done, no reflection on their findings, no commitment to take a look at the evidence that had been found. An anonymous spokesman said the guidelines would only require updating if the Federal Sex Discrimination Act was changed. This is an extraordinary statement for an agency to make when presented with clear evidence about unfairness to women. It amounts to bad luck, no amount of evidence, no amount of concerns from women can make us listen. It's also a strangely strident commitment to a position that they didn't know they had until 2019, six years after the most recent change to the section of the Sex Discrimination Act, when they suddenly decided they needed clarity. Many Australians scratch their head and wonder how we found ourselves in a position that our taxpayer-funded peak sporting body isn't prepared to acknowledge that single-sex sport for women and girls is vital and necessary to give female athletes a fair go. Why didn't female athletes speak up and say something, they ask. Once again, the UK Sports Council's report is revealing. Here's a quote from that same report. Current female athletes suggested that although all or most athletes consider transgender athletes have an advantage if they compete in women's sport, almost no one would be brave enough to discuss this in public. One athlete said that the potential for a social media pile-on would be too great, so it's easier to keep quiet and acquiesce. Other athletes said that they had been warned not to discuss this topic by their NGB and had been threatened with sanctions such as non-selection if they disobeyed. This is an extraordinary indictment on the attitude of sports administrators towards women. We'll decide how to be inclusive, even if it's directly against your interests, and you'll shut up and take it or you'll be punished for it. As someone who's spoken to many Australian female athletes, both at the professional and at the community level, volunteers and administrators about this issue, I'm afraid to say I wasn't shocked at all to read that. It's consistent with what I've heard from many about the situation in Australia. To anyone that cares enough to pay attention, it's no secret that activists use social media, traditional media, the bureaucracy and the legal system to create an intensely intimidating environment for women to speak up in defence of single-sex sports and other sex-based rights. The UK might be fortunate to have a sports council prepared to acknowledge reality, but look at how women are being treated elsewhere simply for acknowledging biological reality and standing up for their own rights. Hopefully, senators are aware of the disgraceful attacks on philosophy professor Kathleen Stock, who has been targeted by anonymous activists to the extent that police have told her not to attend her place of work. UK Labor MP Rosie Duffield didn't feel safe to attend the Labor Party conference because of the abuse she's received from Labor members for saying that only women have a cervix. Instead of defending Rosie, her leader and numerous colleagues threw her under a bus. Here in Australia, I myself have been summoned to a compulsory conciliation hearing 12 months ago by an anti-discrimination bureaucrat because I wrote that women's sports and facilities were designed for females and should remain that way. Because I've campaigned for the protection of women's single-sex sport and sex-based rights, making the exact same points that sensible national sporting organisations internationally are making, I've received all sorts of abuse from anonymous keyboard warriors. Earlier this year, I posted a collection of examples from a single four-day period of emails and messages I'd received calling me all sorts of expletives and derogatory terms. The C word, and they weren't talking about conservative, effing idiot, turf, bitch, and a pathetic excuse for a human being. Messages telling me to die and to shut the F up. One email concluded, I'm surprised you're out of the kitchen. Bear in mind that the people are sending me these deranged messages are doing so in the name of conclusion. The most infuriating thing about receiving these messages is that I know that the people calling me these things are getting exactly what they want from our institutions. All of this is sadly consistent with the language that is being used publicly on social media to denigrate and threaten women all over the world who speak up for women's rights. 
In any other context, this abuse of women would cause a media storm. But when I posted those messages on Facebook as an example of what women have to put up with for speaking in defence of single-sex sport and sex-based rights, an Australian journalist mockingly tweeted them to his followers with the caption, "Turfs posting their L's. This is why we are where we are. If a woman dares to express an opinion which is off the progressive script, there's a horde of Twitter warriors, journalists, media outlets and Labor and Green politicians out there to make it as intimidating as possible for you. It doesn't matter if you're a left-leaning feminist. It doesn't matter if you're a lifelong Labor or Green voter. You will be labelled a turf, the universal social media language that says it's OK to send abuse to this woman, it's OK to lie about what she said, it's OK to try and end her career because she's not one of us. The beneficiaries of this culture are the lobby groups who are pushing for sing women's single-sex sports and services to be replaced by women's services that males can identify into and the bureaucracies who are doing their bidding and don't want to be scrutinised on their actions. The people who suffer the consequences are women. All it takes to stop this madness is for people who know that single-sex sport and services for women are sensible and necessary to speak up and say so. And all it takes for it to get worse is for people to stay silent and keep letting bureaucrats give away women's rights because it's easier to stay out of it. Thank you, Senator. Senator Ayres. Madam Acting Deputy President, last Saturday an icon of the New South Wales New England region, Mrs Thelma McCarthy, received life membership of the New South Wales branch of the Labor Party. It wasn't our traditional New South Wales Labor conference. It was digital, it was short and it lacked all of the theatre and the clash of ideas that makes the New South Wales Labor conference the greatest of all Australian political conferences. And of course, COVID means that we couldn't have her there in person and that we haven't been able to organise a dinner in her honour in Armidale. This last thing will happen and it will be quite a dinner. I can think of no more deserving recipient, of a recipient who more epitomises Labor values and principles, and particularly Labor values and principles in the country than Thelma McCarthy. Her decades of community work, of leadership and the extraordinary details of her life represent the highest expression of Labor's values. She's also been an important figure uh, in my early life uh, in the Labor Party uh, and uh, has set uh, a, a very important example uh, for people like me uh, in the Labor Party uh, to consider. She grew up on a property in southwest New South Wales. After the bombing of Darwin, she joined the Royal Australian Air Force, becoming one of the first women to serve uh, in the Air Force. She was 17, having told a few fibs about her age. She became a wireless operator and taught herself Morse code in just six weeks. At that time, it took most of the men who entered the RAF 18 months to learn. She was a born leader and quickly promoted to sergeant. Her service and the service of her colleagues was critical to the defence of the country at a time of extraordinary danger. It also paved the way for thousands of women to serve across our defence forces. It was while serving with the RAF in Canberra that she met her first Labor Prime Minister, Prime Minister John Curtin. When he called the signal station that she was working in one evening, she thought it was a hoax. During her years in the RAF, she also met a flight officer called Bill McCarthy, who was friends with a young navigator called Gough Whitlam. After the war, Bill and Thelma were married and moved to Armidale. They stayed close friends with Gough and became prominent members of the Armidale branch of the Labor Party. In 1978, Bill McCarthy won the seat of Armidale in the New South Wales Legislative Assembly as part of the 1978 Ranslide election. He would go on to hold Armidale, later renamed Northern Tablelands, for nine years. Thelma was widely considered to be the de facto local member, as she filled in for Bill when his parliamentary duties took him out of the electorate. Tragically, Bill resigned from the parliament in 1987 and died from cancer only three days later. Thelma ran as Labor's candidate 
for the seat in the by-election that followed her husband's death. The Australian described Thelma in 1987 as the Labor Party's unlikely political saviour and quoted the local organiser, uh, my notes don't say it but I'm sure it was Laurie Daly, during the campaign, it's a seat we should really lose but we think Thelma might just be able to win it for us. It was a close run race, uh, a close run race indeed, uh, much closer than the subsequent uh, general election in New South Wales. I've no doubt that she would have been an extraordinary local member had a few hundred other votes had a few hundred votes gone the other way. That loss hasn't prevented her uh, from representing the people of Armadale or being engaged in a leadership role uh, in that community. It's a rural city that will be forever shaped by her passion for her community, uh, for the Labor Party and for her life in the local Anglican church. She was deputy chair of the New South Wales Council for the Bicentenary. She served on the New South Wales Ministerial Advisory Committee on Ageing. She's mentored generations of Labor members in the New England and across country New South Wales, including myself. Her commitment to the people of New England hasn't ended there. This month, a feature in The Weekend Australian by journalist Greg Berrup, who um, famously comes from the, uh, very, from the town of Gyra, very close to Armadale, described a struggle between the congregants of St Mary's Church and the Anglican Bishop of Armadale. The, the organist in that church, Peter, has been excluded from performing at their services because he's married to a man. Both men are in their 60s and lifelong churchgoers. And who is leading the congregants in revolt? None other than Thelma McCarthy at the age of 96. The article quotes her. She says, can they just get out of people's bedrooms? If people are loving and caring, what goes on in their private life is none of anyone's business. Quoting another parishioner describing a confrontation between Thelma uh, and the local Anglican officialdom, the, the parishioner says, my God, she cut loose. It was a sight to behold this 96-year-old little lady. She's just four feet tall giving it to the dean. I wish to note my support for the congregants to Peter Grace and Peter Sanders. They deserve justice and have experienced their faith without discrimination among a congregation who so clearly loves them and wants them to stay within their faith community. Thelma McCarthy's extraordinary life in the service of others continues apace. I'm proud to be part of the political tradition that she forged in New England. I'm proud to know her and her family, particularly her daughter Annette, who's also been a terrific servant and contributor to the Labor Party. And I hope that others across New South Wales can take inspiration in her life and her passion for justice. And I wish her all the very best and look forward to seeing her in Armidale very soon indeed. Senator Van. Thank you, Mr. President. I rise to pay tribute to Sir David Ames, the Conservative MP who was tragically murdered last week. He was the MP for South End West, the town that I lived in for a short while earlier in my life. Uh, he was MP at that point in time, although I, I never got to meet him. I was involved in politics at that point in my life. But much of his work I've heard about through my friends and family that I still have living there. Uh, I have a beautiful goddaughter, Natasha, who, who still lives there, and her and her family uh, have been quite troubled by this. Sir David was described uh, as one of the kindest and nicest, most gentle people to ever to have served in politics. Even his uh, opposition have described his profound sense of duty is one that we all should aim to uh, be like. And I think I would certainly like to do that myself. So David was the, um, was the lead parliamentarian for the Conservative Friends of Israel. 
Uh, I and some of my colleagues in this place are patrons of the Liberal Friends of Israel. I share his deep passion for, for Israel and for the Jewish community. He famously said that, uh, although I am not myself a Jew but a Catholic, there is Jewish blood in each and every one of us. And as being brought up a Catholic, but now and my life partner being a Jewish woman, uh, I understand his sentiments very well. He said, I would certainly have been proud to have been born a Jew, and I stand shoulder to shoulder with our local Jewish community, a sentiment I share, and I think one that we in this place should all think about. Now, while it was a terrorist attack, and no doubt religious uh, violent uh, terrorism, uh, extremism involved, I'm sure even Sir David would have said, this is not a time for racism. This is a time for forgiveness. This is a time where we can bring our communities together. So I rise, even so briefly, to pay tribute to Sir David. I send my prayers and thoughts to his family and his constituents and to all the UK parliamentarians. Vale, Sir David. It, uh, <clears throat> pardon me. The Senate stands adjourned and we'll meet again tomorrow at 12 noon. Thank you. Thank you.